Pete, I can hear you yawning. I muted. No, you don't. Mary, he has it working. Oh, thank you very much. Great. Um, and I'll have to wait for city attorney to answer this. I don't know if I need to take roll. City attorney, do I need to redo roll to make sure we still have quorum? It wouldn't hurt to put it on the record. Okay, thank you. We got two minutes anyways. Better now to have it than later on. <laughs> Alrighty, it's 4.15 and I believe our technical difficulties have been resolved. Um, I have to make sure we still have a quorum. So I will call everybody, uh, Vice Mayor. Yes. And Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Commissioner Carousel. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Hanks. Commissioner Hanks. If you can hear us, please uh, unmute yourself. All right, so it is 4.15, we do have a quorum. Um, the, we can go ahead and proceed now with our fire rescue district meeting. Um, we've gotten to the point where we can approve the agenda. So could I please get a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Got a motion on the floor to approve the agenda as presented by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. All righty, we'll go ahead and take the vote to approve the agenda, and it's 416, and Commissioner Hanks, you're in the house. Thank you. So we're taking a vote now to approve the agenda as presented. We'll do it by voice vote. Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Carasone? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. And myself, yes. So the uh, public comment, do we have any public comment for the fire district meeting? No, there was no public comment. Thank you very much. Moving on to the consent agenda. City manager, has anything been pulled from the consent agenda for fire district? No, ma'am. Thank you. Could I please get a motion to approve the fire district consent agenda as so presented? Moved. So moved. Second. Got a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Thank you. And just for the record, did we have any public comment for the consent agenda? No. Thank you. We'll go ahead and take a voice vote to approve the consent agenda as presented. Um, Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Carousel? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Commissioner Hanks, I didn't catch your vote, please. Yes. Thank you very much and myself, yes. So that passed five to zero. Um, I would assume there's no more public comments. 
No. Thank you. And at this time, it is now 418 and the fire district meeting is adjourned. Um, city clerk, before we move on to the road and drainage, I presume. Yes. Do we have to wait in between the meetings? Just give me one second to switch it out. Thank you very much. Let me know when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Thank you very much. All right, folks, it's 418 and I do call this road and just road and drainage district meeting to order. Uh, we will do a voice roll call. Um, Commissioner Carousel. Yes. Um, Mayor McDowell is present, Vice Mayor. Yes. And uh, Commissioner Hanks. Yeah, I'm here. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Here. All right. So at this time, we do have a quorum, and we also have uh, City Manager Lear, City Clerk Taylor, and City Attorney Slayton. City Manager, do we still have uh, Chief Garrison in the house for these meetings? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. So we have a quorum. At this time, I will go ahead and turn it over to the City Attorney to do the meeting notice and instructions for our virtual meeting. Thank you, Mayor. In accordance with the Governor's Executive Order, 20-69 and the city manager's emergency order number 2020-06 revised. This is a virtual meeting with the elected officials, charter officers, city staff, and presenters participating through video conferencing using Zoom, a form of communications media technology. If there are any technical difficulties that prevent the use of this technology to conduct the meeting, the meeting must be recessed or adjourned until the problems have been corrected. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, City Hall is closed to the public. Information about ways to watch the live stream and provide public comment are posted on the city's website at cityofnorthport.com slash online meetings. The information is also posted on the front windows of City Hall and is attached to the agenda for this meeting. This meeting is being broadcast live on the city's website, live on YouTube, accessible on video via Zoom, and accessible by telephone via Zoom. Public comment is being uh, submitted via an online public comment form at cityofnorthport.com slash public comment. That form is active at 9 a.m. the day before the meeting and deactivated at the end of public comment during the meeting. Public comment may also be made by leaving a voicemail message the day before the meeting from 8 a.m. until 7 p.m. at 941-429-1032. There's certain required information for public comment that's referenced on the online form and the outgoing voicemail message. Comments that are timely received and that include the required information will be accepted and included in the official record of the meeting. Any comment received that does not meet those requirements will be rejected and not included in the official record of the meeting. As time goes on, the city may adjust these procedures, but for today's meeting, my opinion is that these measures satisfy all applicable legal requirements. Thank you, City Attorney, I appreciate that. Alrighty, I need to get an approval of the agenda, please. So moved. Back up. Motion on the floor to approve the agenda by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. We'll go ahead and take roll call vote. Vice Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Commissioner Carousel. Yes. Commissioner Hanks. Yes. And myself, yes. So um, do we have any public comment for road and drainage district meeting? No, ma'am, you do not. Thank you very much. Um, city manager, has anything been pulled from the consent agenda? No, ma'am. Thank you. Can I please get a motion to approve the consent, consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Before we take the vote, do we have any public comment on consent agenda items? No, ma'am, you do not. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and take voice vote. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Carousel? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. 
And myself, yes. So consent agenda has been approved as presented unanimously. City manager will move on to presentations uh, for the exemptions of road and drainage assessments and fire rescue district assessments. And I will set my timer for 15 minutes. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna have Ms. Balia and Chief Titus both here to make this presentation, but I just wanna give you a little background first. Sounds good. And you know, as you all know, this may or may not know, the city provides certain exemptions and is allowed to provide certain exemptions to the um, assessments charged by the road and drainage district as well as the fire rescue district. Um, there was some question regarding how those exemptions are applied. Um, as far as for churches, churches. I'm getting feedback. I'm getting feedback. Yeah, I see. I hear yeah, it. I see. I hear it. So, so, I don't know if Mayor, if, I don't know if, Mayor Williams, if that's coming back through on your computer because it looks like everybody else is me muted. It's on this. I believe that's coming through Julie's. Julie's muted. Yeah, I'll see if I can keep working on it. So. The two districts many years ago, the, the commission during their methodologies approved an exemption for church properties um, with one of them being for the sanctuary building, which was the fire rescue district and the other being for the entire assessment, which is how the, the road and drainage I was, believe was handled. But with that, there was some question about why are the two handled differently? So I'm gonna turn it now over to Ms. Balia and um, Chief Titus so that they can make their presentation to you. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna go ahead and set the timer for 15 minutes now. And Ms. Balia and uh, Chief Titus, I don't know if Chief Titus is on here or not. I see Chief Garrison, there he is. Make sure y'all unmute so that we can hear you please. Thank you. All right. Hello. Go ahead. So Julie, I'll go ahead and start. And if you'd like to fill in, you can, but if you go back to August 6, 2008, as far back as August 6, 2008, there was a discussion about uh, the exemptions that were applied for um, fire rescue and for the road drainage district. Um, there was a presentation that was done in front of commission and the governing body at the time, and they were provided with three options. The first option uh, regarding church exemptions was to assess the entire properties. Uh, the second option was to exempt the church sanctuaries only. And the third was to exempt all church owned property. Um, the one of the questions that came up over the weekend, Mayor, uh, and thank you for the question. You you asked a specific question about there's nowhere that it's that the sanctuary is defined and you're absolutely correct. There is nowhere that the sanctuary is defined. Um, when you look at some of the legal documentation and you look at the statute, um, it talks about the area of worship. So there is some legal interpretation there as to whether or not what portion that would be. We apply it typically to the sanctuary itself or the nave area of the church, the church where um, the area of the church where the congregation gathers um, for prayer. So uh, I think that is why there is a the ability to have a different interpretation between the districts. Um, I look back and I have the minutes from the meeting from 2008 and it says that there was quite a bit of discussion, but it does not clarify why um, there was a difference between fire rescue and road drains, but it does very specifically state, and I'm going to go ahead and read from the minutes if that's okay. It says there was a general consensus to exercise option C for the road and drainage district and declare the amount of $91,000 to be de minimis for the fire rescue district. Option B shall be exercised and declare the difference of $20,000 to be de minimis. Commissioner Carasone dissented, expressing it was not fair for all residents to pay for exemption of the churches located in Northport. That relief granted to the residents, many of whom constitute the membership of the churches would provide greater assistance to the churches than a government subsidy. So one of the members um, of our current commission was, was on the commission at the time. Um, it was voted and it was it was two separate decisions. So for fire rescue, fire rescue exempts the sanctuary portion only. Road drainage exempts the entire church property. 
uh, for fire rescue. You now it's changed over time because of how assessments are done. Obviously, uh, when this happened in 2008, I believe both the Roads Range District and the Fire Rescue District had both had different methodologies. So those dollar amount, those dollar amounts at the time that were considered to be de minimis were not necessarily relative to what they are today. Although um, I believe that it still is de minimis. Uh, Fire Rescue District received something from Stantec, who's who does our assessment role now. They said it, for us it would still be in the area of about twenty thousand dollars if you all were to um, apply the exemption to the entire property for us to be consistent with road and drainage, the impact would be about $20,000. And um, at the time, $28,000, I think in 2008 was declared to be de minimis. So certainly I would think $20,000 uh, would also be de minimis. That is one of the things that has to be met in the legal standard, which I imagine Amber could speak to better than I. Um, but I can leave it for questions or if Julie has anything to add in, I will turn it over to her. The only thing I would like to, uh, to add, uh, Juliana Belia for the record public works director is that for road drainage, um, we, of course, as the, uh, chief Titus said, we exempt the, uh, for churches, the non antelorum assessment. I would like to note, however, that for the uh, capital, we, we still have a capital assessment for the churches of $46 per church, and we have 31 churches for our road bond assessment for the next uh, 25 years. So I did want to mention that we, we, we do collect that. Thank you. Is there anything else to the presentation, city manager? No, ma'am. Thank you. All right. So at this time, if anybody has any questions, I just need you to um, signal and let me know by pressing the little raise your hand button. All right. Seeing none, I'll go ahead. Um, since this is one of those things that I've been um, trying to make heads or tails out of, um, I think that the how, city um, city manager or Ms. Julie, how much are we talking about for road and drainage if we were to enact something similar to what fire does? What what would that bring in in assessments that currently are not being brought in? I don't know. Uh, we would have to have our consultant would have to calculate that. Uh, I, I we'd have to have that calculated. And Mayor, that would be the the reason for that. Also, is the road and drainage would have to come up with a methodology of for each one of those properties because the sanctuary building, you know, their their methodology deals with the impact of a building and everything else to the system as a whole as opposed to just the value of the building um, or a service provided to the specific one building. So how they would come up with a methodology to say, all right, just using um, the road portion, how much frontage of their property relates to the, the sanctuary building as opposed to the property to a whole, um, that would be something that would be incredibly tricky to calculate. I'm sure that it can be done. I'm just letting you know that that's why it's not as easy as just saying, well, it's a tenth of the property because the building may not be, um, have that kind of an impact that's a direct correlation. I'm concerned because they're getting a service and not paying for it. And I understand that it's a church um, and that special rules apply, I think to churches and, and forgive the terminology, but other municipalities do charge for stormwater. And I, I would really like to see what some of those numbers would be um, for the city of Northport. Because just like residents, if, if the city floods, it affects the residents, it will affect the church. And we're, we're trying to protect everybody. And, and to do for one and not for all is, is 
is not correct. It, it's not equitable or it's not fair. <laughs> um, the other thing in my research that I found is that there's a few businesses that don't pay assessments. For example, FPL, they don't pay assessments to the city of Northport, but they do for unincorporated Sarasota County. They do for the city of Sarasota. They, they do not for the city of Venice, but they also pay a lot of other taxes in ad valorem that are not available to us. So I, I have to wonder, not only is this a concern of mine for the churches, but other businesses that aren't paying when everybody else has to pay. And, and I find that wrong. And I don't quite understand why FPL is exempted. Um, so I don't know if anybody can shed any light on that. Are you saying they're exempted? Because I, don't, I was not aware of the FPL or from the road and drainage, from fire, from both. Um, so FPL currently in the city of Northport does not get charged any assessments. Okay. There's no assessments, none. Okay. They pay they pay city taxes, but they don't pay assessments. But FPL pays assessments to the city of Sarasota, they pay their fire rescue, they pay for EMS and they pay for stormwater. When you go to unincorporated Sarasota County, they pay fire rescue, stormwater and EMS. So uh, we're leaving money on the table and I don't like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not prepared to answer the questions about FPL. Of course. Today's conversation was about churches. Um, I understand. That that being said, um, going back to the church conversation, this was a commission decision. I know it wasn't this commission. Um, if you all want us to do something differently, that's just what we need to know. Um, back to your question though, about the exemption, the current exemption criteria for road and drainage um, is reducing the amount of assessments according to the backup in here, a little more than $22,000 a year. So if we were to reduce that to just the sanctuary building instead of the whole property, um, the amount of money we'd bring in is somewhere less than twenty-two thousand um, dollars. I, I don't know how much of that twenty-two applies to just the church building, but if if we're only charging or if we're only not charging them the twenty-two and a half thousand dollars for the whole property for road and drainage, um, then the amount for just the sanctuary building would certainly be less than that because it's just a portion of the property. Um, is that based on today's methodology or is that based on the methodology that was in 2008? Um, maybe Ms. Julie can tell us where she got that number. Um, just going by what's in the backup here as far as the financial impact goes. That would be today's methodology. So, so yeah, so switching to just the sanctuary would be somewhere between zero and $22,566 and 47 cents. Yes, sir. Okay. So there definitely needs to be a bigger conversation to make sure that uh, the city of Northport's not leaving money on the table by not having assessments made, not only in my opinion to churches, but other entities um, and I wouldn't know even how to begin. I came across the FPL one completely by mistake. And then it just kind of sent me down a new rabbit hole. Um, so again, how do you find out what other entities are not paying assessments when they should be? We can ask our, our rate consultant that, that did the methodology who was exempted out. Um, we can try and research that on ourselves. Um, again, it, it's... Um, this probably predates most of you on here, except for Commissioner Carasone. It is a balloon impact. So the amount of money coming in to the city would not change. It's a matter of who pays it. Um, and I say that because we only charge the total amount that we need to operate the district. So and so these are not, it's not a tax, it's an assessment. So we determine how much is needed. And then that is divided over the people who receive that benefit without, you know, with eliminating the people who are getting the exemptions provided by the commission under the methodology. In this case, it's the churches and apparently, as you've discovered, FPL. 
Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head if there are others, but we can certainly look into that. But the way that the assessments work, it wouldn't bring in more money, it would just shift who's paying it. And I understand that that's an equity issue. I'm not arguing that. I just wanna make sure that everybody understood that we're not losing out on revenue. It's just a matter of who's paying it. And I understand that. But at the same time, with all of the infrastructure needs that we have in this city, especially in road and drainage with the um, water control structures and stuff like that, if, and, and I don't know if this would work and Miss Julie would have to ask, answer, if we continued with the methodology that's applied to the citizens, uh, property owners, then also applied it to all of the other people that are not to be in charge to the assessments currently, that would give us more money to be able to possibly fix some of these infrastructures or go towards it. No, ma'am, that's not the way the assessments work. The assessments are a, a dollar amount to, to balance the budget. So it wouldn't bring in more money, it's just more people to pay it, to share in the cost. I, I, I totally understand that. I'm, yeah. I'm just saying if we were to keep the same dollar amount to the property owners and charge accordingly to the ones that are currently not paying, that would bring in more money for these projects that are sitting waiting to be done to collect money. Instead of raising property taxes across the board or property assessments, we could work on some of these projects, correct? I think we're seeing the same thing just a roundabout way. It's possible. I'm not, not positive that if we I, are. City manager? Y yes, sir. Uh, if I may, and I just want to go back to the conversation, and although so I, we don't have the audio from back then, but my recollection is one of the reasons why the minutes reflect in that meeting from 2008 um, one of the reasons why they specifically stayed in there, the road and drainage amount and the fire rescue district amount. They state the dollar amount in there and they declare it to be de minimis. That's a, it's a, that's one of the things that's needed to be met by the legal standard. So that that is determined to be not impactful. If it does not meet that de minimis standard, then road and drainage or the fire rescue district or any other um, anybody else that's 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 levying a non-ad assessment like that, they would need to identify a revenue source to replace that income. So I, I understand what you're saying. I wanna make sure that, that, that everybody understands. It's, I know $20,000 is, is, is a fair amount of money. And, and certainly we take that into consideration when they look at it in de minimis value and legal definition, and they're looking at overall in terms of what the budget amount amount is and whether that is really significantly, is there any significant impact at all to anyone? And it was determined at that time that it was de minimis. Now, when I look at what our numbers are right now, our dollar numbers for the estimate for 2019 and what Julie has provided for 2019, their estimate, ours is approximately the same and our budget certainly has gone up. Uh, it looks like Julie's dollar values are actually less um, because their methodology has changed. And I think the city manager brought up a very good point to, to try and apply, and maybe that is why the difference back then was given, is to, for us to exempt the sanctuary portion, it's relatively easy. It's a square footage, so it comes up with a percentage, whereas for road and drainage, how, how do you apply what portion of that is for drainage and things like that? So I think that's what the city manager was getting at. But I just wanted to make sure that that clarification was made, because it is very, very specific in the standard about it's, it's, it's not spread across, across those rate pairs. Um, Commissioner Carison. Okay, so since I was the rebel rapper at the time, my problem has been and always will be the fact that, um, you know, the exemption on the uh, church side of things would, it puts more pressure on the everyday resident because as what city manager was trying to say is that there is a road and drainage study. It says you need X amount of dollars. X amount of dollars comes in by having rates to your residents. Now, if you add rates from your uh, house of worships, those that are exempt, 
then you're going to reduce those rates that are needed citywide. And of course, it would take a huge calculation and we would have to probably look at, you know, how much will it cost to amend that study so that it includes those places of worship, be it just, uh, you know, those that are outside the, the actual chapel or however you want to word it. But I think what we're talking about is specifically road and drainage and not really fire. Um, the fire is minimus, and as far as I'm concerned, I think that they actually went and did it so that not the entire property was exempt. It was only a certain portion, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and the bottom line was that, you know, we had churches coming in telling us they couldn't afford it and flipping out. And of course, you know, the loud voices always win. That's the bottom line. So um, here we are today. And again, you know, the, the general public pays for above and beyond what those particular houses of worship are exempt for. And I'm okay with giving them some, but if it means that we can reduce the road and drainage amount of fee for the everyday resident by including portions of that house of worship, well, then I'm all for it. Um, but, you know, it's going to take a study. How much is that study going to cost? Um, you know, those are some of the things we're going to have to get some serious information on because I don't want to see us uh, spend, you know, thousands of dollars to, to, to save $1,000, you know, uh, not that it wouldn't help down the road, but I, I do think it's worth looking into. Thank you, Commissioner Carrison. Was there anything else before I? Um, I guess I would just like to ask city manager, is that correct? And in, in what I'm, I'm trying to summarize what you were trying to explain is that X amount of dollars is supposed to come into road and drainage that the um, that amount needed is then divided by calculation to all the residents, and that if the exempt pieces are to come in and pay a proportionate amount, then it would alter the amount needed and therefore alter the residential component of how much is to be paid. That is my understanding of the way it works as well. Um, and yeah. You also kind of brought up the point that I was wondering, or not wondering, but waiting until you all made your comments, is if, if you decide to un, to eliminate this exemption, which again, this is entirely a commission decision, staff doesn't have an opinion one way or the other on this. Um, it was a policy decision back in 2008 when enacted, um, and would be a policy decision now if changed. Um, I would tell you from an economic standpoint, I would certainly do it as part of the next methodology. As you can see in the back up here, each of them are approximately twenty thousand dollars, and the methodologies themselves cost approximately that same amount. So, if you were to decide to do it, I would do it in conjunction with whenever we did the next methodology for each of them. And in trying to predict when that question would be, I I did email Julie and Scott um, to see when their next ones. The fire actually doesn't have one scheduled because there's a self correcting. Um, but I'm not sure off the top of my head when Ms. Julie's next methodology study is, but we'll get that answer for you um, while you all make your comments. Thank you. All right, uh, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Kerr's own answer and speaking because that was going to be part of my question. I was going to ask her to speak to it coming from that uh, 2008 um, decision. And so I appreciate her input into that. Uh, I am in agreement with her. I don't really see this uh, a change coming to the fire district. Uh, I do see though that we just went through a brand new methodology for road and drainage. And we finally got a system that encompasses the entire city. And I think those properties need to be encompassed within that methodology also. I don't think a new methodology needs to be done. I think you can utilize the methodology that was already done in order to achieve uh, 
that calculation on those properties. Uh, I, I truly think it would be relatively easy. Uh, so I am in agreement with going forward, you know, in the future with that. Uh, but uh, I'd also like to have that let list checked over twice as to who has um, exemptions from assessments. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Hanks. Yeah, um, really have some rhetorical questions here. Um, City Manager, would you say that uh, there was that there's been money saved uh, through our social services because of, um, you know, like New Hope gave out about 3,000 uh, families every week food. Um, I know there's churches uh, across our entire area and across our country right now that have that have helped in uh, in the social services in the aspect of helping folks keep keep their homes, uh, making payments on 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 things, helping them pay for their electric bills. Uh, stuff like that. So would you say that money is saved from these institutions who in their very tenant is to care for the widow and the elderly and the sick and all those things? That is what they do. So yes. I would too. And and um, because of such, I'm going to be honest with you, I would be of the concept of getting rid of all assessments because of the money that they save and because of what they do for our community. Um, right now, what you have is you have churches and you, know, you have or, you know, organizations that are having a hard time staying afloat because they they give these services based strictly off a donation. They're not allowed to charge for services. Otherwise, they're no longer a 501c3. You know, so everything they, they do is based off of donations. And if a family can't feed themselves, well, then they're not tithing to their church and providing for, for those services that these churches give. So these churches have to then rely on on people outside of their congregation, things like, like, like that. So I think things, you know, I think whenever you look at this, these are things you have to take in a totality understanding, a global understanding of what these churches do for people. And um, if it was, if, if, if I'm asked to make a motion or if I make a motion, it's going to be to get rid of all assessments for these churches because of the, the services they provide for every citizen that is willing to walk through their door. City Attorney, I see you You would like to comment. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to follow up on one of the answers to one of Commissioner Carison's questions. And I think I'm probably going to say the same thing that you've heard before, but just a little bit of a different way, just to make sure that it's very clear. When you provide exemptions such as these, um, it's, not, it's, it's not proper to require everyone else who's paying the assessments to pay a little bit more to cover the exemptions. So that money has to come out of a different fund that's identified um, unless it's de minimis, which is what uh, Chief Titus was speaking to. So just to be clear, when you're looking at the pot of how much money that you need from assessments, um, if you pull a group out such as this churches, uh, the other residents don't pay more. And if you put that group back in, they don't pay less. Somehow that money has to come from somewhere else. And I hope that makes sense and maybe provides a little bit of clarification. Thank you. Um, the only thing I would like to add to Commissioner Hanks's comment is I agree the churches do phenomenal things in our city, but the churches also do phenomenal things in Venice and Sar city of Sarasota, unincorporated Sarasota County, and they pay those assessments to those, um, to those governmental entities already. Um, I'm looking for equitability um, across our city between our residences, our businesses, and the churches. Um, I definitely would very much like to see this exemption list to make sure it's not only checked twice, but thrice, um, because I don't understand why some people are not paying those assessments when they should be. Um, so um, I don't, uh, Commissioner Hanks, you, you yeah, have your sorry, hand. Mayor, only because you kind of addressed me there. I just want to speak a little bit to what you said. <laughs> Yeah, um, as a as a commissioner in Northport and as a citizen of Northport, I'm not looking to compare myself to other cities and municipalities. I'm looking to be a standard above the rest. Um, you know, there, you know, um, you know whether you want to call that, you know, uh, Northport exceptionalism, 
uh, you know, 300 years ago, we had what was called American exceptionalism. It's what brought forth the original argument that, uh, that, that was a precursor to us even becoming a nation. Um, and I think that's the direction we need to be looking from. And I think if we can set a standard of for all our municipalities throughout our entire county, possibly throughout the entire state and then the nation it, it, itself that says, listen, we understand that, the, that, that, that these organizations, they're here because, because of the very things that, uh, that, uh, pe that people need. And so, you know, they're not a, a big burden upon the city. They're not a big burden upon the taxpayer. I think, um, I think our road and drainage dump trash twice a week for New Hope and, and instead of once. But, but I mean, where was that, where was that value lost in the 3,000 people fed? Um, I would venture to say that it was that, that, that we didn't lose anything. Um, I, I would venture to say more was gained from it. And I think showing that exceptionalism and being a city that does that is very important. And uh, I would set the example for Venice. And I agree with you. If you're a for-profit company, you need to be paying your assessments. But these organizations, they don't work for, for, for profit. They make their money uh, to do civil service off of donations. FPL's not working off of a donation. They haven't asked me, how much do you want to give? You know, they tell me how much I owe them every single month. And if I don't pay it, they're going to shut me down. A, a church doesn't do that. They offer services whether they make the money or not until they can't. And this is why I think it's very important that we raise the standard, that we raise the bar, and we set that example of Northport exceptionalism. All right. I don't see anybody else that would like to weigh in. Um, I, I would like to see if we could give city manager direction to look over that um, that assessment list for exemptions. Um, and for one thing, and um, I don't know what anybody else would like to do regarding the road and drainage assessments. If it's only that $20,000, there's really no point. But boy, Vice Mayor mentioned um, possibly using the current methodology and seeing what that would entail and um, for road and drainage for the churches. I, uh, Vice Mayor, did you want to speak to that uh, exemption for the road and drainage for these exempted properties? what you were looking for? I, I think that would be up to road and drainage if they wanted to use the current methodology to get an approximate amount of what the difference would be. Mm -hmm. uh, then I think we would have a little more to talk about. Um, I'll speak to the topic that was being discussed too. There's a lot of individuals who do charity work. There's a lot of philanthropy work being done. There's a lot of other nonprofits that aid, not just the religious entities. So though I appreciate what all the religious entities do, um, there's residents who do that sort of stuff too. And they're already exempt from the you know property tax and we exempting them from the fire. But when we're looking at the entire city as a whole for road and drainage, uh, or for drainage, I'll put it that way, uh, it needs to be cared for in every square inch. And um, that's just my feeling on it. Uh, I think it needs to be citywide. But I don't mind um, seeing if staff is willing to put a little few little figures together and come back uh, for another discussion. And churches must maintain their property by standard. So that would not affect what they're doing. I'm sorry, Commissioner Hanks, could you say that again, yeah. please? Yeah, no, well, she addressed road and drainage and everything being, being taken care of. I believe she even talked about mowing. If I if I heard correctly, it kind of broke out just a little bit there. So I thought you said something. So it so it broke out a little bit. Well, then would you repeat because it broke out for me on my end. I'm I'm sorry. No, that's no problem. The drainage is being done all over the city. It's citywide, 
And so I think to incorporate all the parcels playing a part in that is important to that methodology um, being successful. And I know we're talking about the money aspect of it, uh, just being fair to, to all persons is what I was stating. Thank you. I guess when it kind of broke up right around the parcel spot, and I, and I guess that's where my head was getting on the mowing part. So Vice Mayor, do you want to make a motion or gather a consensus or give direction to city manager? If not, uh, Mayor, that would be up to you. I mean, this is a presentation. I don't believe we can have a motion, but you can ask for a consensus. I don't know right. if you want it both items together. I would think different, you know, split them up, uh, but that would be up to you, ma'am. Okay, I, I just, I didn't know if you, since you, you spoke to it, and I'll go ahead and pass the virtual gavel to vice mayor. Um, oh, we can't. Well, you're just a, asking for a consensus. Yeah. Mayor, I'd so, like to ask for a consensus. Okay, mm -hmm. hang on one second. City attorney, um, can we do motions with presentation things or is it only consensuses? You don't have this item noticed for possible action or. Okay. Okay, so let's get a consensus to have city manager um, bring back more information regarding the road and drainage methodology using the current methodology um, applied to all parcels. Am I capturing that correctly for you, Vice Mayor? Yes. Thank you. So I, consensus, uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Emmerich? I'll be a yes as long as all that information is in-house and we are not hiring consultant at this point for these numbers. Great point. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carison? Yes. Mayor? And uh, hang on. Commissioner Hanks, consensus? I want to hear what the city manager has to say towards it first, just in case. Okay. City manager the interrupted is I'm not sure I understand what you're asking us to do. To bring back information using the current methodology and how that would look if it was applied to all parcels. It already is. There's an exemption. Are you looking to remove the exemption? The, or? Thank you. To remove the exemption. Okay, that's that's true. That's why I say I had no idea where we were going. I appreciate that. Uh, see this in my mind. <laughs> Seeing as how I would never remove the exemptions, uh, I'm, I'm going to be announced. All right. So we have the consensus for the city manager to bring back more information using the current road and drainage methodology, removing the exemptions <laughs> applied to all parcels across the city. And that consensus passed. And then we'll get another consensus for the city manager to prepare a document showing all of the exempted par city manager. I, I don't know what the document is that you you get that shows what properties are exempt. Help me out here. Sorry, I had to make sure I was unmuted. So I I think I know where you're going. I, I do have a a question after I clarify what you're looking for. So you want to know, you want to know who else is getting exemptions. That that's fairly simple to do. Um, we'll we'll just look to a search of the properties, see who's not paying and who is paying, and what they are. And the question, the other follow up question I had is, if you're removing the entire exemption from road and drainage, are you also removing it from fire rescue? No, it was just for the road and drainage. That's okay, what we want to make sure that we're bring you everything you wanted. Thank you. Um, so without knowing how big this list is, I mean, is that something you can provide us a, a breakdown of everybody that's getting an exemption? Yes, it lists about 73. It's every parcel in the city. So it's about 73,000 parcels. Um, we'll just see who's paying zero. Um, but it's, okay. while that may sound like a lot, it's actually not as big a deal as it sounds. Okay, before we get consensus, Commissioner Carison, your hand is up. Yeah, um, I guess my concern here with that is that we had a case 
a case long time ago when we were trying to uh, take all of the exemptions out, like school board property, government properties, and we could not do that. And I don't remember the case real well, but I know that we lost it, that I do, and that we had to give them a certain exemption. So are we talking about looking about all these exemptions? I mean, because honestly, I'm thinking how pretty much the only one we're allowed to, on you. Uh, Something happened with your speech and, and we lost yeah. what you were trying to say. Pete, you're muted. Well, I hit on mute, but apparently hit the wrong one. Um, I do know what she's referring to because yes, we did try to assess properties that we were not legally allowed to. Right. Um, so maybe my answer needs a little clarification. We'll bring you back a list of the properties that we're legally allowed to assess that we are not. Um, and that's why I said removing the exemptions. It's not an exemption for Sarasota County. It's not an exemption for schools. They have a legal, um, it, it wasn't a commission directed exemption. We tried and we lost. Um, we did try to charge other governments for items that we ultimately lost in court that we're not allowed to. So I would not include those on the list simply because we legally are not allowed to charge them. So I, I believe we're looking for commission directed exemptions. Is, is the way that I interpreted that, but I think it's a little more clear now. That's a fair I'm sorry, Commissioner Carasone, I lost you again. Your audio. I said that's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Ms. Amber, you're, you, uh, Ms. Slayton, I'm sorry, your, your hand is up. Yes, just to follow up on what the city manager said, some some exemptions are mandatory under the law, and I think what you're looking for is what we would call discretionary exemptions that are within the, the commission's discretion. And the vice mayor. I think if the city manager sent out a memo stating which ones were exempted and the why, it would show th those that you can't, and then those, for whatever reason, we would have an explanation. And if it's sent in a, a memo, if one of the commissioners had an issue with any of it, we then could put it on an agenda item instead of having him come back with an agenda item, just make it a memo initially to see if it's something that he, we even want to bring up later. So, Vice Mayor, would you like to put that in consensus form and we'll go ahead and get consensus on that? Uh, yeah, I would like to direct a uh, city manager to bring back a memo showing the commission which entities are exempt from assessments and the reason why. All right, so we have a consensus as stated by um, Vice Mayor. Um, Commissioner Carasone, yes or no? I'm I'm thoroughly confused. I thought that we would get a a list of of the properties that are now exempt where we could legally take the exemption off, however that may be. And we need to know what the financial implications of that is, not just the why the why is because the commission allowed it there's really no answer to a why um I, I guess you know that would be my information i'd like to see is you know how many properties i'm not i don't want to know the specifics but the properties the financial implication of adding them back onto the road and drainage tax tax rolls what are the, the different ways that you can do it? And what are those financial implications? Um, you know, be it just the house of worship itself, the whole property, whatever. Um, and then, you know, what's our estimated time for the, uh, the actual redo of that road and drainage methodology? Um, and I need, I, I need more information about the costs 
the, the cost effects, you know, how will it save, will it save, will it not save, those things, uh, other than just the, this is a list of them and, and the why is because the commission said so. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Vice Mayor. I believe Commissioner Carazon is talking about the road and drainage uh, to the first consensus with the House of Worship, where we're talking about that list uh, where the FPL was on, showing that there are other entities. And if there's, like she brought up that there are some that you have to by law, city attorney spoke to it, and just, you know, have to by law, uh, commission, stated it, you know, whatever the reason for that, even if it's a house of worship, house of worship, whatever, why they're exempt from the assessment is what I was referring to. Not, not just, not just house of worship. See, uh, my, my screen blanked out and I didn't hear that part. So, all right. Thank you. Certainly. And, and I, I do like the idea that uh, Commissioner Carasone had mentioned about adding the financial impact because we need to know, you know, if we were charging FPL, what would we have gotten, you know, in, re, in for? So um, yeah, so the consensus is for the city manager to provide a memo with a list of entities and why they're exempt and the financial impact. And Vice Mayor said yes, Commissioner Carasone. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Commissioner Hanks, and I know you have another consensus you want to get, and we'll get to that. So, Commissioner Hanks, on this one. Uh, no, no, I can see where this whole thing is, so we don't need to worry about mine. Uh, yeah, I'm okay with uh, with gathering in, in, in information now. That's, that's okay. okay. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. All right. So, and obviously, yes, I, I'm a yes also. So there you go, city manager. Do you think that's something you could have ready for budget for when we're doing the budget discussion? Because it might play into what we're going to be doing next month with our budget. You'll have to unmute, sir. I keep clicking the wrong spot. Um, yes, we'll do our best. Um, if it requires more, then we'll let you know if it's going to cause it as a delay. Fantastic. Appreciate that. All right. So, Commissioner Hanks, do you want to try and get your consensus or talk about the consensus? Sure, why not? We'll get everybody here. Uh, I would like to get a consensus to have uh, the city manager and, um, and our road and drainage department bring back uh, an exemption uh, for them also so we can have an across the board exemption. I'm sorry, you broke up an exemption for what? Across the board, from fire to uh, to uh, road and drainage, pro providing the exemptions across the board. Right now, road and drainage does not provide an exemption. Yes, they do. No, they no, do. no. You're, but what I'm saying is, you're 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 talking about. You want to bring. I want to bring it across the board for the entire property. Is what I'm saying. Not not just a sanctuary. Fire right now does not. They only, they only provide for for uh, for the sanctuary, right? Yes, fire is the sanctuary. Fire right. property from fire and road and drainage to provide that exemption for houses of worship. Okay, I think I understand. So the commissioner Hanks, you wanted right now road and drainage provides an exemption for the whole property. You want that same exemption applied to fire and see what that financial impact would be. Yes, I want it across the board. All right, so I have a consensus for them to prepare the financial impact to remove the fire assessment entirely. Is that correct, Commissioner Hanks? Yes, as road and drainage. Well, okay. Um, Vice Mayor? No. Commissioner Emmerich? If I'm correct, I believe uh, Commissioner Hanks is uh, talking about making the fire the exact same thing as road and drainage uh, exemption, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yes. So keeping it across the board. So I'd be a yes getting the information back. I would like to see what those numbers look like. Commissioner Carousel. 
So we're talking about information, right? We're just talking about getting some information about how that would impact it, correct? Wasn't that what the... So it's we're information not only. Yes. Yeah, we're making right. a decision, actually expanding this the exemption, therefore expanding the road and drainage fees to the individual. We're talking about information. Yes. In other words, if you go and change that bucket where the money is now going to come out of that bucket, but you still need a bucket that has X amount of dollars, that means that the everyday resident, their money is going to go and increase in their rates because you have to, you have to uh, replace the money in that bucket or it comes out of the city's general fund. It comes from somewhere. It's not just up in the air and doesn't come from anywhere. So the question is, this is not a decision. This is just information to figure out how much would those buckets be and where is the money gonna come from essentially? Yes, I'm looking for information because what I would like to see is what the equitability of it is. Thank you. Make this decision from one side or the other. I want to see what it looks like across the board. So that way we can see whether or not what these services, what, what are these entities provide is equitable enough to be able to say this. Yes. Oh, well, then you're basically saying what I said earlier when I was confused about what Commissioner Luke was asking is that we needed to know what are the exemptions? What is the, if we expand it? And, and so, yeah, I'm okay with information as far as, you know, uh, making a decision. I can't do that, but I'm okay with the information. Yeah, I'm sorry if I phrased it wrong before. I mean, you always need information before you can make a decision. Mm. Uh, right? So, in so perfect like world. it is equitably, but I will tell you in my question with the city manager was because I fully believe I'm 100% positive that the equitability is there. So... That is the direction I would probably lean or I will be leaning, I'm sure, because I guarantee you it's going to show the equitability there. Before I give my, I know we have a consensus, but um, city manager, is this something that staff can prepare? Or do we have to hire a consultant? No, again, we'll just figure out how much they're getting as an exemption um, and the properties are getting a partial exemption and just remove the dollar amount. It shouldn't be that big of a thing. I'm all for getting the information. Um, so yes, the consensus passes. Um, I am not in favor of removing it, but I'd like to just see the, the dollar amount because um, so we'll have that conversation when they get the information to us. Thank you. All right. So now we will see nothing else on this item. We'll move on to the uh, discussion and possible action regarding the ownership of the alley at CVS and Popeyes between that CVS and Popeyes. Um, city manager. Not the item we're on, ma'am. We're there's on a, the resolution. There's a resolution oh, first. I, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I jumped ahead. Resolution uh, 2020 R17 for the Highway Lighting Maintenance and Compensation Agreement. City Clerk, would you please read by title only? Resolution number 2020-R-17, a resolution of the City of Northport, Florida, approving and authorizing the mayor to execute the State of Florida Department of Transportation State Highway Lighting Maintenance and Compensation Agreement for all street lights, 288 located on U.S. Highway 41, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. All right, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this one is an item we bring to you every year. The state pays us to maintain their streetlights. Um, as the City Clerk mentioned, there's 288 of them. So the revenue for that for the next Revenue year would be $77,785.92, and the estimated expenditures are little less than $32,000. So with that, I'll just turn it over to you all. Does anybody have any questions, please? Seeing no questions, do we have any public comment on this item? No, ma'am, you do not. Thank you very much. All right, still no questions. So we'll go ahead and entertain a motion, please. Move to approve resolution number 2020-R-17. I'll second. second. Okay. 
Got a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor to approve Resolution 2020-R17, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. All righty, so we'll go ahead and take the voice vote. Um, Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Carasone? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. And myself a yes, and that passed unanimously, five to zero. All right, so now we will move on <laughs> to the assumption of that private road. Um, city Manager. Thank you, Mayor. We're gonna need to pull Ms. Balia back in here. I'll let her um, do her presentation. As you know, we've had multiple conversations in the past about potholes in, in the road behind what is currently CVS and Popeyes, that area, um, and the other businesses along there as well, but I'll let Ms. Balia give her presentation. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, Ms. Julie. Can you hear me, Mayor? Sorry. Yes, we can. Nope. Thank you, Ms. Julie. Okay, Thank sorry. My, my computer is going crazy. For the record, Juliana Belia, Public Works Director. Um, probably for the past eight years, uh, the city staff, uh, namely the Department of Public Works, uh, Utilities Department, and Neighborhood Development Services, has been um, highly involved uh, with trying to uh, engage the property management company and now, of course, um, the property owners with maintaining the um, alleyway or private roadway behind uh, the commercial establishments between South, South Sumter Boulevard and Tuscola Boulevard. Uh, that being said, uh, during the February 4th, 2020 commission meeting, uh, they, direct, we, they directed staff to come up with some costs associated with us, uh, the city taking over the service road. Um, so staff began our research and we've had fully intended on preparing the cost analysis. Um, so our first step was to have our engineering division manager, uh, Gerardo Traverso, inspect that roadway to determine its existing condition. Uh, the condition is extremely poor. Um, it, it, there are a lot of drainage issues. So a lot of the problems with the roadway are being that the roadway is not constructed to the Unified uh, Land Development Code standards. There's a lot of different uh, pavement uh, thicknesses, no consistency really, but the large, uh, the, the uh, largest part of impact is from the poor drainage and um, some of the drainage structures are not set properly. There's a whole variety of issues. So in order to properly come up with a cost analysis of how much it would cost for the city to take over that roadway, um, that is not something that we could uh, do in-house. We would have to reach out to the, uh, the engineering library. Uh, we'd have to process the task work order uh, in order to um, properly come up with uh, a number but it appears that it would be very costly to do that. So prior to doing that, we wanted to come to the commission with our report. Um, in the meantime, uh, we have to continue to try to make sure that roadway is safe. It is uh, heavily utilized, it's heavily trafficked by the public going to the commercial establishments as well as uh, the city garbage trucks um, if EMS needs to get back there, the uh, police department. So we do, we do have a part in taking care of that road. Um, although it's private, we, along with that, we went out and we uh, asked for the city attorney's office to, for a legal opinion on a couple of things. Uh, and the city attorney's office did provide a, uh, two opinions, actually one a few months back to Neighborhood Development Services Department. And um, we really should have some type of an agreement in place to, to be assisting with the maintenance. Just to kind of summarize, we should be charging um, for any repairs that we provide. Uh, we have, we've, we've made two major pothole repairs. When I say pothole, it's probably four to five feet deep and very large in diameter. 
So it's it's not just your, your average small pothole. It's it's a large, large uh, area that encompasses a, a great amount of width of that alleyway. We, we did send a bill. Uh, we sent an invoice. Uh, it's been over a month for uh, $800 and change. We have yet to see, uh, receive payment for that. And uh, since they have not paid, we will be turning this over to code enforcement uh, to process. Uh, we're in the process of preparing another invoice for the pothole repair. Um, but with that, um, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Mayor, I would just say, Mayor, please, I would just say, a please, 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 Commissioner Hanks, I'm sorry, you were at, you were saying something, Commissioner Hanks? Yeah, no, I just said if some of these potholes are four to five foot deep, that's more like a sinkhole. Like that's huge if they're that deep. And I know some of them are deep, but I never thought they were five foot deep. Good gosh. Vice Mayor, you go ahead, please. Probably swallowed Jerry, didn't it? <laughs> um, sorry, Jerry, couldn't help it. Now, if this is going to be turned over to code enforcement, uh, what what will the process be for us to be repaid back or for them to repair it where it needs to be? I mean, at, at this point, I hesitate that the city take it over. I mean, this is... Uh, drainage issue, storm water. I mean, it's huge. It's not just resurfacing a road. We're talking about redoing something and it's supposed to have been on them all along. So I don't know if it would require an agreement to be draft before we hold them accountable or we hold them accountable to what we have currently and then speak to them. I mean, because I think of uh, some of the CDDs that we made them make the roads perfect before we took them over. We we didn't take any of those roads over without, you know, when it was needing some kind of repair or maintenance to it. They had to get it where it needed to be first. So my question to Julie or somebody would be, how do we proceed to make them uh, make it in good condition. Mayor, if I, if I may, or Vice Mayor, um, a couple of things. What, and this is not the first time we've brought this before code enforcement. It's been brought before them many times. Uh, I've spoken to the board. They've tried to get various owners. This is not the first pothole. This is probably the largest pothole um, it's been extremely difficult, extremely difficult to get them to not just pay the fine, but then keep the road maintained. And unfortunately, the way that it was, uh, um, the development order and, and the uh, platting and all that of it, each owner owns, they don't really own, they're responsible for maintaining behind their property, that portion of the alleyway. So that complicates it even further. So to get a consistent maintenance is difficult. Uh, but you raise a good point. Uh, and, and the second uh, city attorney's opinion um, is with respect to acquiring the property. So, um, you know, potential interest to acquire, we could achieve it by fee simple title or by obtaining an easement. Uh, and then some of the methods of uh, interest would be through purchase, donation, or possibly eminent domain. And there are specific processes that we would have to go through. Uh, and I agree with you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I believe that we would, if we are going to ask them to donate it to us or sell it to us or however we're going to obtain it, I think we should put the onus on the, the property owners to bring the road up to standards, which it is not. It is not constructed simply because it, it was not platted or developed as a, a public roadway. Uh, same thing with the drainage. We would require that drainage. We would recommend that the drainage 
as well be brought up to city standards. Okay, I have a second question for Ms. Julie. Uh, I've run businesses within the city and the trucks, uh, garbage trucks had to go over my driveway in order to obtain the garbage. Um, you guys didn't aid in the drive in the road that and went road to that went to business that business I that I okay we got feedback going on. Miss Julie, on. could you please go ahead? Uh, there was no agreement, or the city didn't aid in the help of that road or that driveway for the business that I ran. So why would we think that we would have to partner with them? Uh, just because our police go there, our garbage trucks go there. I'm wondering why we would feel a sense of responsibility for their road, knowing full well that the public is going to access it and that garbage trucks and police vehicles would have to utilize it too. That's my question. So Vice Mayor, we don't, we as staff don't feel a need that we take over this road. What we feel is we've had a large amount of comments come in of that the road behind these businesses is a problem. It is a private road and we continually get asked to solve a private matter that's not ours to solve. And in an effort to try to make a problem go away, we're bringing this in front of you all at the request of commissioners in the past of you know, I, and I know every single one of you has received the emails and you forward them on. There's got to be something we can do. This is what we can do. Otherwise, we need to put this to bed and realize that when cars crash into that those potholes that are four and five feet deep and there's car parts in there and they're filled with water, it's it, we either make it our issue or not. But that's what this is ultimately designed to solve is when people call us and say, why aren't you guys fixing this? It's not ours, um, but it's it's one of those problems that has been brought to us as though we need to solve somebody else's problem. So we're asking you ultimately, do you guys want us to solve this or not? And that's a, that is a policy decision and this is a way we can fix it. And if we don't wanna fix it, then we're not going to and that's what we'll be telling people going forward. Thank you, city manager, appreciate that. Uh, seeing no other lights on, I do have a couple questions. Um, does anybody know how many times in the past five years, 10 years, how many times has the city gone out and fixed behind that alleyway? I, I, I know don't just know who has an answer to that. I can tell you, I hear about it every time it rains. Mm. How Our many times have we gone out and fixed it? Gone out and fixed it? Public Works has fixed the pothole, various potholes along that alley, I would say probably a dozen different times over the past eight years. Have we been reimbursed, we for, been each reimbursed one of those? for each one of those? Not for all of them, for some of them. Some of them through code enforcement action only. But we finally got paid. Thank you. Um, this next question will be for the city attorney. Ms. Julie, could you please mute? Could you please mute? I don't know why hers does that. <laughs> uh, city attorney, um, I know that we, we've we assessed special assessments for like Floribana for their water and sewer projects and stuff. Um, can we do a special assessment for all of those properties um, and, and charge a special assessment and for the repairs for upgrading the road? No, ma'am. And we cannot use private funds or public funds for private gain, which is what that would be. But if we ultimately then charged it back on their property taxes, could we do something like that? And it came to mind because that PACE uh, program where the government does this and then you pay it back through your property assessments. Um, so I was wondering if we could do something like that. I'm sorry, Mary, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's a little bit different because that's a program that's set up that you opt into 
and they just utilize the property tax form essentially as the mechanism to repay what's ultimately like a loan. So that's not it's not a true assessment and it's not a true tax either. I think the the methods you have here are the code enforcement methods, which can ultimately result in liens and foreclosure if the city wants to get paid and wants to go that route, um, or it's to um, you know to, to purchase the property or an easement on the property or some some other way of, of gaining ownership of it. If the city wants to be responsible for maintaining that property going forward. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments? Seeing none, does anybody want to take any action? Because I am not in favor of accepting the responsibility for this road. It's sending a very horrible message to everybody else that has private property um, roads that they don't have to maintain it. These are their roads, they're not the city's roads. They're, this road in particular is in horrible disarray. We've rescued them countless of times, don't know if we're ever gonna get paid back for that. And um, I could never expend taxpayer dollars to fix a private road, even if it's turned over to us, uh, because it is a very, very slippery slope that we would be going down. And um, it's their property. They have to maintain their parking lot for their their customers. That, like Vice Mayor said, for businesses that come in for fire or EMS or trash pickup, those have to be maintained. And this is their responsibility. So that's where I'm standing on it. I would never approve anything like that. Um, Commissioner Hanks. Yeah, I would agree with you, Mayor. Um, you know. If you know, if they don't want folks traveling back there, they need to put up a no trespassing sign. That's and, right. You know, then they wouldn't have to deal with it, uh, put up a fence or a gate or whatever they need to do. But uh, I agree with you. We don't need to be taking care of this for them. We don't need to be taking over the road. The costs are just not, are just not beneficial for us. Absolutely. And if they want their trash picked up and we can't get our trucks back there, they're going to have to move it to the front so that we can get back there and get their trash picked up. They're going to have to figure out other ways around this. Um, but Commissioner Emmer, you, your turn, please. Yeah, that's one of the points I was going to bring up too about the trash. If we can't go back there, it doesn't get empty. That they would have to move it. I'm in no way in favor of taking over this road whatsoever because, according to all the problems out there, you're talking about drainage, you're talking about different layers of cement and, and asphalt and everything. You could be looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars just to repair it the right way. I'm not about to spend taxpayers' dollars to fix something that is going to help a private for profit complex. No, I am not for taking over this road whatsoever. That's all I have to say. Those were my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Emmerich. Um, before we close this out, uh, City Manager, was there any public comment on this item? Mayor, that's a question for the City Clerk. I'm sorry. We switched City the way we because of some, some issues. But okay, City Clerk, was there any was there any public comment on this? No. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Commissioner Luke, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm in agreement with everybody. I don't want to see the city taking it over. I would like to see them press them though to get it repaired as it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner Emmerich. Did you want to speak again? No, ma'am. Is my hand still up? Uh, not now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, I, I, if we were to give any direction, it would be to have, before I give ask this city manager, if the road is not maintained appropriately for fire, EMS, police, trash, is that a code enforcement issue then? Mm -hmm. Mayor, I appreciate you asking. That's why I raised my hand. I was going to let you all know that going forward, if 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 we go the direction that it appears that you all are going, we're going to address this through a code enforcement. And when we get complaints from people that there are potholes or large things, we will refer it to code enforcement, like we do with any any other issues that the public brings to us. Um, because yes, closing the alleyway is actually not an option for them right. because it's part of the access for fire and EMS. Yep. But maintaining it is at their expense. And 
it, it's not something that we will be going out there in the future and fixing for them. That's the direction I hear you all going. I, like I said, from the beginning, staff doesn't have a position on this. We wanna know which way you all, what policy you wanted to set, we will follow that. And it sounds like the policy you all are setting is when this, when they don't meet the standards they're required to meet, we will send code enforcement out. Fantastic. I think if any direction needs to be given is a strongly worded letter to every property owner in that complex saying that we're not rescuing them anymore and that they have to maintain it. My, and I don't know if that can be done. I don't know if you saw my hand. It's been up. I I, I just now saw it come on. Sorry, Commissioner Carson. Okay. No, I just want to say there's got to be some other legal aspect or repercussion that we can take, uh, seeing as though it may be considered health, safety, and welfare of the community, that uh, there's got to be a secondary source of legal remedy versus just the code enforcement aspect that maybe Amber can look into and give us a memo on. Uh, because I, I feel that this is a safety issue. It kind of falls under the line where a house is unsafe and the county comes in and condemns it. I think uh, that we have given them ample warning, plenty of warning. This has gone, gone on for too many years. And that at some point in time, you know, we're going to have to get serious. And so the question is, what, what is it that we can do uh, you know, in, in legal matter, uh, legal means to get serious. I totally agree. Mayor? Go ahead, please. Mayor, it's uh, Julie again. Um, one of the things I'd like to recommend is that Public Works um, work with a Neighborhood Development Services Department on a commercial property maintenance code. One of the issues I see throughout is uh, many of the uh, shopping areas, they don't maintain the regulatory signs. Uh, they don't take care of the parking lots. This is, just, this is just not specific to this alleyway. It's throughout the city. And I think maybe that might be the answer is to come up with an ordinance that these uh, commercial uh, establishments and subdivisions will be required to meet and, and meet maintenance requirements. That way we would have, uh, when they don't do it, we'll have uh, code enforcement provisions within that ordinance to, to make them do it. I would be all for that because uh, we, this is not going away anytime soon. Other businesses are gonna have the same problems coming up. Go ahead, Commissioner Carson. Okay, um, I absolutely agree that there should be some sort of commercial code that goes beyond what exists, and I'm trying to be very gentle with the way I say things, because if we were to take this specific life safety being issue, would not want it to be held up or no longer legally defensible by saying codes do not exist for commercial properties. So what I'm trying to say is that I am okay with creating a individual separate code for commercial properties. However, in this particular case, I think health, safety, and welfare has been an issue for over 10 years and therefore needs to have legal action if it happens again or options other than um, code enforcement because code enforcement is a uh, just a long process that is, you know, how many, how many times can you give them the code enforcement uh, alley? And, um, you know, they need to, they need to be held accountable because it's like a, it's honest to God, it's, it's like having a deadbeat, uh, uh, you know, um, what do you call them? Landlords, you know, uh, it's the same deal. It's not, it's not the poor people in there renting those properties out. It's not the people who, 
you know, are are trying to make a living. And it's it's the people who own the property that are collecting the, the rent, collecting the maintenance fees that are not keeping up. And again, I still think being health, safety, and welfare, uh, maybe it is something that the county will have to be brought in on, but I don't think one should be key to the other, to be very clear. I, I think that a consistency in commercial code okay but one thing should not have anything to do with the other because they're already had we already have code that exists that says they must maintain that and furthermore uh in any other area be it charlotte county sarasota county unincorporated city of venice if you cannot get to the area without it being safe then they will not get their trash picked up they will not get their fire services. I right. mean, fire services are a little bit different, but you know, there are things, there are services that will not be provided. Uh, I know in Port Charlotte, if your car is in front of the dumpster, they will keep driving. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that I don't, I don't want to hamper us on taking care of this particular issue by getting wrapped up in a future policy or code. I want us to have it completely separate. Not that I don't agree. I, I completely agree with, with Ms. Belia. Um, but it, and on this particular issue, it needs to be separate. All right, uh, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I'm in total agreement with what Commissioner Carazone said. We have enough already to address this issue. Uh, I would like to see more of a refined uh, ordinance. Maybe when we uh, update the ULDC, it could be made within that process. But that is something different that the two departments can work on and bring forward in the future. This incident stands alone and we have enough already that it can be cared for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think city manager, um, at this point, is there anything you need from us other than, like I was saying earlier, a strongly worded letter to go out to each and every one of those property owners that we're done. This is their responsibility. And however you want to word that and any other legal options that might be available that the city attorney can throw in there. Nope, I'm good. You need nothing from us? No, ma'am. So just for the record, we are not taking any action about taking over ownership of this property. Can I, can I get a concession? Commissioner Carasone, go ahead, please. Sorry, I no eyeballs. I can't see what I'm touching here. Um, can I get consensus to have city attorney work on what are the other legal repercussions that can be taken uh, what kind of actions that can be taken against the landowner if the um, road becomes unserviceable once again and it can delay not only EMS uh, fire and all the other services that are required to use that alleyway. So, um, you know, I think we need to get some information on what we can do if and when this happens again. Is that consensus? Uh, City Attorney, do you have any questions on what she was asking before we take a vote on that? No. No? Okay. Um, okay, so Commissioner, I'm sorry, Commissioner Carastone, go ahead. Did you want to speak to that consensus? I think I spoke to it for the last 20 minutes. That's what I was okay. <laughs> okay, so Commissioner Emmerich, yes, no on Here. the consensus. I'm sorry, I can't hear who's speaking. I don't see a hand up. It's me and I can't put my hand up. I, I don't have a hand to put up. It's okay, but um, Chief Titus has his hand up. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Chief Titus. Yeah, I'm sorry. And I was trying to send a message. Um, we're trying to quickly do some research before you finished or took some action. Um, and I'm not sure we'll have the answer before this is done. It depends on how that road was originally put in. Uh, the fire marshal is trying to find information right now. If that was in, if that was put in as a private road, 
Um, it may not meet any of the standards of the city but as far as width or anything else goes, which is why there may be continued problems. Um, and as long as there is access, appropriate access to the front and the sides of the buildings, we may not be able to restrict that. If it became a safety hazard, I believe there is something that we, we could do, um, but they may be able to actually close it. They may actually be able to close it down to public use if they decide to do that. We're researching that right now, but I just wanted to, I wanted to mention that before you took any action um, based on the information I provided earlier. Uh, if, if it was not a private road, yes, we do have some options, but I'm not sure we're looking right now to see how we can do it. Thank you, Chief. Commissioner Carson. At the building. Oh, boy. Um, the building department has all the information because it was already researched the last time we went through all this lovely nonsense. Um, and I'm, I'm with you. I don't know if it's necessarily a main road or public access road. I think it became a public ac access road and then was actually meant for deliveries. So... Um, that may be the legal issue that we have, but that's why I was kind of hoping Amber would kind of figure all that lovely stuff out because she's a genius and we can go from there. <laughs> we will certainly help any way we can. So, but I just I wanted to make sure the original information I provided to the city manager about us being able to enforce it was, was maybe not correct because of how the road may have originally been installed. So we will get with the building department and provide whatever help we can. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> All right, so let's go back to the consensus and I'm sure city attorney will coordinate with building department, Chief Titus, police chief, solid waste, every other entity that has to use that area to gain access for life safety. So um, Commissioner Carasone's yes. Commissioner Hanks. Yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor Luke? Yes. And I am a yes too, so that passed five to zero. Um, and I look forward to seeing what the what that is um, and the information you find. So thank you, City Attorney. Thank you, Commissioner Carison. All right, is there anything else on this item? Do we have any public comments? No, ma'am, we do not. All right, so at this time, before we all cut out of this meeting, um, I know we have, 10 minutes until six o'clock and we still have to do solid waste. So I am officially going to adjourn the road and drainage district meeting, but we need to figure out what are we doing because we probably have to quickly take a health break before we start this next meeting. What is it that uh, city manager and Miss Julie, do you want to do with the solid waste meeting? Mayor, I think that decision has to be made once you get in the solid waste meeting. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, we have a presentation for you that I believe could be delayed. If that's what you wanted, we could schedule okay. a solid waste meeting for another date. Um, okay, so we'll have this discussion. We'll open up. I, I didn't know if we had to open up the solid waste meeting to have it. I just was trying okay, to be proactive and jump the gun again. <laughs> that's why we're here. All right, so, so we <coughs> adjourn the road and drainage meeting at 5.50 and uh, city clerk, Please let me know when we can go ahead and start the um, uh, solid waste meeting. You can start. All right, so it is now 551 and I do call this solid waste district meeting to order. We'll go ahead and do road call, roll call. Vice Mayor. Present. Commissioner Carson. Still here. Commissioner Emmerich. Present. Commissioner Hanks. Here. And I am here. We also have City uh, Attorney Slayton, City Clerk Taylor, City Manager Lear, and I am sure Chief Garrison is still in the house also. Um, so we do have a quorum for the Solid Waste District meeting. Um, City, City Attorney, um, we have eight minutes now until our commission meeting um, is to start. What is your advice with the help of um, city manager and uh, Ms. Balia? Um, well, I do need to read the statement related to virtual meetings. And after that, 
Um, I think the, the board can look at whether or not there are any items on this agenda that they can tackle before 6 p.m. The clerk does have to start the commission meeting under a different meeting ID. So we can't just hang out here like we would if we were in the chambers and you know just let the other meeting run late. We do need to um, open that meeting on time. And okay. we can also open the meeting and then if everyone needs a break, you know, so we're going to recess for five or 10 minutes, that's an option too. Okay, so city attorney, do you have to read these notice of instructions? I do need to, yes ma'am. Okay, so go ahead, please. Thank you. In accordance with the governor's executive order 2069 and the city manager's emergency order number 2020-06 revised, this is a virtual meeting with elected officials, charter officers, and city staff participating through video conferencing using Zoom, which is a form of communications media technology. If there are any technical difficulties that prevent the use of this technology for the conduct of the meeting, the meeting must be recessed or adjourned until the problems have been corrected. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, City Hall is closed to the public. Information about ways to watch the live stream and provide public comment are posted on the city's website at cityofnorthport.com slash online meetings. It's also posted on the front windows of City Hall and attached to the agenda for this meeting. This meeting is being broadcast live on the city's website, live on YouTube, accessible on video via Zoom, and accessible by telephone via Zoom. To provide public comment, commenters can submit the online public comment form on the city's website at cityofnorthport.com slash public comment. It can also be made by leaving a voicemail message at 941-429-1032. Each option has time restrictions um, and requirements that are advertised in the form and in the outgoing voicemail message. Comments that meet the requirements and that are timely submitted will be accepted and included in the official record of the meeting. Any comment that's not timely or doesn't meet those requirements will be rejected and not included in the official record of the meeting. For today's meeting, my opinion is that these measures satisfy all applicable legal requirements. Thank you. City Manager, I see you've got a comment that you would like to make or weigh in on something, but please go ahead. Yes, ma'am. The item that's on general business, which is the presentation, which will take up 99% of this meeting, uh, the other 1% being the city attorney's opening comments, um, <laughs> it can be what can be delayed. It doesn't have to happen today. Um, it, it was on there because we had scheduled it for here, but if, if you're okay, if you all would accept that, I will pull that item from the agenda. So when you have the uh, approval of the agenda, if you could pull item four, item number 20-2164, and we'll reschedule it. I know so you moved. Public comment that I believe we've received for that item. We can attach that to the future meeting um, to be read then if, if that works for everybody. Okay, so thank you very much, city manager. I heard a motion to pull this item from the agenda. So could I get a motion to approve the agenda as presented polling item um, regarding the discussion and possible action for the organics transfer station? That was me, so moved. Thank That's you, so do I have a second? Second. Thank you, I got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Carison, seconded by Vice Mayor. Um, we'll go ahead and do voice vote. Uh, Commissioner Carousel? Yes. Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. And I am also a yes. So that passed uh, five to zero. Um, public comment, you said the only public comment you had, uh, City Clerk, was for the organics? We don't have any further public comment. Okay, so there's no public comment no. to be heard. No, City Attorney, do we have to hear the public comment regarding the organics item, seeing that it was pulled? Not if it was specific to the item, no, ma'am. No, okay, just wanna cover all our bases. So now we'll move on to consent agenda. And since there's only one item on consent and that's minutes, can I get a motion to approve consent agenda? So moved. Second. Got a motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda as presented by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. We'll go ahead and take voice vote. Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Carousel? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. And I am also yes. So consent agenda passed five to zero. We will hear the solid waste transfer station at another meeting and there's still probably no public comment. 
and it is now 557. We are adjourned. We have three minutes until we have to reconvene. So hopefully that'll give us time and then we'll figure out what we're going to do at that point. Three minutes, folks. City Clerk, are we about ready? Yes, we are. Give me just one second. Thank you very much. 
Just give me the high sign. It's good. All right, so it is now 6.02, and I call this regular commission meeting to order. Uh, we need to do roll call. So, uh, Vice Mayor? Present. Commissioner Emmerich? Present. Commissioner Hanks? Here. Commissioner Carasone? Commissioner Carasone? All right, at this time, I'm going to not have her be counted as present. Um, I am here as Mayor McDowell. We also have City Manager Lear, City Attorney Slayton, City um, Clerk Taylor, and City Manager, who is the uh, Police Department representative? Um, that would be, give me just a second. Uh, I just kicked the Deputy Chief out, so uh, that would be the Police Chief. All right, hello, Chief Garrison. All right, um, there we go. All right, so we uh, we do have a quorum and I will ask the city attorney to go ahead and um, do her little blurb about virtual meetings, please. Thank you, Mayor, would you like to do the Pledge of Allegiance first? We can go ahead and do that too. Um, go ahead and lead us in the pledge, city attorney. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, flag of the United States of America and, to the, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, City Attorney. All right, so we had roll, we did the pledge. Now your turn for your little blurb about virtual meetings. Thank you, Mayor. In accordance with the Governor's Executive Order 20-69, Manager's emergency order number 2020-06 revised. This is a virtual meeting with elected officials, charter officers, city staff, presenters, quasi-judicial applicants, and witnesses participating through video conferencing using Zoom, a form of communications media technology. If there are any technical difficulties that prevent the use of Zoom for the conduct of the meeting, the meeting must be recessed or adjourned until the problems have been corrected. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, City Hall is closed to the public. Information about ways to watch the live stream and provide public comment are posted on the city's website at cityofnorthport.com slash online meetings. It's also posted on the front windows of City Hall and attached to the agenda for this meeting. This meeting is being broadcast live on the city's website, live on YouTube, accessible on video via Zoom, and accessible by telephone via Zoom. There are two ways to provide public comment. The first is to submit a written comment via the online public comment form on the city's website at cityofnorthport.com slash public comment. This form becomes active at 9 a.m. the day before each meeting and will be deactivated at the end of public comment during the meeting. The second method is by leaving a voicemail message via telephone at 941-429-1032. Voicemail messages will be accepted the day before the meeting from 8 a.m. until 7 p.m. Required information for each of these public comment methods is referenced on the form and in the outgoing voicemail message. Comments must be received timely and meet these requirements in order to be accepted and included in the official record of the meeting. Any comment received that does not meet the public comment requirements or is untimely will be rejected and not included in the official record of the meeting. In my opinion, these measures satisfy all applicable legal requirements. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Attorney, I appreciate that. All right, so um, I don't know what the will of the board is at this point to just persevere on or do we need to take a 15 minute break? Um, we do have a long meeting ahead of us and I know we've been in meetings since four o'clock. I don't know if anybody needs a, a quick dinner break for 15 minutes. City Manager, your thoughts on your staff? I, I think we're good. Most of them um, will take a break if they need to. Those that have okay. to be here for this meeting, we're not here for the last one. So I think we're in good shape. Okay, sounds good. And uh, for the my fellow commissioners, your thoughts to keep going or do you guys want a 15 minute break? And same with us, charter officers. I'm good to keep going. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. So we will persevere. And um, at this time, I do need an approval of the agenda. So moved. 
Second. I got a motion on the floor to approve the agenda as presented, seconded by Commissioner Hanks. And we'll go ahead and take the voice vote, Vice Mayor. Yes. Commissioner Hanks. Yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. And just in case Commissioner Carasone is sitting in the wings, I will call on her one more time. Commissioner Carasone. Seeing nothing, and I am also a yes. So that passed four to zero. Um, city manager, do we have any public comment? Or, I'm sorry, city clerk, do we have any public comment? <laughs> no, ma'am. There's no general public comment? Yes, there is, but she requested to be the last one at the meeting. The last she one at the meeting? The last, yeah, number seven. Okay, thank you very much. You'll have to help me remember because that is going to be very late in the evening. So yes. help me remember that. Thank you. Okay. Um, and city clerk and the announcements, please. The current vacancies for the following boards and committees include the Art Advisory Board, Audit Committee, Beautification and Tree Scenic Highway Committee, Charter Review Advisory Board, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Historic and Cultural Advisory Board, Joint Management Advisory Board, Police Officers Pension Board of Trustees, Northport Youth Council, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Public Utility Advisory Board, Zoning Board of Appeals. The upcoming expirations for the following advisory boards and committees, Art Advisory Board, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Historic and Cultural Advisory Board, Northport Youth Council, and Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. One Northport resident to serve on the Sarasota Manatee Metropolitan Plan and Organization Citizen Advisory Network. If anyone would like more information, please see the city clerk's office. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so now we'll move on to consent agenda. City manager, has any items been pulled from the consent agenda? Mayor, the only item I have to be pulled is item F, which is the three-year software as a service agreement, um, which was requested by you. Thank you very much. May I please get a motion to approve the consent agenda pulling item F? So move. Second. Got a motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda as presented, pulling item F for discussion, and that was made by Vice Mayor and seconded by Commissioner Hanks. Anything to that, folks? No, ma'am. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and do a voice call. Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. And I am also a yes. Moving on to item number F, the consent agenda item for the executive time. Um, products, um, city manager. Thank you, mayor. This is a, a three-year software as a service agreement with Tyler Technologies, Inc., who is the company that now owns ExecuTime. Um, ExecuTime is our time and attendance software we've been using since, I believe, 2008. Um, they, at that time, were a preferred, preferred provider because their system integrates with our accounting software. Um, and they, I don't know if I said it, they are our time and attendance software. So with that, um, there is no cost to this item. It is just a, a service agreement mainly due to the change in name. But IT staff is here if you have any additional questions as well. Yeah, um, my only, and I, for the record, it's now 610. I do see Commissioner Carason is here. Um, Commissioner Carason, can you hear us? No. Okay, fantastic. So I just wanted to acknowledge her presence. Um, my only question is, is that um, it's my understanding that there's involvement with Central Square. So what is the involvement with Central Square and Executime? Central Square is, among other things, um, our ERP or the software. In this case, the reference to Executime is our time and attendance. So when people enter their time, they clock in and clock out. Um, this allows that information to be imported directly into our um, Central Square software. This is not a Central Square software itself. It interfaces with a Central Square, Central Square software. So whether you approve this or not, somehow we have to get the information into the system and we need something to track when people are here and when they're not. And that's what this software does. So this executive time with Tyler Technologies interfaces with Central Square. 
Yes, ma'am. It exports out of, out of the Executime software into Central Square software. It's a direct link. It replaced paper time timesheets. I'm fully aware of how um, software for automated technology time record management is. I'm, I'm fully aware of that. Um, I, my biggest concern is, is it's going up over $5,000. It's doubling in cost next year. And I, I don't understand why. If Central Square is still involved, and Central Square interfaces, and we have to remove the storage from the cloud that Central Square has to Tyler Technologies cloud, but we're still involved with Central Square. I, I, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this. I am going to attempt to, to give you some information because I don't know that I understand your question at all, but uh, Central Square, it, so we use Executime, exec regardless of who owns it. We use Executime right now to keep track of everybody's time. They log into Executime, they clock in, they clock out, they put in for vacation. That information exports out of Executime, which is who this agreement is with. Regardless of whether Central Square was involved or not, we're using Executime to keep track of people's time and attendance. This maintenance agreement has nothing to do with Central Square. Um, this maintenance agreement has to do with the owners of Executime, which is Tyler Technologies. Then that information exports into Central Square so that we can have it in our accounting system. So Central Square is the accounting system? Yes. Can you see? Excuse, excuse me, Mayor? Yes. Um, Eric Ryan's in here as well. He had his hand up. I don't know if Thank you can see it. For the record, Eric Ryan, IT. At one point in time, the two were friends and friendly. And so they, Central Square, chose Tyler Technology uh, to integrate with them to provide payroll, those, that, that payroll data. They are now direct competitors at a number of levels. And so Central Square is saying, you cannot reside on our servers anymore that information has to go to you, to your servers. We're not going to support that anymore because you are a direct competitor for certain services. So instead of paying Central Square for the ability to host what was Tyler Tech on a Central Square server, we're moving to Tyler Tech servers. And this is the cost for that server service from them. Do we have to use the Tyler technology servers because it's going to cost us $5,000 when we have our own servers here? Can't we use our servers? It will cost us more in the long run to use ours. I do not like Central Square. Not very friendly people. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. I got nothing more for you. Thank you for that. Uh, I move to approve consent agenda F. Second. second. Motion on the floor by vice mayor, seconded by myself. Anything to that vice mayor? The only comment I'll like to add is maybe we need to see about finding another software system for our time management. I don't know if that's possible. I don't know how long it's been since we've done it. Just putting a plant in a seed. Um, and that's all I've got. So we'll, if I have no other comments, there's no public comment on this. We'll go ahead and call the vote, voice uh, voice vote, Vice Mayor. Yes. I'm also a yes as the seconder, Commissioner Hanks. Yes. Commissioner Carison. Yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Thank you very much. And that passed five to zero. All right, moving on to public hearing um, ordinance number 2020-17, and that's annexing the 1.6 acres of property that's currently in unincorporated Sarasota County. Um, I need a motion to, to read by title only, please. So moved. Second. Motion on the floor to read by title only by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. We'll go ahead and take voice vote. Uh, Vice Mayor. Yes. 
Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. Commissioner Carso? Yes. And I'm also a yes. City Clerk, could you please read ordinance number 2020-17 by title only? <coughs> Ordinance number 2020-17, an ordinance of the city of Northport, Florida, annexing approximately 1.6 acres of real property located in the unincorporated area of Sarasota County, Florida, and contingent to the existing city limits of the city of Northport pursuant to petition number ANX-20-057 and redefining the boundary lines of the city to include this property, providing for findings, providing for annexation, providing for assessment and taxation, providing for filing of approved documents, providing for conflicts, and providing for severability, providing for an effective date. Thank you, city clerk, city manager. Thank you, Mayor. I have uh, Nicole Galehouse, our Planning Division Manager, and Allison Christie, one of our planners here. So if we can get the clerk to add Nicole Galehouse to the meeting so that she can speak, that would be wonderful. And I will turn it over to them. Thank you. Ms. Galehouse, if you're ready, you just need to unmute and whenever you're ready, please. Heather, it's saying that we um, can't screen share. You should be able to because you're a panelist. This host disabled participant screen sharing. Down at the very bottom, if you hover there in the center, it should say share screen, it's green. Yeah, when I click on that, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. I have to check with IT because it doesn't have any option on here for screen sharing. Let me see, hold on. All panelists. There you go. Can you do it now? Yep. Okay. Okay. Does everyone see the presentation? Is that a yes? Yes, ma'am. I see it. Perfect. Okay. Uh, for the record, Allison Christie with Neighborhood Development Services. And we're going to go over um, AMS 20057, which is a voluntary annex. Uh, so Marty Black, on behalf of Evan Duke of Five Diamonds of Venice LLC, is requesting approval of a petition for voluntary annexation of approximately 1.6 acres from unincorporated Sarasota County into the city of Northport. Sorry, it's very touchy. Scroll here. Where? Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, the site is located just off of US 41, west of the intersection of 41 and River Road, right near uh, the West Villages. Um, so the applicant is proposing to annex the 1.6 acres into the city from unincorporated Sarasota County, which currently has a zoning designation of open use estate and a land use designation of rural. The property is located within the city's future annexation area. So this application for voluntary annexation was reviewed through our management review process. This includes all city departments and um, all of the departments had no comments other than utilities. And their comment was that the current driveway to the Southwest wastewater treatment plant is not considered a public access road, but rather a driveway to the plant and therefore no ingress and egress access to the proposed parcel will be granted by the utility department. Um, talking through with this um, with utilities, it will be addressed in a future submittal and we don't feel that it's material to this annexation petition before you today. Um, in addition, this ordinance has been reviewed as to form and correctness by the city attorney. Staff reviewed the proposals for consistency with Florida state statutes, the city's comprehensive plan, and the city's unified land development code. State statutes do have specific requirements for voluntary annexation petitions. 
Um, this includes notification of to the County Board of Commissioners. So Sarasota County Board of Commissioners was notified 10 days in advance of advertisement of this petition. And the ad did run for two consecutive weeks on April 22nd and 29th. So staff feels that this requirement has been met. Um, this, as mentioned previously, the subject property is located in the city's future annexation area. And our comprehensive plan encourages voluntary annexations in this specific area and requires that it's given a future land use of activity center and zoning designation of PCD. So if this property is annexed, it will meet this requirement at a future date. Staff finds that the annexation is consistent with both the Unified Land Development Code and the city's comprehensive plan. In addition, staff did perform a fiscal impact analysis and found it operated at a deficit initially, but does overall operate at a surplus of $105,150 over years one through 30. And in addition, a more detailed fiscal impact analysis will take place with a future development master plan. So staff does recommend approval of ordinance 2020-17 petition annex 2057 based on findings of consistency with the standards and intent of our adopted comprehensive plan and all applicable Florida statutes. Uh, this was heard by the planning and zoning advisory board and they unanimously recommended approval of ordinance 2020-17. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, does anybody have any questions? I see uh, vice mayor, please. Vice mayor, you'll have to unmute yourself, please. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is for staff. Um, I'm wondering about the JPA. Uh, who's working on that and how long will it be before a JPA is approved with the county? Thank you. Um, for the record, Nicole Galehouse, Planning Division Manager. Uh, the planning staff is currently working on that. Um, we actually had a, a meeting about it last week. Um, the senior planners are reviewing it. I could give you a time frame at this point. Um, it'll really depend on how all of the reviews go between city staff and then the county staff. So we're going to try to work out all the details at a county level, and then we'll bring it through the, the hearing processes, but we're still in the early stages of it. Are you discussing all that corridor that used to be on a JPA, but was taken off and, or just this 1.6 acreage? No, the, the, this acreage is not, um, this acreage would be included in that, but um, it would cover the entire area so that we can, um, more easily annex land in that area through that corridor. Thank you. See no other questions. I do have a couple, um, and it has to do with the actual um, ordinance. In the actual ordinance, I did not see the property ID number referenced in the ordinance at all. And I'm just curious, shouldn't that be in there somewhere? No, the um, the property ID number could change if they split the property later on. Um, we use the legal sketch and description um, as the um, reference for the property location um, for the annexation. I'm sorry, you used the what? You broke up. The legal sketch and description. The yeah, legal so something. I might speak to that, Mayor. Um, the legal description of the property as well as a sketch. And that's actually a more reliable property identifier. The property identifier number that you see sometimes is essentially a file number that the property appraiser assigns to a piece of property, whereas the legal description actually re relates to surveys, meets and bounds, that type of thing. So it's more reliable. Okay. So it's the survey you guys use. Correct. Okay. Um, if you go to line 20 um, in the whereas clause, it says the Northport Planning and Zoning Advisory Board um, heard this on April 2nd to receive public comment, but there's nothing in there stating what their recommended approval uh, or the recommended action was. It's not in that whereas clause. 
we can update that. And we also need to update the date that was um, the original yeah. that this was supposed to go before COVID. So we'll, <laughs> that was get that, next <laughs> we'll get that corrected. <laughs> All right, so, th so those will be added between first and second reading? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have nothing else, thank you. Seeing no other comments, uh, city manager, uh, city clerk, do we have any public comment on this item? No, ma'am, you do not. Thank you. I'll go ahead and entertain a motion, please. Move to continue move. ordinance continue number 2020-17 for second reading on 2020. Well, I don't think that's ever happened before. That was in perfect unison between Vice Mayor and Commissioner Hanks. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and say Vice Mayor, uh, Commissioner Hanks made the motion to approve ordinance number 2020-17 as presented, making those two changes that staff agreed to, and that was seconded by Vice Mayor. How does that sound, guys? Did I capture that correctly, Vice uh, Commissioner Hanks? Yes, continue the ordinance. Thank you very much. So we will continue this. Uh, do we need to put a date in there, city attorney? Come oh, in. No? Okay. So we'll go ahead and do voice vote. Uh, Commis Commissioner Hanks? Yes. Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Amrich? Yes. Commissioner Carison? Yes. And myself, yes, and that um, that will be continued to a future meeting with those two changes made. Thank you very much. And we will move on to ordinance number 2020-16, and that's uh, amending the index map for the West Villages. Can I get a motion to read by title only, please? So I'll move. Second. Motion on the floor by Commissioner Armitage to read by title only, seconded by Commissioner Luke. We'll go ahead and, I'm um, sorry, let's, uh, City Manager, go ahead, please. Make sure you're unmuted. Do you want to combine these items so they can be done at once, so they can be done faster? I have no problem with that. We'll have to get a motion to combine. I think you're muted now, Mayor. I can um, City Attorney, will we have to get a motion to combine those three items? Mayor, I would recommend that you get a motion to combine those three items as well as the um, consent of the applicant for the three items to have all three combined. And as you all probably know, but just as a reminder, if they are combined, we will need separate motions for each item uh, at the time of uh, approval or continuance. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, if it's the will of the board to combine these three items and then do separate motions, I uh, at the end for each individual item, I'll need a, a motion to take a vote on that. So move. Second. Motion to combine items uh, 5B, 5C, and 5D with uh, separate motions at the end for each individual item. And that was made by... Go ahead, city Just manager. Make sure that you add John Lazinski is the applicant, in case you because as the I, I city will attorney make sure after, to ask after, him, I'm just after, give you the name. Yeah, after we get the board approval, then I'll make sure we get it on the record from Mr. Lazinski. And thank you for his name, city manager. Mayor, uh, if I, I would suggest that you do that before board approval. Um, and even though I said applicant, it really should be all the parties to the quasi judicial proceeding, including the city. All right, so Mr. Applicant, uh, Mr. Oh. Lazinski, is it okay for you to combine these three items? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Labar, is it okay? Yes. Uh, staff, is it okay? Yes, yes. yes. All right, uh, and I, I don't know if that's all of the applicants and all the people I have to ask. Now we will go ahead and, and take that voice vote for the commission approval to uh, to combine. Vice Mayor. Yes. Commissioner Car uh, Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Commissioner Carison. Yes. Commissioner Hanks. Yes. And I'm also yes. So we are going to go ahead and combine these items. Um, 
and I will need to have a motion to have the city clerk read all three items into the record by title only. So moved. Second. Motion on the floor to have city clerk read all three items into the record um, by vice mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. We'll go ahead and do voice vote. Uh, Commissioner Luke. Yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Commissioner Carrison. Yes. Commissioner Hanks. Yes. And I'm a yes also. City Clerk, are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> ordinance number 2020-16, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the Unified Land Development Code, Section 53-213A2, Village Index Map, providing for amendments to the West Village's index map for certain portions of Village F, Village G, and Village I including one or more of the following boundaries, acreages, locations of police, fire stations, and utility site, roadway alignments, village centers, park acreages, potential school sites, hotel site, and deleting a local road, providing for findings, providing for adoption, providing for filing of approved documents, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, and providing an effective date. Ordinance number 2020-14, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the Unified Land Development Code, Chapter 53, Article 18, B Village, Section 53-214-F6, Village F, Village District Pattern Plan, West Villages, amending the boundary of Village F to add approximately eight acres to the southeast area of the village and adjusting the neighborhood layout, providing for findings, providing for adoption, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing effective date. Ordinance number 2020-15, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the Unified Land Development Code, Chapter 53, Article 18, B Village, Section 53-214-F7, Village G, Village District Pattern Plan, West Villages, amending the boundaries of Village G to add approximately 41 acres to the southwest corner of the village and amending the neighborhood layout, providing for findings, providing for adoption, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing effective date. You want me to swear everybody in now as well? If you're ready to, go ahead, please. Yeah. <laughs> Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to help you back? Yeah. Thank you very much, City Clerk. All right, so at this time, we will go ahead and do ex parte communication, and I will start with Commissioner Hanks. Uh, the only ex parte that I have, uh, Mayor, is uh, through email of which I captured everything with the city clerk. Thank you. Commissioner Emmerich. I have none. Thank you. Commissioner Carson. Nothing. Uh, Vice Mayor. I have nothing on this. Thank you. And I do have uh, email question and answers that was also uh, submitted to the city clerk's office. And that was for Village F and for Village G both. Um, so that is my ex parte communication. And at this time, we will go ahead and have the applicant speak for 15 minutes. I'll have my little trusty timer set. And i um, not sure if that's Mr. Lazinski or if it's Miss Katie, but you have uh, 15 minutes for your presentation. Great. Thanks so much. Um, can you see the screen for the presentation? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. We can see you. Yes, ma'am. What about my, pre I'm trying to share my presentation. Are you able to see that by chance? Not at this time. I see you and, and the board. Okay. Share. There. You should now have the present. There you go. All righty. I restarted your timer. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Mayor McDowell. Again, good evening, commissioners. I am Katie Labar with Stantec, um, representing Stantec, uh, representing um, the West Villages Improvement District. I have with me Mr. John Lazinski. Um, he is representing the West Villages Improvement District as the chairman for the index map amendment. And he is representing Minnesota Beach Ranch Land. Excuse me, before I need to interrupt you. Miss, Miss Katie. 
Ms. Katie, could you please state that you've been sworn for the record? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, I have been sworn. Mr. Lazinski is representing Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, are we good to go? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. To give a little bit of background, the West Village's index map and pattern book were originally approved in 2005 by the city of Northport. The area shown on the index map comprises approximately 8,556 acres across 12 different villages. And the index map uh, was last amended, amended in July. Uh, the pattern book and index map uh, helped to establish the long range plan of development and the policy framework for the West Villages. While the pattern plans provide development standards uh, and establish land uses for each of the villages. Uh, the requests that are before you for consideration today include an amendment to the West Villages index map an amendment to the Village F Village District Pattern Plan, and an amendment to the Village G Village District Pattern Plan. So the first request is the index map. Uh, what you have on the screen before you is the revised index map, and I'll walk through each of the modifications proposed in the following slides. As we walk through these changes to the index map, the overarching theme is really that the West Villages is a vibrant community with significant and exciting development activity. The implementation of the long range vision necessitates some adjustments along the way. And the changes that we present today represent the refinements and adjustments to ensure consistency among all of the different approval documents. Uh, these changes include the following. Revisions to the village boundaries and acreages for villages F, G, J, K, and L. Um, these, these acreages have historically been really quite general um, with the approval of several of the villages and more precise survey data, the village boundaries uh, have been updated accordingly. Um, Minnesota Beach Road is also shown in the configuration that is proposed to be constructed. Uh, village center boundaries uh, have also been expanded in villages I, J, and K at the intersection of West Villages Parkway and Minnesota Beach Road. The village center was added to the southeast and southwest quadrants of River Road and Minnesota Beach Road. Again, because these refinements to development plan are um, anticipated, and we believe that these areas will serve the nearby villages for their daily and commercial, uh, commercial and civic needs. Um, acreage for Grand Lake Park, which is located in Village D, has also been revised. Uh, you may recall that the approval of the index map, the prior approval, showed several potential police and fire stations. Um, but we have revised and updated the index map to reflect the locations that were accepted by the fire and police chiefs and documented in the recently approved post-annexation agreement. We also show two potential school sites in Village K. Um, should the school district utilize these sites, the existing school site that's located in Village G would uh, then be utilized for another form of development uh, as, you know, as determined by the master developer. A new water treatment plant is uh, under construction in Village F, and that is now shown on the index map. And finally, in Village G, uh, there is a future hotel site that is situated near the Atlanta Brave Spring Training Facility. And we note that site on the index map for clarity purposes. Um, as, I, as I shared earlier, the acreages for villages F, G, I, J, and K, I, J, K, and L are revised with this index map. Uh, this slide shows a, a comparison between uh, the previous approved index map and this proposed index map. Uh, villages F and G are now larger, uh, again, because of the realignment of Minnesota Beach Road. And again, with new survey information for individual villages, um, as we updated this index map, we, we thought it appropriate to recalibrate the acreages of other villages based on that refined data. Um, we would expect that as development comes forward in the future, uh, 
the acreages will continue to be more refined. So with that, I'm going to end uh, the index map overview and transition to the Village F revised BDPP. On the left, you have the approved BDPP and on the right is the uh, proposed. And again, I'll walk through the changes in the following slides. The current Village F BDPP is, uh, is approximately 828 acres. It was approved by this board on July 23rd of 2019. And the current entitlements include 1,800 residential units, 150,000 square feet of commercial retail uses and 50,000 square feet of office uses. Um, the site, the, the, the village includes five residential neighborhoods, two mixed use residential neighborhoods and two mixed use areas. Um, with the proposed changes, uh, we, we intend to, we are adding eight acres to the southeast corner for a total acreage of 836. Uh, we've also adjusted the neighborhood layout. Um, we reduced and relocated the MU2 neighborhood. Um, we added RN5. Uh, there was an overall reduction of mixed use uh, from 82 acres to 62 acres. And we also uh, relocated the police and fire station out uh, from, from out of Village F into other villages as discussed earlier. Um, and finally, we, we've shown the addition of the water treatment plant location within Village F. We also, since, um, since the approval, the recent approval of the Village District Pattern Book, uh, we updated the text and the graphics of this VDPP to be consistent with that, um, with that approval document. But now moving on to Village G, uh, revised VDPP. Again, um, you have the approved VDPP on the left, the proposed VDPP on the right, and I will discuss the changes on the following slides. Village G was approved in July, on July 23rd, 2019, 743 acres. Uh, this, this village includes the Atlanta Braves Spring Training Facility and Academy and the entitlements uh, that were approved with that uh, BDPP include 1,800 residential units, 1, 150,000 square feet of commercial retail uses, 50,000 square feet of office uses and a hotel site. Um, and I failed to mention with Village F, but I think that it's important. Um, none of the entitlements are proposed to be changed with these modifications for either village. And so um, entitlements remain the same. It's, it's the boundary and the acreage that's really changing. And then some of the elements within um, to reflect development, uh, anticipated development in the future. Um, with this modification in Village G, uh, we are adding 41 acres to the southwest corner, again, largely because of the adjustment in boundary due to the alignment of Manasota Beach Road. Uh, we are adjusting the neighborhood layout to relocate the MU2 area to the southeast corner and redu reducing the overall MU2 area from 141 acres to 52 acres. Um, and as with Village F, we do propose to, uh, or we included changes in this document to uh, be consistent with the recently approved Village District Pattern book. So in closing, uh, the changes that we've presented for the index map and pattern plans uh, reflect the vibrancy of West Villages and the exciting and significant development activity that's occurred over the past several years. These changes represent refinements and adjustments that ensure consistency among approval documents for West Villages. We've worked very closely with staff throughout the review process. These applications are consistent with the comprehensive plan and the Land Development Code. And we request your favorable continuance of these documents to a second reading for adoption. We thank you for the opportunity to present and we're available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. And you have like four minutes to spare. So thank you. <laughs> all right. At this time, we will go ahead and have staff do their presentation. And you also have 15 minutes. And make sure when you state your name that you had been sworn. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, for the record, Allison Christie, Neighbor Development Services, I have been sworn. Thank you. Oh, wrong presentation. Go. Not oh, yet. Wrong one again. <laughs> Too many presentations <laughs> today. What is it? That's not the one. Sorry, one second. <laughs> we go. <laughs> all right. So all right. this is going to be one presentation for all three petitions combined. Um, that includes VIA 20038, VPA 20009, and VPA 20010. So these proposals um, include Ordinance 2016, VIA 20038, amending the West Villages Index Map. Mm -hmm is from Katie Labar on behalf of the Improvement District, as well as ordinances 2014 and 2015, amending the Village F and Village G pattern plans um, from Katie Labar on behalf of John Lazinski with Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands. So first, going over the index map amendment, um, this amendment proposed uh, the following changes to the index map, including the addition of three approved fire police station locations, updates to village boundaries and acreages for villages F, G, L, K, F, G, J, K, L, um, updates to some of the roadway alignments, adjustment and relocation of village centers, the revision to park acreages in both village D and village H, uh, the addition of the utility site location in village F, and the identification of potential school sites as well as the hotel site in village G. So staff reviewed the index map amendment for consistency with the city's comprehensive plan, as well as the Unified Land Development Code. Uh, specifically, we reviewed the petition against uh, comprehensive plan goal five and objective 13, um, which are referencing the village land use. The boundary changes to the villages and village centers do meet these minimum standards. Uh, staff does want to point out um, an inconsistency with the comprehensive plan policy 13.5.2. Uh, which is specific to uh, locating village centers on both sides of an arterial road. Um, staff does support the proposed locations of the village centers, however, as we feel that there will be more improved pedestrian and vehicular access, as well as being more centrally located for the residents. Um, so we do support this change. Um, a more detailed staff analysis was also included in the staff report. Um, but we do find that the index map amendment is consistent with the Unified Land Development Code as well as the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, moving on to the Village F pattern plan amendment. Um, this amendment proposed the following major changes, um, including the adjustment of the roadway alignments, specifically Minnesota Beach Road, the addition of approximately eight acres to the southwest corner of the village, as well as adjustment of the neighborhood layout which added an additional residential neighborhood. So uh, staff did review the amendment for consistency with those documents. Um, though the neighborhood layout is changing, um, all acreage minimums for the neighborhoods and the villages are being met. There is a reduction in the mixed use acreage from the proposed changes, um, but overall there is an increase in village centers with the uh, proposed index map amendment so overall, um, there's not a large decrease in mixed use um, acreage. In fact, there is an overall increase. So staff is okay with this change. Uh, this amendment also identified the water treatment plant location in the document, and it removes the former alternative fire police station locations, which are no longer in play. Staff does find the pattern plan amendment to be consistent with the Unified Land Development Code, as well as the city's comprehensive plan. Moving on to the Village G pattern plan amendment, 
It proposed again, the adjustment of roadway alignments, specifically with Minnesota Beach Road, as well as the addition of approximately 41 acres to the should say southeast corner of the village, as well as adjusting the neighborhood layout of the village. Staff did review the petition um, against these documents. And again, all acreage minimums are being met. Um, one of the major changes is the mixed use two area being relocated um, to the southeast corner. And as a result of this change, there is a reduction in the mixed use acreage. Um, but as I stated previously, due to the overall increase in mixed use acreage with the village centers and the index map amendment, staff does support this change. We also wanted to mention there is an increase in environmental impact as it's proposed that more wetlands would be affected as a result of this layout change. Um, however, the mitigation will still be required and this would be reviewed in greater detail in the future stages of development. And staff does find this pattern plan amendment to be consistent with the Unified Land Development Code as well as the city's comprehensive plan. All three ordinances were reviewed by the city attorney's office as to form and correctness. And all three ordinances were advertised on April 22nd in the newspaper of general circulation. Um, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board did hear all three petitions at their May 7th meeting and voted unanimously to recommend approval to city commission. And staff does recommend approval of all three ordinances as well. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Um, at this time, does the applicant have any rebuttal to the presentation made by staff? We do not. And just for the record, um, before I go any further, do city clerk, do we have any aggrieved parties on this? No. Thank you. Okay, so the applicant does not have any rebuttal? Not at this time, no ma'am. Thank you very much. And uh, staff, do you have any rebuttal? Staff has no rebuttal. Thank you very much. Um, city clerk, do we have any public comment um, at this time? No, ma'am. No public comment for any of the three items? No. Thank you very much. All right, so at this point, we'll go ahead and have questions and I'll start with Commissioner Carasone. Uh, Mayor, kind of a, a point of process. When we did our, um, yeah, I'm having a, a brain seizure right now. Uh, when we did our ex, uh, ex parte communication, it was in reference to all three, correct? Because I wasn't sure if the combination came before or after that. I was just curious. The combination of the item that we um, all voted on was before ex parte communication. Okay, I couldn't remember. I thought it was that we did our ex parte before the vote. Okay, just making sure, thanks. No problem. Did you have any questions for the applicant or staff on the, these items? No, I think they did an amazing job. Excellent. Does anybody else have any questions? All right, seeing none, I do have a few of them. Um, I will start with the index. Commissioner Carason, did you change your mind? Because I see your hand is still up. Thank you. All right, so I'll start with the index map. On the index map, there is um, two uh, utility notations in village E. And I am wondering, one of those is the wastewater plant. I'm wondering what the other utility is. <clears throat> Mayor McDowell, Katie Labar with Stantec representing the West Villages. The other utility uh, icon that you see that is just south east of the um, hospital site on US 41 at the intersection of West Villages Parkway and 41. That's a repump station, a three acre repump station that's identified on the index map. Okay, thank you. Answered that one. Um, 
um, and you might have to answer this. I'm curious, how does Welland Park factor into all of these legal documents rest, referencing West Villages or maybe it's city attorney? Because all of this says West Villages, West Villages, and it's all now like Welland Park. So I'm wondering how does that work? Well, in part, this is John Lazinski. Well, in part, we're going to evolve into as the marketing umbrella for West Villages. Uh, we're actually going to be called Well in Park LLP, formerly known as West Villages. So over time, we will start changing documents, but it does not change the intent uh, or affect the, any of the legal descriptions of the properties. Thank you very much. Um, on the end I'm sorry, city attorney. Can we have the witness state that he's been sworn, please? Oh, Mr. Luzinski, could you please yeah, state your sworn? sworn? Thank you. Um, item number 12 on the notes on the index map itself. It says the segment of Minnesota Beach Road located within Village C is to be constructed by others. West Village Improvement District is not required to construct the segment of road. Who are the others that is mentioned in this? Those are the old property owners to the west of us. Uh, at Sarasota National, obviously, it is the county because they took under a prior agreement with the developers of Sarasota National on that property. And same thing through the south end of Island Walk that they have that portion of the property. Our ownership stops roughly about 1,000 to 1,100 feet west of the future intersection of Minnesota Beach Road and Prado Road. And the plans we are processing right now for approval by city staff, I think we're in our second review, is for the Minnesota Beach Road improvements to go from River Road to a point about 800 feet west of Prado Boulevard. Okay, so it sounds like you're saying that the Sarasota National slash Sarasota County is going to be constructing the rest of that road? Sarasota County through the Sarasota National property, through the Island Walk property, that right away for the road was included in the Island Walk purchase. So it, either depending on what segment you're specifically looking at, it's one of those two we have no ownership of any of that right away once you leave our property. Fantastic. Um, I, I, if if the West Villages is being West Villages Improvement District is being mentioned as not being required to construct, I would sincerely hope that we can add the City of Northport is not required to construct in there also. And I know based on what you're saying. Mm -hmm. is true, but I think it needs to be noted in here that it's the West Villages and the city of Northport is not required to construct or however you legally want to put those words in. Ratification. I'm sorry? I said I'm sure Katie can make that modification to the note. Miss Katie? We will make that revision and it will be reflected in the second reading in the and that you see for second reading. Thank you. Um, in the ordinance on the on the um, index map, there's a couple of things I've got a question on. In the title, it says um, the index map for certain portions of village F, G, and I, including one or more of the following boundaries, acreages, locations, we're also changing the acreage to J, K, and L. And I'm wondering why is that not referenced in the title block? Uh, we can easily add that. Um, I think that was just potentially an oversight. Uh, things did change as we were going through this. With the so we can, we can add those two into the title. Thank you. In the first whereas clause, it talks about 8,000 acres of village uh, future land use, but in the presentations, I have been seeing 8,600 acres. Where did the 600 acres come from? Because <laughs> it's not spelled out in here. Well, 
I can tell you in the presentation we gave tonight, the um, total acreage was approximately 8,558 acres, give or take. And um, as I discussed at the outset, uh, the index map itself has historically been presented with villages that are very general acreages. And so um, those acreages uh, had a plus or minus five acre difference in um, land area. As these, as each village has come in for development, they have to come in with a sketch and description. And so we have more refined survey data. And this amendment in particular, we've reached a point where we have so many villages that have the, the sketches and descriptions that as we evaluated this plan, um, we knew that we needed to update the remaining villages that have yet to come in for pattern plans and more accurately reflect the acreage that we anticipate they will be in the future. And so the data is um, very general uh, and it becomes a lot more detailed when we have those surveys. And so that's the best answer that I can give to you on, on why that acreage why there is that disparity in acreage. And, and I appreciate that. I'm just going on then to the next, so I think it's the second or third one down where it says that another, um, they amended it, the 8,000 acres, they added um, more property to the acreage. And I'm looking for, when you and I are not here anymore and somebody goes, hey, where, where'd this other 600 or 550 acres come from? It's it's clearly denoted. And, and there should, in my opinion, there should be a whereas clause saying something like what you just mentioned so that it brings it up to that 8,600 or 8,550 or whatever that number is. Nicole Galehouse, planning manager, and I, I have been sworn. Um, we can certainly add a whereas clause like that. Essentially, as Katie said, you know, the acreage has fined over time. Um, so we, mm -hmm. you know, it, that's that's why it's different. So we can add a whereas clause that states that. Yeah, I think for prosperity, it would be very helpful, you know, because this is going to survive all of us. And I, I think having the actual pinpoint of what happened and when would be very accurate and helpful. Um, when I saw the planning and zoning advisory board, it's the first whereas clause on the second page, their recommendation was not captured. And their recommendation was for approval six to yeah, zero. I, I don't know that we've historically included the recommended action in the ordinance. In the ordinance, the first whereas clause on page two, it talks yes, about yeah, maybe, um, maybe city attorney can speak to this as well, but I don't believe that historically we've included the recommended action in that whereas clause. That is correct. There's nothing that prohibits us from doing so, but that is not typically uh, found in our ordinances. Just that we record the public hearing and the date for the, the record because we're required under our code to do that. But typically the um, the action is captured. I'm not sure how it's communicated between the boards. Is it only in the staff report? But it's not in the ordinance usually. Because I've seen it done both ways and in some of the resolutions it's captured and sometimes it's not. And well, I'll save that. There was something that came before you recently and the exact item, is not coming to mind, but it's one. It's an item that we hadn't seen very often. And in our code, in the ULDC, it specifically said, um, either the ULDC or by state statute, specifically said that the um, recommendation you know, must be captured. And so we, it was in that one particular one that was a little bit different, but otherwise we've not included it. And again, that doesn't preclude us from beginning to do that if we want to, to do that as a you know, matter of course going forward. Hang on one second, city manager, I see your hand. Uh, can I finish up this thought? If you go on to ordinance number 2020-14, it says uh, the one whereas clause that said that the planning and zoning board met. Then there is another whereas clause that says at the same meeting, the planning and zoning board uh, recommended the city approve the ordinance. So that's why I'm bringing it up because I saw it there, but I didn't see it in this. 
Well, then I stand corrected. <laughs> So I'm just looking for consistency. That's all I'm, I'm doing. And, and I personally, I think that the recommendation, we have an advisory board that makes the recommendation because it's a state's requirement. The recommendation should be in the ordinance, but that's my opinion and the board's decision. Um, so I, I don't know what, what are your thoughts now, city attorney? I think either way is fine. I'm also a huge fan of consistency. And I thought- <laughs> Thank you. All right, city manager, before you jump out of the screen, uh, go ahead, please. So one of the concerns that I have with uh, um, adding that in there, it would be a timing for administrative purposes, is sometimes these ordinances are in, entered into our system and the overlap, the distance between when PZAB meets and when an agenda has to get done and posted will make that difficult. We could always switch it, switch it out between first and second reading, but to have that at a first reading sometimes is going to be administratively impossible. And, and I, I hear what you're saying, but it should still be captured at least at the second reading. And, so. and that's something we could do easier than we could at first. If that's what the board wants, we can add it between first and second on a routine basis. Sounds good. Mayor, I have um, hand up. Um, Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Carasona. I have a few more questions, but go ahead if you no, want to weigh in. It's not specifically. I'm sorry. It okay. was only oh, go ahead. Uh, just that it, I don't remember us putting the vote in to ordinances in the past. Only that they met, and that you know that meets the legal requirement just to meet. And the only reason why I hesitate putting the actual votes in there is because there may be some times that we don't do what the planning and zoning board actually suggests. So, I mean, I think that sticking with the legal requirements that, that they met and heard it, I'm good with that. But to put the actual voting um, results, I, I would be hesitant on that. Just my kind of thought. Thank you. Um, well, you, you, you made a great segue into my next question on this uh, index map, because this is one of the things that I know you're a stickler on, Commissioner Carasone, and that's the school board property. If you look at Village K, it has the two S's, and it's in a very grayed or browned area, and it says that those two schools are 11 acres each. But it's a huge parcel that's grayed out. And when I look at the parcel where the other school is just south of the, the college, it says that it's 60 acres and it's a very little looking parcel. So my question has to do with, is it the grayed area that's only 22 acres? Or is that grade area much larger? And how large is it if the schools are gonna be on that entire grade area? It's, this is John Lozinski. It is a large area. The 11, I believe, isn't shooting you over to the footnote number 11. The combined K through 12 school complex that we are working with Sarasota County School District would have a K through eight complex of 130 acres. The existing facility is 60 acres. As part of that negotiation, we would be taking the 60 acres back since now that the stadium's there, it's probably not the highest and best use to have a K through eight complex right across the street from the complex. So there's a net 50 acre increase in schools acreage between G and K. So this 11 acres for each S is inaccurate and it's actually 158 total acres for the school? No, 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 no. It's never 11. The 11 is referencing the footnote on the index map. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because the, the acreage is referenced on the on the S right there before the college. It says sixty yeah, it's, acres. But not on those other two. The two in Village K 
our combined, and I don't remember the decimal point, but it's 130 acres. 130 acres now. Okay, and that would be a K through 12 complex. The intent is we would transfer ownership to them as a single lot. And then as they plan each school, they have some flexibility. We would take back as part of that transaction, the 60 acres. So there's a net increase from 60 to 130, which is 70 acres. And that's really the addition of a high school uh, within the property. And that's really their main focus right now is an initial opening of a high school. What was the original acreage for the school when this was first all planned? I, right now, the only acreage I know is the existing 60 acres. Is the 60 it acres? Awful, to me, it seems small for the density. I believe the intent was, you know, kind of see what went on. To us, we see it as a positive to put a quality school in the neighborhood because we have actually, our demographics are much more mixed than it was initially anticipated. I know there was a lot more intent on having more, I'll call them active adults, uh, but the Taylor Ann School is upwards of 1,100 children already. So there's a need for it. And quite, quite frankly, at quality schools that are walking distance within the community, and we intend to have them all connected with our trail system, only enhance the property values as well as the absorption. And that's all I spoke about that when we were in front of the commission back on March 25th, because we knew we had been talking with the uh, school district. And while there is not a contract, a formal contract in place, we have been working with them on a contract and it is anticipated to go in front of the school board in June for approval. And, and I agree that we have to have quality schools and I agree that a K through 12 for this whole area is going to be warranted, but now we're losing even more uh, tax base because schools do not pay taxes to the city, but the county. Why if you see in this index map adjustment and Katie can give you the number increases, we actually increased the number of village center acreage. And part of what we spoke about last time is we've had a working map of what we think could happen, which was a little more aggressive than the index map. We actually added acreage to those village centers in some locations, just because as we evolve, you know, things make more sense. Okay. Um, Andy, can you give her uh, the mayor kind of a summary where we added some of those commercial uh, village center type acreages where we did not have them before? Yeah, we the um, in my presentation I discussed the intersection of River Road and Minnesota Beach Road. Uh, on this index map, you see village center locations on, on the northwest and southwest corners, as well as the southeast corner. And so there was a significant addition of village center to that area. We also expanded uh, the village center area within uh, village F, and then also um, made some adjustments at Prado Boulevard and Minnesota Beach Road. And so, you know, and the important part about adding acreage <clears throat> to village center is uh, in that area, we have to meet the minimum and maximum development standards that are outlined in the Comprehensive Plan and Land Development Code. And so there's a land use mix, a specific land use mix that we're going to have to achieve. We're going to have to demonstrate that through a tracking mechanism where we present um, with each site and development plan that's submitted to staff for administrative review and approval, they will have to be evaluating to ensure that we're moving towards those minimums and maximums. And so, um, and that's again, a comprehensive plan requirement. And so land that is not within town center or a village center 
um, can be developed in accordance with a pattern plan, but doesn't necessarily have to meet those minimum and maximum development parameters. And so uh, by bringing, by taking that, while it's 60 acres and you know there's a net difference, Putting that 60 acres back into beneficial uh, taxable use uh, in the town center long term will ultimately in, improve that taxable value. And, you know, in my opinion, because the range of uses that could be applied to that are going to bring higher revenue long term rather than it being the, the school that it's currently slated to be. And so, just to expand on that, that 60 she's referencing is that existing school site. Given right, the proximity right. of the between the uh, Grave Stadium, the college, and our downtown that we're under development now, that's a perfect use for those type of village center, town center uses. So taking it from the middle of the ranch and putting it in a more high traffic area is a win. And it takes 60 acres and puts it into that, not the use where it would have been a school before. The only other request that I would make is is to denote how much acreage this parcel is, this school area is going to be like it was done up by the college. So just to add that also. Um, the final thing I have on the index map is uh, the whereas clause. It's uh, one, two, three, four, five whereas clause. It says July 11th, 2019, the commission adopted this uh, index map um, the last time. It actually was July 23rd, so um, just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I do have a couple of questions on Village F and G. Um, they are mostly dealing with the actual ordinance itself. Um, just some on Village F, the ordinance for Village F. In the one, two, three, four, fifth whereas clause, on line 28, you need to add that July 23rd index map um, approval. It, it's missing off of there. It's 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 telling you when you've approved index maps, uh, uh, amended index maps, that July 23rd is missing. Okay, we can add that. And then the next one is the VDPB in the next whereas clause. It says that it was amended October, I'm sorry, November 13th, 2007. We just recently amended it again, March of 20. Okay, thank you. So those need to be updated for consistency. If we're, we're referencing all of these amendments that needs to be done and the exact same thing in Village G, though those were not referenced in Village G. If you want to go over the line items, I'll be happy to do it, but they need to be updated there also. Yes, we, we can add those dates. All right. Um, one thing in the actual pattern book of Village F on line, um, page 33, all of the um, diagrams of Village F show the utility um, where the water plant is going, except for this diagram on page 33. That's missing. Yep, I see that it needs to be updated and we'll do that for second reading. Thank you. And I'm kind of concerned with Village G where you guys move the MU2 right on top of those wetlands. Um, that is a huge wetland area and I am concerned and would like to learn a little bit more about the protections that you're giving because that's a mixed use. High traffic, a lot of use, a lot of intensity, and it's right smack on top of a wetland. And I'm wondering why it got moved there. Well, the, the decision to locate mixed use to that, to that area is because that corner um, long term is envisioned to be a more um, intense mix of uses. Again, we've, we've presented the village center designation over a, a significant area of that. Um, the wetland impacts that have been noted, um, as I understand it, a jurisdictional determination has been conducted and the impacts that are anticipated are related to roadway crossings um, and the like. And so 
Again, as staff said, the um, staff will review any proposed impacts at time of development. Um, they will also, all state permits will have to be obtained in order to make those impacts. And so these are, these are impacts that we anticipate, but they aren't guaranteed at this point. All right. That's all the questions I have, uh, Commissioner Carrison. Yeah, can we go back to the village center acreage? Uh, I just want to kind of get this under my, I want to understand it more. We're asking for 120 acres to be designated as a school site, but at some point in time in the future, the 60 acre current school site will be no longer a school site. And that will go back into the rolls, thereby reducing the 120, correct? Am I correct? correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we designate this 120 school site, acre school site, we already have a 60 acre school site currently. That means it's 180 acres off the books until they make that horse trade. Is that correct? No, the 120 uh, acres remains on the books until they make that trade, at which point the 60 would go back and the 120 would come off. That's that one. Simultaneously, they would be swapping the properties. Right, okay. it would be a single closing. All right, I was worried that it was kind of like, we're gonna have 180 until you finally do the horse trade. Okay. No, it's all, Vanessa, it's all one. Okay. In one transaction. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, next thing. You talked about how you increased the village center acreages, um, and you talked about it being on Minnesota and uh, Prado and Minnesota and another intersection. My question is, are they within, you know, these increase in village center acreages, are they all within the city limits or are they outside the city limits and in unincorporated Sarasota County? Because one of the intersections you spoke of is actually unincorporated Sarasota County. No, I don't. They're all in. All, yeah, all in Northport. Correct. Okay. All right, just want to make sure that is completely clear. All right, I think, hold on, I gotta look at my notes. Blah, 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 blah. All right, that's, that's good for me. Thank you. All right, so city attorney, um, when we go to give the motion, I know staff and the applicant have agreed to make um, some changes to add um, based on the questions that were asked tonight. Do we need to capture each one of those changes in the motion to keep it clean? N not necessarily, Mayor. You could do that, um, but I think not necessarily because it is coming back for second reading. Um, if you want to, to capture all those so that it's helpful um, for staff, if you have those, I mean, uh, that's it's always a better motion. But they, they right. work quite extensively, I believe. All right, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions um, at this time. We will go ahead and do closing arguments and that starts with staff. Staff does not have any closing arguments, thank you. And um, applicant? Neither do we, thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and entertain a motion. And we need to do it each individually. So starting with the index map, which is ordinance number 2020-16. I move to continue ordinance number 2020-16 to second reading. Second. I have a motion on the floor to continue ordinance number six. I just moved it 2020-16 to second reading. That was made by um, Commissioner Hanks, seconded by Vanessa. By Commissioner Carasone. <laughs> um, anything to that, Commissioner Hanks? No, ma'am. Commissioner Carasone. No, ma'am. 
Anybody else have any comments? Um, to keep it clean, I'll go ahead and pass the gavel and make an amendment to include the changes that we had talked about to the index map. Um, to include a note, I'll make an amendment um, for note 12, staff has already, and applicant have already agreed that they will add a verbiage that the city of Northport is not responsible for constructing the roadway on note number 12, that the 130 acres will be added for the school site on the index map, and the changes to the ordinance to reflect um, the title, including J, K, and L, and the adding the whereas clause to capture where those other five or 600 acres came from and changing the whereas clause to reflect July 23rd for the last time we updated the index map. I'll second the amendment. Thank you. All right, there is an amendment and a second on the floor uh, requesting that the changes to the index map that uh, applicant has agreed to would be part of uh, the index map in motion. I don't know if you see my hand up. I do have a question of clarification before we move on. Go ahead, please. Uh, the making sure that the 130 acres is on the index map. Um, mm -hmm. Is that, I mean, should it be referred to future? I'm afraid that if it's on the index map, then you're kind of taking away the whole, it's only good when the horse trade occurs. I'm just not sure about the legality on that side. Can you uh, read the note 11? Because the note on the index map specifically addresses that, uh, Commissioner Carousel. Yeah, yeah, the note says it will be removed um, upon approval of an agreement with the school board. What we could do is we could add the acreage, the school site acreage to that note so that you would see the reference to note 11. You'd go to the footnote and then you would you would see the, the acreage of the school site. So that would give the mayor a level, a better level of comfort. Well, if you're gonna do that, just my put put into that note, not only the acres, but the transactional ha happened uh, concurrently. Okay. Commissioner Carazone, how do you feel about that? As long as it's notated that it's not fixed at this point and that, you know, it's it's concurrent at time of approval and, and trade, so be it. But I don't want to blanket it to say this is the school sites in this, you know, I get what Commissioner McDowell is saying, but I think it needs to be very clear. All right. I am viewing this as though the applicant is agreeing the same way that the agreements of the other changes were made. So mayor, you are the one who made the amendment. Are you in agreement with this one being added to that list? Adding it to the note, that'd be fine with me as long as the school acreage is noted somewhere showing that it's 130 acres. That way then we have a historical reference to how much that acreage is. So yes, I'm fine with it in the note. As the seconder, I am fine with it also. So let's go ahead and take a vote. Well, I, Commissioner Carazone, I see your hand up. Do you have something else? No, I just don't know how to raise my hand down. That's all. <laughs> oh wait All right. some well, days uh, on some days it doesn't uh, we'll go ahead and take a vote on the amendment uh, Commissioner Carazone we'll start with you yes Commissioner Emmerich yes Commissioner Hanks yeah Mayor yes thank you very much and I am a yes that is 5-0 for the amendment uh, we will now go on to uh, the, the motion as amended. Commissioner Carazone? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. 
Mayor. Yes. And I am a yes, that is 5-0 also with the motion passing as amended and the gavel is back with the mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor, appreciate that. All right, so now we will move on to ordinance number and get a motion for ordinance number 20-14 uh, to continue to second reading for village F. I just need a motion. Move to continue uh, ordinance number 2020-14, second reading. Second. I have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Hanks to move to continue this uh, ordinance number 2020-14 to second reading, and that was seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Um, anything to that, Commissioner Hanks? No, I'm good. Anything to that, Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Seeing no other hands up, I would like to make an amendment, so I will pass the gavel back to uh, Vice Mayor to make an amendment. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to make an amendment to correct the whereas clause at line 28 and line 32 to reflect the July 23rd um, amendment to the index map at line 28 and the VDPB that was amended in March of 2020. I'll second the motion. Is there any comment by anyone? We'll go ahead and take a, a vote on the amendment, correcting the dates within this ordinance. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Carazone to the amendment. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Commissioner Hanks. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Uh, I am a yes also, the amendment passes. We now will vote on the motion as amended. Commissioner Carazone? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. Mayor? Yes. I'm a yes also. That is 5-0 passing the motion as amended. And the gavel goes back to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. All right, moving on to ordinance number 2020-15. I need a motion. Move, uh, a motion to move ordinance number 2020-15 to second reading. Second. Motion on the floor by Commissioner Hanks to continue uh, ordinance number 2020-15 to second reading. And that was seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, Commissioner Hanks? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. All right, I see no other lights on. So at this time, I would like to make an amendment. So I'm going to pass the gavel to Vice Mayor. Go ahead, Mayor, with your Thank amendment. Go you. ahead. I'd like, to make, I'd like to make an amendment to uh, the ordinance at line 28 to include the new, the other amended index map of July 23rd to the whereas clause on line 28 and then line 23 the other amended VDPB uh, in March of 2020. I'll second that. Is there any discussion on the I'm sorry mayor you're frozen in time. Mayor did you have oh. something to say? Okay. <laughs> Is there any discussion no, on I the amendment? Not. All right, we'll take a vote on the amendment. Commissioner Carazone? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yeah. Mayor? Yes. I am a yes also. That's 5-0 passing the amendment. We'll now take the vote on the motion as amended. Commissioner Carazone? Yep. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. Mayor? Yes. And I'm a yes also. The motion passes as amended and the gavel is back with the mayor. Thank you very much. And I believe that concludes everything for the West Village's uh, VDPPs and index map. Is there anything else? All right.
right, at this time, I think we need to take a 20 minute break because we have a very long item ahead of us. And I think we just need to um, just take a 20 minutes. So we will reconvene exactly at eight o'clock. Thank you.
Hi, Pete. The attorney. Hello. Hello. Vice Mayor, Commissioner Carason, Commissioner Hanks. Commissioner yep. I was just saying hi, welcome back everybody. <laughs> All right, we just need city clerk and then we can get started. I'm here. Hello, city clerk. All righty, it looks like we have a quorum, so it is now eight o'clock. Let's just take roll just for the record to make sure everybody's here to keep everything nice and clean. Vice Mayor. Present. Commissioner Emrich. Here. Commissioner Carason. Here. Commissioner Hanks. Here. And we still have our city attorney, our city clerk, and our city manager. And I would assume we also have our police chief present. So um, at this time, we are reconvened. It is exactly 8 o'clock. And we are going to move on to resolution. 2020 R11, unless there's a motion or a consensus to go ahead and combine these. Um, just go ahead, city manager. Yes, I was going to ask if, if you could combine the three items and also um, that would allow 30 minutes for presentations instead of the required 20 each. 30 minutes. I'll go ahead and make that motion that we combine uh, the resolution. Before you do, yeah. Vice Mayor, let's see if this is okay for the applicant, staff, and our aggrieved parties. Okay. Uh, uh, applicant, will it be okay to combine these three items and give you 30 minutes for presentation time? Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and members of the commission. Uh, Jeffrey Boone of the Boone Law Firm in Venice. I have signed a speaker's card uh, representing the uh, applicant. With me is Mr. Jackson Boone. Um, here to my left and your right. Uh, we have no objection to the, um, the three applications uh, being, being combined. Uh, we note that the uh, staff report uh, is, is a combined staff report. Um, it's, it's sort of been combined, if you will, all along. We would, however, uh, request more than 30 minutes. Obviously, if we had all three applications separately, 20 minutes per your code, it would be 20 minutes times three, which is 60 minutes. We're not necessarily asking for 60 minutes, but these are rather detailed applications. They're modifications on the DNP. And I believe at the Planning and Zoning Board, um, our presentation did run longer than 30 minutes. Uh, we believe it, it due process uh, requirements for our client, uh, we would ask that we have an adequate amount of time uh, to make our presentation for the three applications. We do not believe 30 minutes uh, we can try and do it in 30 minutes, but we're not we're not sure we can actually fit it into the 30 minutes. So that would be will our 40 request. minutes. Will um, 40 minutes suffice? Well, well, um, uh, I would no, ma'am. I I think we would I think we would like to have at least 45 minutes. Part of the reason, um, and we had for uh, just for y'all's information, we had two or three quasi judicial matters before the Venice City Council this morning that we're on Zoom. And sometimes with the share, the screen share aspect um, of using Zoom, um, it, it can slow things down. So that's part of that's part of the reason why. So we would like to have at least 45 minutes uh, if, if that would be acceptable to you all. That's fine. Uh, that's fine. So um, 45 minutes. Um, and staff, I don't staff see where, too. I'm sorry. Staff is good with that too. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, I need either city attorney or city clerk to please tell me who the aggrieved parties are so that I can check with each of them. It is Ms. Tracy and Maria Leslie. Stacy Tracy and Maria sorry, Leslie. Maria. Okay. Um, and I don't know if Miss uh, Miss Tracy and Miss Leslie would like to put their video on. That's entirely up to them. Um, I just needed to know exactly who they are. Um, so, <coughs> Miss Tracy, is forty-five minutes presentation <coughs> to you with combining all three items into one? 
Um, yes, that is fine. We are actually trying to figure out why we don't have video. If you go into the, I think it's your upper right hand corner, you'll see three little dots. She had to be promoted to a panelist. So she okay. should be now. There we go. I think I'm, yeah. I think I'm up now. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, that is fine. Fantastic. And then um, Miss Miss Leslie, um, will it be acceptable to you to combine all three items into one for discussion only and 45 minutes maximum for your presentation? Yes. Fantastic. So Vice Mayor, when you make the motion, please make sure that you include that we are going to vote on each individual item separately at the very end. Madam Mayor. I'm sorry, City Attorney, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor, I just think it's worth clarifying because we have so many parties here, including a grief party, <laughs> that there are two other elements in the quasi-judicial process that have time limits, and that is the rebuttal where each party and the aggrieved parties are allotted five minutes and the closing argument, um, which is also five minutes per party. So based on the discussion that you've had with all the parties, the concept would be to do 45 minutes for the presentation, and then five minutes for the rebuttal and closing argument for each person, um, just to make sure that there are no other issues or objections with the other time limits in the uh, process. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll start with Mr. Boone um, for the five minutes for the rebuttal and the closing argument. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, again, Jeff Boone uh, representing the applicant. Um, it would be uh, our request um, not to triple the time, which would be 15 minutes, but we would we would request uh, at least 10 minutes for rebuttal. Uh, we may not need it, but we would rather have it in case we need it. Uh, likewise, with the uh, closing argument, we would like to have 10 minutes. Again, we may not need it, but uh, we would like to we would like to have it available to us if indeed we would need it. Thank you. So staff, is it okay for you, is it acceptable for you for 10 minutes for rebuttal and 10 minutes for closing argument? Yes, it is. Thank you. Ms. Stacy, is 10 minutes acceptable for closing arguments and for rebuttal? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. And Ms. Leslie, is 10 minutes um, acceptable to you for rebuttal and closing arguments? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Vice Mayor, could you make sure you include that also with the uh, motion? Uh, I move that we combine for discussion item 5E, F, and G, adjusting the time for a 45-minute presentation, a 10-minute rebuttal, and closing, but hearing the uh, items separately for the vote. Just a hi. Uh, I'm sorry. Second. For clarification, though, uh, it's 10 minutes each, 10 minutes for rebuttal and 10 minutes for closing, just for clarification, correct? Thank you. You are you are correct. Thank you. It is 10 minutes each for rebuttal and 10 minutes for closing argument. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I second still. Huh. Okay. So I have a motion on the floor to combine these three items for discussion and allow 45 minutes for presentation for each um, app for each person, and then 10 minutes for a rebuttal and 10 minutes for closing arguments. That was made by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Harrison. Anything to that? Madam Mayor, before you take a vote, just to keep the, the um, oral record clean, I want to um, make sure that it's noted that these are the items um, that are regarding resolution number 2020-R11, regarding position number SPX-9. <laughs> 269 resolution number 2020-R12 regarding petition number SPX 19270 and uh, development master plan with a application number of CC DMP 19280. Thank you for that clarification as the motion maker. Is that acceptable to you? Of course. As a seconder, Commissioner Carison. Is the, that change to the motion acceptable to you? Sorry, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, 
Vice Mayor, you were the motion maker. Do you need, do you want to add anything to it? Any comment? No, ma'am. Commissioner Carison? Nope. All right, seeing no other comments by the board, we will go ahead and do a voice vote. Uh, Vice Mayor Luke? Yes. Commissioner Carison? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. And myself, yes. <laughs> All righty. So we've got those uh, things out of the way. Um, since we have resolutions, I need to have the city clerk read the two resolutions by title only into the record, please. Resolution number 2020-R-11, a resolution of the city of North Fort Florida granting a special exception for petition number SPX 19-269 to allow for the use of a convenience store with fuel pumps located generally at the intersection of West Price Boulevard and North Cranberry Boulevard in the neighborhood commercial highly intensity intensity NCHI zoning district pursuant to the city of Northport unified land development code section 53-179 and 53-259 providing for findings for granting the special exception with conditions providing for severability providing for conflicts providing an effective date resolution number 2020-R-12 a resolution of the city of Northport, Florida, granting a special exception for petition number SPX-19-270 to allow for the use of a convenience store with car wash located generally at the intersection of West Price Boulevard and North Cranberry Boulevard in the neighborhood commercial high intensity NCHI zoning district pursuant to the city of Northport unified land development code sections 53-179 and 53 Dash 259, providing for findings, granting the special exception with conditions, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, and providing an effective date. Thank you very much, City Clerk. And at this time, could you please swear in all parties uh, wishing to give testimony, including our aggrieved parties? And everyone wishing to provide testimony, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? So help you God. All right, um, let's see here. We need to do ex parte communication. So I will start with Commissioner Emmerich. Yes, um, on January 8th, I met with Miss Stacy Tracy in order to listening uh, to her concerns regarding the proposed development on Price and Cranberry. And I've also received multiple emails from citizens uh, around that area. That's all I have. Uh, Commissioner Hanks. Uh, yes, ma'am. I believe it was on the same day. Um, I also had uh, communications with Miss Stacy Tracy, and uh, I also have emails um, that uh, that are captured by the city clerk. Thank you, Commissioner Hanks. Uh, Commissioner Carson. Only emails captured by city clerk. Thank you, Commissioner Carson, Vice Mayor. Uh, I've actually had two visits, one from Stacy Tracy and the other one from Janet, who lives next to Dollar General. I am not recalling her last name right now. Uh, met with Janet. Uh, late or early winter, late fall, and then met with uh, Stacy Tracy uh, in January. Uh, I've had a couple of phone calls and a lot of emails, and I have forwarded the emails to the clerk for record capturing. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right, mine is kind of long, and you'll find out why with my first disclosure. Um, because you have to disclose site visits. I've lived within a quarter mile of this uh, development for the past 15 years. On February, I'm sorry, on July 22nd, 2019, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the applicant about this development. On July 23rd or thereabouts of 2019, I met with some neighbors uh, out and about and advised them of this pending project. Um, I don't recall the date, but I did receive the required letter 
informing me about the neighborhood meeting. I attended that neighborhood meeting on December 18th, 2019. In January, February, and March, there were various conversations that I've held with my neighbors regarding the status of the project, code language and processes. I can't begin to tell you the dates and who those were with because it was out walking the dog and I would get stopped. On February 6th, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Ms. Janet Wilbert and Stacy Tracy. On April 25th, I received the letter about the PZAB meeting. On February, I'm sorry, March 7th, 2020, I did watch the PZAB meeting. On March 7th, I met with the neighbors um, and explained the next steps in the process, the code language, public comment process, and gave assurances that the commission has the final authority, not PZAB. On February 13th, there was a phone call with a citizen. I do not recall her name or the content of it, except I just wrote it down as disclosure. I received various emails from citizens. All They were forwarded to the city clerk. I however cannot um, guarantee that all of the emails that I forwarded to the city clerk have been captured and included in the 100 pages or more because I did not have time to review it. Um, that were part of that backup material. Um, I did send some emails to various citizens advising them of when the PZAB meeting was being held and also the commission meeting. Mm -hmm. And those emails were forwarded to the clerk's office. Ex parte communication is finished. <laughs> so we will move on now to presentations and we will start with the applicant. Mayor, Mayor, really quick, I need to disclose one more thing I forgot. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Commissioner Hanks. Uh, yeah, on um, July 22nd, I did have a meeting with Boone Law Firm uh, concerning the development at Price and Creek Family. Thank you very much. Before we move on, is there anything else, guys, for ex parte? Yes, yes. I did listen to the PZAB meeting the day after the meeting uh, on the recording, but I had uh, a meeting with the developer way back. Uh, when he was first thinking of doing the project. So I want to dis disclose that also. Thank you. Um, anything else, guys? All right. Seeing no other comments for ex parte communications and jogging memory moments. Um, so the way this is going to work is the applicant gets 45 minutes, staff will get 45 minutes for their presentation, and then we will move on to the aggrieved party, starting with Stacy Tracy and then going on to Miss Leslie. So applicant, you now have 45 minutes and I have my little timer all set to go. Go ahead, please. All right, good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Jackson Boone, uh, agent for the applicant and I have been sworn uh, I'm here with Jeff Boone from the Boone Law Firm. Uh, we represent the applicant Weed in Northport LLC. And also with us tonight are Mr. Matthew Gillespie from Kimley Horn and Mr. Jacob Mossholder from Creighton Development. A uh, brief description of our applications. Uh, we have before you a DMP plan with four requested waivers, a special exception request for a car wash, and a special exception request for fuel pumps. These three applications went before the Planning and Zoning Board on May 7th, where the DMP and four requested waivers received a recommendation of approval. The special exception for a car wash received a recommendation of approval. And the special exception for fuel pumps received a recommendation of approval for 14 pumps. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so please bear with me. As uh, Jeff Boone stated, sometimes things can get a little delayed. So I'm going to share my screen and pull up an aerial of the property. And let me know if you all can see it, please. Can you all see this? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So this yes, uh, locating the property for you all. This the subject property of our applications is located at the northwest corner of the Price and Cranberry intersection. It's a 4.15 acre piece of property. So neighborhood commercial high intensity as a future land use designation of commercial. It is one of the many vacant neighborhood commercial high intensity properties in the city 
of which the city has recognized the importance of developing to provide additional commercial services and tax-based diversification to the city in its comprehensive plan. The four corners of this intersection each have a 4.15 acre lot with the neighborhood commercial high intensity zoning district, making it one of the most unique collections of neighborhood commercial high intensity zone properties in the city. In fact, going back to May of 1960, when this part of the city was platted with the ninth addition to the Port Charlotte subdivision, these 4.15 acre lots at this intersection have remained in the same shape and size and have been intended for commercial use. And that's mm -hmm. May 1960. These neighborhood commercial lots are the only properties with this zoning district between on price between Sumter and Toledo Blade and are the only properties with the zoning district on Cranberry between I-75 and US-41. All right, I'm going to pull up the zoning map to give you a better orientation of that very quickly. So bear with me for one second. And it's up. All right. So as I described, just to orient you all, this square, this purple square, which is the color for neighborhood commercial high intensity, this, we are the northwestern quadrant. So we are this, this, <coughs> of this square here. And as you can see, it is the most centrally located collection of neighborhood commercial high intensity properties in the city. I'm now going to pull up our site plan so I can explain that to you all. So bear with me, please. All right. So here's our site plan, which is our DMP plan on the application for you all. The eastern boundary of this property fronts Cranberry Boulevard, and the southern boundary of the property fronts the arterial roadway of Price. As you are aware, for the largest city in Sarasota County, Price is the major east-west roadway other than I-75 mm -hmm. and US-41, and it is slated to be widened to five lanes in the near future. What makes our development proposal unique and what we believe is a strong aspect of our plan is this 2.24 acre park or conservation area we are proposing. This area is larger than the 1.91 site that our development proposal sits on and surrounds our property in an L shape, which provides a large buffer far in excess of what's required by the neighborhood commercial high intensity zoning district to the residential lots to the west and to the north. This buffer is 130 feet to the east and to the north from the boundary of our site where we are proposing our development. Should the city want a park in this location, we have been in communication with the city park staff and would enter into a formal agreement for the park? Or should the city desire for the area to maintain in its current vegetative state? We are proposing to leave as much proper, as much of the property undisturbed as possible, <clears throat> clearing only as much as necessary for the stormwater pond and leaving at least 50 feet of the existing vegetation closest to the residential properties in its current state. This park conservation area provides a substantial buffer far greater than what the neighborhood commercial high intensity code contemplates. And it allows our development proposal to be in a harmonious form and relationship with the neighborhood. It pulls the most intensive aspect of our development proposal away from the residents and towards the intersection of Cranberry and Price 
and it provides a transition in addition to buffers on site beyond the required setbacks, setbacks on site beyond the requirements with this 130 foot buffer area. As you can see on our proposed DMP plan, we have a 3,454 square foot convenience store building located in the center of the site with a 979 square foot car wash building flanking its western side and a fuel, and a fuel canopy with seven fuel pumps and 14 pumps in total located on the southern side of the property fronting the Price Arterial Roadway. Our site design provides setbacks far in excess of those required by code, most notably the 55 foot rear yard setback and the 40 foot side yard setback offered on the northern and western sides of the property closest to the nearest residential lots. The height of the fuel canopy, car wash building and convenience store vary from approximately 16 and a half to 18 and a half feet and provide a uniform appearance from the street. The fuel tank system is located at the southern portion of the property fronting the Price Arterial Roadway and is the modern UST tank system. The system is double walled and monitored by an electronic system and is compliant with all state and federal regulations. The lighting provided for the property is the modern lighting systems with fixtures that shield and direct light downwards to limit spillover onto adjacent properties. Our lighting plan is compliant with the applicable city codes and provides 0.2 or fewer foot candles at the boundary of our 1.91 development site, which leaves 130 feet that is provided by the park conservation area as a buffer in between the lighting, the limits of the lighting for our site and the nearby residences to the mm -hmm. west and the north. A professional traffic study was conducted with our proposal and did not identify any transportation issues that would be generated by our request. In fact, our traffic study found that 77% of the trips to the site are passed by trips, which means 77% of the trips, which are vehicles coming to the site, are already vehicles on the road. Staff has reviewed our traffic study and concluded that no adverse impacts to the roadway network are proposed. A fiscal impact analysis has also been conducted by staff for our proposal and has found that our project will have a $188,000 surplus to the city in the first five years after development, as well as an over $2 million surplus to the city in 30 years. An environmental assessment was also performed for our property and found no listed species on site, as well as no wetland area. Our DMP plan has been reviewed by staff and meets or exceeds the applicable regulations in the ULDC. With our DMP are four proposed code waivers. The first proposed waiver is for a low key monument sign to display the gas prices. Should the fuel pump special, except, special exception request be approved, state law, Florida statute 526.111 requires that this requested monument sign for gas prices be approved. Staff has recommended its approval. The second request for our waiver is for the park conservation area to serve as a buffer in lieu of the neighborhood commercial high intensity buffer requirements. Our park conservation area proposes to provide 130 feet of buffer between our property and the nearby residential lots. And this substantial 130 foot buffer is far in excess of the 20 foot buffer and wall or berm required by code and staff has also recommended its approval. The third requested waiver is to install bollards instead of wheel stops at the parking spaces in order to better prevent vehicle crashes into the store. The bollards provide better protection than the wheel stops that are required by the code and it has been recommended for approval by staff. The last requested waiver is to increase the hours of operation from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. to 24 hours a day. The 24 hours of operation, 24 seven hours of operation are vital to the functioning and performance of the store 
and allows the property to serve the demand generated by patrons. Staff has raised concerns about the potential disruption that a 24-hour operation would have on the nearby residential lots and has recommended that this waiver not be approved. We believe that the unique nature of our proposal in recognition of the substantial 130-foot buffer offered by the park conservation area allows our proposal to operate at all hours of the day without generating adverse impacts to the nearby residential properties. Our site is designed in compliance with the neighborhood commercial high intensity standards, which are designed to ensure harmony between neighboring residential and commercial uses. Again, our lighting plan shows that there are 0.2 foot candles or less at the boundary of our 1.91 acre development property. We have building setbacks far in excess of the requirements of the requirements and the additional 130 foot buffer offered by the park conservation area. Taking all of these factors into account, we are confident that our 24 hour a day operation will exist in harmony with the neighborhood neighborhood and provide a fully functioning store to meet the demands of the community. As shown on our DMP plan, we have special exception requests for the car wash and fuel pumps. And I'll pull the DMP plan back up so I can locate those for you all. The fuel pump canopy is located here at the south of the property. And the car wash building is located here on the western side of the property. These items have been oriented on the property to limit impact on the surrounding properties and are designed to meet all the applicable city codes. Staff has found that these special exception requests are in compliance with the required section 53259 criteria and recommends approval of both the car wash and fuel pumps. However, for the fuel pumps, they have recommended fewer than 16 proposed pumps. Staff has based their reasoning for the fewer than 16 fuel pumps on the perceived intensity and disruption that this total number of fuel pumps would have on the nearby residential properties. We disagree, and we have a number of reasons why 16 pumps in comparison to fewer at this location does not provide a negative impact to the neighbors and actually better serves this location. Similar to the requested modification for 24 hour operation, the proposal before you today is unique and one not likely contemplated by the neighborhood commercial high intensity zoning code. The fuel pumps are located on the southern part of the property, fronting the arterial price roadway, which shields them from the residential lots to the north via the use of the commercial build, convenience store commercial building in the center of the property. This location allows this store to serve as an additional buffer to the residential properties to the north. And when combined with the substantial 130 foot buffer provides more than six times the required distance established by the neighborhood commercial high intensity code. Again, our property is located on the Price Arterial Roadway, the city's major east-west roadway other than I-75 and US-41. This roadway is set to be expanded with the upcoming Wideway project. And as you all are well aware, this roadway handles a large volume of traffic. Taking into account our traffic study, which found that 77% of the trips to the site are passed by trips, meaning those vehicles are already on the road. The number of fuel pumps allows the site to be more efficient in capturing the pass by traffic, make, allowing the site to serve as a collector of traffic. If people cannot get gas at the site due to the lack of available pumps, they will have to continue traveling on the city's roadway system for a longer distance and a longer amount of time, contributing to more traffic on the road. The neighborhood commercial high intensity zoning of the property and its location is also a unique factor that supports why we believe 16 pumps is the correct amount at this location. The Price Cranberry neighborhood commercial high intensity properties are what one could consider the most appropriately located neighborhood commercial high intensity properties in the city. 
In a sea of residential, these lots provide 4.15 acres of commercial zone land at each corner of this intersection and provide the proximate potential to serve the commercial needs of the surrounding neighborhood. Northport is already the largest city in Sarasota County and, we're sh and will surely continue to grow. This property is centrally located in the city and provides the potential to serve many people today and the many more people that will come in the future. In fact, if you were to locate a gas station on neighborhood commercial high intensity zone land in the city, I would say this intersection is the most appropriate and best location of all of the neighborhood commercial high intensity zone properties. There is a demand for fuel pumps today and there will be an even greater demand in the future, especially after prices widen to five lanes. Last, the 16 pumps on site allows the property to function efficiently and properly. It prevents queuing issues of cars waiting to line, waiting to get in line to get gas, which stands for better flow and placement of vehicles on site. And it allows those who are visiting the store for food and drink to utilize the parking spaces provided around the building while those who are visiting for gas can pull into an available fuel pump under the canopy. With the increased number of fuel pumps, the site can operate smoothly, safely, and better serve the, need of the needs of the community. Again, the Planning and Zoning Board, after hearing our presentation in response to questions, recommended approval of 14 pumps. Thank you for your attention to our proposals this evening. Again, our DMP plan, has four requested waivers, and we have two special exceptions requests, one for a car wash and one for the fuel pumps. All of our applications are compliant with the Unified Land Development Code and consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. And we respectfully request your approval. And Madam Mayor, I'd just like to point out that that was 18 minutes and 42 seconds. So we were well under the 45 minutes. So I, I hope everybody's pleased. <clears throat> I was going to say, you didn't even hit, uh, you've got 25 minutes to go, so good job. Thank you very much. All right, just because you got done in time, we have to give 45 minutes to everybody else. So um, at this time, I will go ahead and, and turn it over to staff. And staff, you also have 45 minutes starting now. Thank you. Um, Jackson, can you stop sharing? Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna um, turn it over to um, Jennifer Cohen. She's a special counsel for the city and she's gonna introduce the project. Good evening, mayor and commissioners. My name is Jennifer Cowan and I represent the city staff in this matter. Excuse me, hold on, hold on. Okay. Ma'am, I'm sorry, have you been sworn? I have been sworn. Thank you very much. Today, I'm going to provide you with a brief introduction of the project and then a quick overview of the task before you this evening. Um, the 7-Eleven Full Service Convenience Store. Next slide, please. As you, have, as you have just heard from the applicant, Jeffrey Boone, on behalf of Wheaton Northport LLC, um, is requesting the approval of the development master plan, the DMP, and special exceptions. Next slide, please. The DMP with its waivers and special exceptions are for a 7-Eleven full service convenience store with fuel pumps and a car wash at the 4.15 acre site located at the intersection of Price and Cranberry Boulevard. Next slide, please. Today, you will need to decide three main issues. One, whether to approve the DMP with staff's recommended conditions and certain requested waivers. Um, those waivers that you just heard about from the applicant include a waiver to permitted signs, hours of operation, buffer zone requirements, and wheel stops. Two, whether to allow a special exception to allow the use of a convenience store with fuel pumps. And three, whether to allow a special exception of a convenience store with a car wash. Shortly, Nicole and Allison will walk through each of these items in much more detail. 
At this time, I just want you to keep in mind that there are separate criteria that must be considered for the DMP with its waivers versus the special exceptions. First, for the DMP and its waivers, section 53-7 of your city's code provides that the city commission, after receiving the planning and zoning advisory board recommendation, shall vote on whether to approve, approve with conditions, or deny the proposed development. The ULDC also provides that in connection with the DMP, the city commission may modify or waive certain provisions of the ULDC, including those found in chapter 25 and 53. However, DMP and waivers may only be granted where there is a finding that um, such action is consistent with the comprehensive plan and consistent with the criteria made specifically applicable by the regulations or conditions of approval and that it would not adversely affect the public interest. You've heard from the applicant. In a moment, staff will provide you testimony and evidence related to the DMP and whether each of the four requested waivers meets the criteria that I just identified. Then you'll be asked to weigh that evidence and either approve the DMP with conditions and grant all waivers, approve the DMP with conditions and select waivers while denying other waivers or deny the DMP and its waivers. As for the special exception request, those have many more criteria for you to consider. As you are aware, a special exception is a use that would not be appropriate generally or without restriction throughout the zoning district, but which, if controlled as to number, area, location, or relation to the neighborhood, would promote public health, safety, and welfare. Such uses may be permissible in a zoning classification um, as a special exception if provision for that special exception is explicitly made in those zoning regulations. The applicant's property is zoned NCHI, meaning Neighborhood Commercial High Intensity District. And pursuant to uh, the city's code at section 53-179, a convenience store is a principal is a principal use. Fuel pumps and uh, car washes are special exception uses. So in determining whether or not to grant the special exception, there are two main considerations. One was whether notice was proper, and two was whether or not the legal requirements of your ULDC were met. As to proper notice, um, that will be demonstrated shortly as staff walks through the rest of this presentation and, um, and that such notice was provided as pursuant to section 53-258. As for the legal requirements, those are found in section 53-256 of the ULDC. And specifically, it states that before any special exception shall be approved by the commission, the commission must determine that granting the special exception will not adversely affect the public interest, health, safety, and general welfare. That the specific requirements in the schedule of district regulations governing the individual special exception, if any, have been met. And it's 16 standards that are outlined in section 53-256 have been met. Those standards include that the proposed use is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the intent of that zoning district. That the proposed um, use, the density and intensity is consistent with the intended future use of the property. That um, the use is not detrimental to the health, safety, welfare, appearance, or prosperity of the neighborhood or adjacent uses, and shall be an economic benefit to the economy of the city. That the intensity of the proposed use is harmonious with the character of the neighborhood. The height and orientation of the structure is compatible with existing neighborhood structures. That it's adequately buffered and screened. That um, the loading or refuge area does not impose any kind of negative visual odor or noise impact 
that signs are compatible or in compliance with chapter 129, that exterior lighting is harmonious with the character of existing neighbor, neighboring uses, ingress and egress does not adversely affect traffic flow or safety, the access and internal circulation is adequate in the case of emergency um, or fire. That it doesn't adversely affect the traffic flow, safety, or control of surrounding railroad, or I'm sorry, the surrounding roadway systems. That the proposed potable water system and wastewater systems are adequate for the use, and that it doesn't cause or intensify flooding of neighboring uses. If notice is proper and the standards have been met, then the recommendation will be for approval. If notice is proper and all the standards have been met or could be easily met with conditions, then again, we would ask um, for approval with conditions. And if the notice is not proper or if any of the standards have not been met, then you would need to uh, deny and you'd have to state the reasons for your denial. Now you've heard from the applicant as to why he believes that proper notice was provided and the standards were met. And now staff will present their evidence to you as to proper notice having been achieved and whether the standards were met or could easily be met with conditions. Nicole. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, for the record, my name is Nicole Galehouse. I'm the planning division manager and I have been sworn. Um, so to start off, um, we're gonna look at the site plan. Um, for the development master plan proposal, uh, there are two lots being proposed, lot one at 1.91 acres um, with a full service 7-Eleven, uh, 30,454 square foot convenience store, 16 fuel pumps, and 979 square foot car wash. The remainder of the property, which is 2.24 acres surrounding it, um, is proposed as conservation area or a future park to be dedicated to the city. Um, I'm not sure what happened to my map on here, um, but it is a neighborhood commercial high intensity. Um, so uh, permitted by right is the convenience store. Um, so we're looking today at the um, special exceptions for the fuel pumps and the car wash. Uh, neighborhood commercial is intended to provide for customary and traditional conduct of limited trade, retail sales and commerce in a manner convenient to and yet not disruptive to adjacent residential areas. Uh, the special exception, as Jennifer mentioned, um, establishes whether or not a use um, that may not be appropriate without restriction, um, but when controlled as to number, area, location, or relation uh, to the neighborhood would promote uh, the goals of the zoning district. And so that's what we're looking at today for the two special exceptions for the fuel pumps and car wash. Uh, to start on the development master plan, the, the applicant has requested four waivers, and we'll go through each one of these um, from a staff perspective. Uh, so the first one is to um, request allow for one freestanding monument sign. Generally, in um, this zoning district, monument signs are prohibited. However, if the fuel pumps are, are approved, Florida statutes preempt local governments from regulating um, signage advertising gasoline pricing. So we would need to, to allow for this waiver um, in order to comply with Florida statutes. So this should, staff supports this waiver, but only if the um, fuel pumps are approved. On waiver number two, the applicant is requesting to increase the hours of operation to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, the neighborhood commercial zoning district is intended to be less intense than the surrounding districts and staff feels that this 24 seven operation would be more disruptive to the adjacent um, residences with increased noise and traffic at night. And so for that reason, we do not support this waiver. Waiver number three is for um, the buffer zone and landscaping. The applicant request is to donate lot two um, to either remain as conservation or to um, have a possible park in lieu of providing the traditional required buffer for this zoning district. Uh, so lot two provides uh, the required visual and sound barrier to the adjoining residences and the potential for a future park would actually create an amenity for the community. Um, for noise, one of the biggest impacts is separation. So by providing an additional 130 feet um, over what's normally required, 
it adds that and, and enhances the, the noise um, impact. So staff supports this waiver. And the final waiver is for um, parking spaces to have a, uh, bollards instead of a wheel stop. Um, so this provides the same function, um, but reduces the possibility of storefront crashes and staff supports this waiver. So staff reviewed the um, proposal for consistency with Florida statutes, with the comprehensive plan and with the unified land development code. So in Florida statutes, um, really the, the main place we have impacts there is with the regulations for gasoline um, pricing for advertising. Um, there are preemptions for local governments and minimum size requirements for advertising of gasoline pricing. Um, so provided by providing approval of waiver number one, if the fuel pumps are approved, uh, we are consistent with Florida statutes. For the comprehensive plan, uh, we looked at all the different elements of the comprehensive plan in the future land use element. Uh, it, it recommends that we um, maximize the economic benefit while reducing the threat to um, the neighborhoods and encourages targeted development. Um, so this proposal by um, its nature of the increased buffer around it allows for a commercial development with an increased um, barrier to the residents and thus an, a decrease in uh, the impact. And transportation, uh, some of the goals there are to increase pathways for pedestrians and bicyclists and to provide buffers along the arterial and collector roadways. A 10 foot buffer is required along the arterial and collectors that this property uh, is adjacent to. So it, it enhances those. And then the um, network would also re be required to have uh, crosswalks and pedestrian access. And then if the park is, um, is approved in a future um, point, then that would also uh, en enhance the pedestrian and bicyclist network. In the conservation and coastal management element, um, SDR is, is directed to encourage green design practices. The park component provides a natural and organic buffer while reducing the potential intensity of the site. In the recreation and open space element, uh, the definition of open space includes passive recreation uh, the closest existing park to this area is 1.23 miles away um, off of Southford, the Blue Ridge Park. Uh, there's no, there's only one park uh, east of that location. So we would definitely be promoting um, additional park facilities. Uh, the recreation open space element also encourages the promotion of um, privately supported neighborhood based park systems. And so this also um, enhances that goal of the, of the comprehensive plan. And then the economic development um, element promotes balanced and orderly economic growth. Um, and so we do want to see um, economic growth in the city. And this proposal, staff found that this proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan. For the Unified Land Development Code, uh, Chapter 25 for parking, uh, it's consistent with this um, chapter if, you, if the waiver is approved. If not, the plan would need to be revised to have wheel stops instead of the, the bollards. Um, chapter 37, the roadway and design, redesign and construction standards. Um, the park is shifting the pedestrian burden off of the regular roadway network. So this enhances that, that ability of our roads to have the proper capacity. And then in chapter 53, uh, the neighborhood commercial high zoning district and the special circumstances for fuel pumps. Um, we've evaluated the, the proposal against these and it meets all of the criteria. Uh, in addition, the economic impact of the proposal is $188,298 over the first five years and $2,097,239 over 30 years. Um, this was also reviewed um, by all of our SDR staff in terms of environmental, transportation, um, utilities, police, fire, parks, and parks and recreation, and solid waste. Um, so solid waste has found that the, the site meets their requirements. Um, for stormwater and environmental, um, the uh, proposed wet detention stormwater pond footprint is sufficient for uh, the DMP approval. 
the wetland and wildlife survey showed uh, a gopher tortoise on site. Um, and that would be, no, I apologize. I'm mixing up projects. It does not, <laughs> it did not show, show a gopher tortoise on site. I please disregard. <laughs> um, but it, it was a, it showed the potential for gopher tortoise habitat. Um, and that would be fully evaluated with a 100% gopher tortoise survey at um, the major site and development stage. And if any are found, um, they would have to be managed through Florida Fish and, or through Florida Wildlife Commission um, for protection. Uh, for transportation, um, the traffic impacts. Um, uh, are, are, are minimal um, as the applicant stated 77% of these are pass by trips. So they're not generating a lot of new trips. Um, utilities has the capability to serve the site um, and police and fire are okay with access and um, had recommendations for um, how the site should be developed. Parks and Recreation um, has reviewed it and has reviewed the um, potential park and is in support of this as well. Uh, so one of the big things with the special exceptions is the special exception criteria. Um, and so for the record, I apologize, I'll go through this as quickly as I can, but I am going to touch base on how um, each special exception meets all of these criteria. Uh, so um, for, I uh, will start with the fuel pumps. Uh, in terms of consistency with the comprehensive plan, uh, as I discussed, this, we do feel that this proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, the, the future land use of the area is commercial. Uh, there is no different, difference in the comprehensive plan between commercial or neighborhood commercial. Uh, so it is consistent with the intensity of the future land use. Um, in terms of being not a detriment to health or economic um, benefit or whether it provides an economic benefit. Uh, so there is, you know, there's always a health risk potential whenever you have an underground storage tank but there are very high safety guidelines on this and it is managed by the EPA and by Florida DEP uh, with a double walled tank. The, these options are, are minimal um, and the economic benefit is provided to the city as we saw with the fiscal impact analysis. Um, the um, intensity and harmonious with other uses um, in, in theory, this is this is met, but we do feel that this could be met um, with fewer pumps. Um, and I apologize, that was my note on A as well. It does generally meet the meet the overall um, discussion in the comprehensive plan, but could be met with a, a lower intensity. Uh, when we talk about intensity, the code defines it as the degree to which an area is developed based on density, use, mass, size, impact floor area ratio and traffic generations. And so there's a lot of different um, methods by which intensity is measured. Uh, and when compared to other similar uses that are provided in general commercial areas, we feel that this site has been planned in the same manner um, and it's not a less intense use. Um, in sufficient size to provide buffering, uh, um, or height and orientation compatible, sorry, I skipped one. Um, so the fuel canopy is um, set at 17.6 feet with the pumps along the roadway away from, from residential. Uh, so this is going to be less than what the, the height is permitted in the residential zoning district. Uh, adequate size and shape to provide separation. The 2.24 acre L-shaped piece um, does provide an adequate buffer around the property. Um, adequate and this ties into the next one, which is adequate light traffic and noise buffering um, as well, which is met. The fuel pumps do not have a loading or refuse area, so the standard is not applicable. Uh, the appropriate signage is met with the waiver. Harmonious exterior lighting, uh, the lighting plan meets the requirements for the maximum foot candles and spillage on site. The ingress and egress um, fire and public works agree that the standard has been met um, and has appropriate access for emergency agencies into the next criteria as well. Uh, the effects on surrounding roadways, there are no adverse impacts as 77% of the trips are passed by trips. 
uh, effects on potable water systems and compatibility of wastewater systems. Utilities has provided um, willingness to serve letters. Um, and then uh, the cause or intensify flooding requirements of our ULDC um, indicate that um, this has to be managed on their site and cannot cause any spillover effects to the neighboring properties. And it will also have to be approved by Swift Mud. So those criteria are met, that criteria is met as well. Um, Hold on, <laughs> we'll have to refer to the stock report here for the car wash. Um, so in terms of being um, consistent with the comprehensive plan for the car wash, um, staff concludes that this standard has been met um, as outlined uh, in the previous responses. Um, that the density or intensity is consistent with the future land use. Again, the future land use is commercial, so this standard has been met. Um, the not a detriment to health and providing an economic benefit. The um, car wash is not um, detrimental to these, and staff concludes that it, it meets this standard. Uh, being harmonious with the character of other uses in the in the neighbor in the neighborhood, staff does not find that this standard has been met with the car wash. The car wash could be located in a different location on this site. Staff proposes that it was would be on the east side of the building as opposed to the west side, essentially flipping that middle portion of the site. Um, by doing so, you move it about a um, hundred feet further away from the properties on the western boundary of the site, um, which definitely provides much um, additional noise buffering for those residents from that car wash operation. Uh, the next one is sufficient size to provide buffering. As mentioned before, the 2.24 acre um, buffer, uh, about 130 feet wide, meets this standard. And again, for adequate light traffic and noise buffering, uh, the um, Next standard is, again, not applicable because the car wash itself does not have a loading or refuse area. Um, appropriate signage. The applicant is proposing four directional signs on the car wash building. These are considered exempt signs, which are permitted with the ULDC, so the standard has been met. Uh, the lighting plan, again, has um, been shown to uh, meet the requirements as far as foot candles and, and light spillage. Uh, the ingress and egress, uh, public works, staff, and fire rescue, again, have determined that the, these standards have been met for this project. Um, the effects on surrounding roadways, that is the same one. It's de minimis with the um, traffic study. Uh, utilities has provided the water and wastewater um, availability letters and it will not cause an intensified flooding that will be confirmed at the major site and development. Um, so in conclusion for this, the special exception for fuel pumps is consistent, but the need can be met with fewer pumps. Um, and for the car wash, uh, it is consistent with the special exception criteria. These petitions have been reviewed and approved with conditions by the applicable city staff. These conditions are included in the staff report and we uh, recommend inclusion of these into um, the motion for uh, the development master plan. Resolutions 2020-R11 and 2020-R12 have been reviewed and approved by the city attorney's office for form and correctness, and all public hearings were advertised pursuant to all applicable state and local regulations. Uh, so in conclusion, staff recommends approval with condition number one of resolution 2020-R11 a special exception for the fuel pumps with fewer than 16 pumps and a specific number would need to be stated. Staff recommends that this number actually be fewer than 12 um, based on a review of, avail of fuel pumps that are existing in general commercial areas of the city. Uh, staff recommends approval with condition number one of resolution 2020-R-12, which is for the car wash, and approval with waivers number one, three, and four of the DMP and conditions number one through five and denial of waiver number two. And that concludes my presentation. 
Thank you, staff. You're all finished now? Yes. Thank you very much. And you had time left over also. Thank you very much. Alrighty, so now we will go on to our first aggrieved party and that would be Stacy Tracy. Ma'am, you do have 45 minutes and your time starts now. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> my name What's is Stacy Tracy and I have been sworn in. Thank you. I would like to um, share my screen with your approval, please. Absolutely. Um, City Clerk. Down at the bottom, Stacy, you should see it says share screen. Just click that and select the screen you want to share. Thank you, ma'am. Did you find it, ma'am? Um, yes, I believe. Okay, one second here. I apologize. It has a little green box with an arrow on it. When you hover close to the bottom of your screen that you're at now. Yes, I see that. Okay. And yes, ma'am, we right. can see your presentation. Uh, Madam, you. Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor, uh, this is uh, Jeff Boone, attorney for the applicant. I'd like to raise an objection at this point in this quasi-judicial proceeding. All parties were on notice. In fact, we even had a discussion with, uh, not with Ms. Slayton, but one of the attorneys in her office to seek clarification on the fact that all documents to be, to be shown during the uh, quasi-judicial hearing had to be submitted five days in advance of the hearing. We have, uh, we have uh, Ms. Tracy's letter which uh, to uh, the city clerk, which lists the items presented. And this picture is not, um, I guess this is a picture or a graphic, whatever it is, is not, uh, is, is not contained in what was submitted. And therefore we would object to this being contrary to uh, the city's uh, uh, current ordinance addressing these matters. Thank you for that objection. I, Ms. Stacy. I'm gonna pause your time. I'm gonna start you all over. I do need to confer with my city attorney. I am not aware of the five day notice stuff. So Nor am I, thank you. Hang on one second, city attorney. Yes, ma'am. And the city manager's emergency order number 2020-06 revised. There is a requirement that all Evidence, documents, presentations, any items of a documentary nature in a quasi-judicial proceeding be submitted to the city clerk um, at least five calendar days prior to the quasi-judicial hearing. And this is because we are doing this virtually to allow for those materials to be um, attached to the agenda and circulated to board members just in case for some reason the board members were not, um, did not have continuous video access during the meeting they would still have the benefit of those materials. So anything that does not meet that time frame should be excluded from the hearing. Well, if there was any issues with the viewing of the meeting, we would have to stop anyways um, if there's any technical difficulties. So That's, that is um, true with respect to the conduct of the meeting, Mayor, but it is not true with respect to an individual participant's video. So say, for example, um, a commissioner were you know at home and something went wrong and they had to end up calling in on the telephone because the the video um, wasn't playing or the video was was working but perhaps it froze or you know got hung up I, either way that's sort of the policy behind what's in the emergency order the emergency order is in place and has been ratified by the commission so the procedures do need to be enforced that being said I'm I have no knowledge about when the city you know did or didn't receive Miss Stacy's materials I'm sorry, you broke up after after you said that this was ratified by commission. What what did you say after that, ma'am? So the because it's been it's an emergency order and it has been ratified, then we must adhere to the procedures in the emergency order. Now that being said, I have no knowledge about when the city did or didn't receive anyone's documentation, um, so I couldn't speak to Miss Stacy specifically. But, but that is the procedural requirement. So who is in charge of the um, aggrieved parties to ensure that the aggrieved party was made aware of this five-day deadline for all documents? 
it appears in the in the emergency order, um, which also appears on the city's website, both under the emergency, both with all of the emergency orders and in the online meeting provisions. Um, the emergency order is also referenced in the virtual meeting notice. It's also attached, that reference is also attached to the meeting agenda. So it's also uh, referenced in the legal and posted on the front windows of city hall, or at least it's required, all those things are required. And the, the clerk could confirm whether those occurred in this case. Thank yes, you. they have been. Was this emergency order provision um, shared with either of the aggrieved parties? They've been shared with the agenda and everything on it, and that is on the agenda. It's the first item on each agenda. I, I understand that, ma'am. I just need to get clarification. Were the aggrieved parties notified that they had the five days ahead of time when they signed up to be aggrieved parties or in any kind of communication? The code does not require any special treatment of aggrieved parties, um, you know, any differently than any other party. So that there's no requirement that they be, you know, provided specific notification that the other parties are not provided. Thank you. May I speak? May I ask a question? I'll grant I, you some latitude, ma'am. And then I'll have to go ahead. I'll, I'll allow you one question and, and give you a little bit of latitude. Thank you, ma'am. Um, visual aids do not count as official documentation. I would just like to make that a fact as far as on the record. Um, so I'm not exactly sure why the visual aids for the a PowerPoint that just go with my documentation that I've put together for the commissioners um, would be a problem. City Attorney, could you please weigh in on that question? Because I kind of was leaning towards the same thing. I, I, if it's part of her presentation and it's a visual aid. Not true. I'll provide the language to you. And then it sounds like maybe the attorneys and other parties want to weigh in. Um, and the executive, uh, the emergency order section seven is quasi-judicial matters. Subsection C is submission of documents. And um, that section reads as follows. If a party wishes to submit documents, documentary evidence, presentations, and or materials for consideration by the city commission or board in a quasi-judicial proceeding, the city must receive the information at least five calendar days prior to the date of the meeting. Thank you, city attorney. Madam, Madam Mayor, uh, this, again, this is, this is Jeff Boone. Boone. Thank you, Mr. Boone, hang on one second. Um, So as the chair of this, I allowed latitude to Ms. Stacy Tracy to ask one question. I will allow the same for the, for the applicant. One question, sir. Thank you, ma'am. It wasn't a question. It was just a, it was just a statement for the record that the language of the emergency ordinance that uh, city attorney just read clearly covers anything and everything submitted, which is, which is, how we understood it to be. And there are documents that we, uh, frankly, because of the voluminous amount of documents that we have received as late as uh, Friday, you know, just two or three days ago, um, we, we certainly would have been, uh, had additional documents to provide that we, fo we followed the rules and did not end up, um, did not end up providing them. We just want everybody to, to, to play by the same rules. That, that's all I understand. I understand, Mr. Boone. Thank you very much. Since I allowed latitude to the aggrieved party, Ms. Stacy Tracy, and uh, Mr. Boone has already weighed in, I feel compelled to offer the same latitude to ask one question or make one comment to staff if they choose to. Staff does not have any comment. The city uh, will, yeah, we're good. <laughs> Thank you. And seeing that the other aggrieved party has not had their presentation um, seen yet, um, Ms. Stacy, I'm going to have to ask you to read your PowerPoint presentation, use your best descriptive adjectives and, and com convey your thoughts 
without using the PowerPoint since it had not been received in time based on the um, rules of quasi-judicial and this hearing. Mayor, can I ask a question real quick? Go ahead, Commissioner Carousel. Because I can't, I'm, see your, can't see your hand up. So I'm sorry. That's I, okay. I heard that it was just this picture that was not introduced. Is there other parts that were introduced? I'm just trying to figure out if there are other documents that the aggrieved parties had introduced at some point in time and that it got amended somewhere along the line to just add a picture. So, Good I point. mean, if there's things that were introduced, we can just skip over the things that weren't. So, Miss Miss Tracy, is, this picture is it a entire PowerPoint presentation that has not been introduced? Upon, um, I, I actually had sent in and asked what I needed to submit prior to this meeting. I sub, I was told to submit the petition information that has been gathered by the neighborhood, um, but I was told that it was not necessary to present and submit what I was going to read or the um, personal pictures as far as that I had put together just to make this easier to understand um, with the information that I, I have collected. City attorney. Some was reviewed, yes, Mayor. Some was, was submitted at the PZAP. Thank you. City Attorney, I, I don't know if it's all part of a entire PowerPoint presentation and some bits and pieces were already submitted according to the rules and regulations. Um, I need your advice on how to proceed. I'm out of mayor, you know, um, at, at least in the last four years, we have not had an objection to evidence. So we don't have any precedent that I'm aware of about how to handle it. Turning to our code, it, it does um, state in section 2-83, subsection C, where it addresses evidence. Subsection one states that all relevant evidence shall be admitted. And then it says the quasi-judicial body may exclude irrelevant, immaterial, or unduly repetitious evidence. Now, this is not, there's been no claim that this is irrelevant, immaterial, or unduly repetitious. Um, but because the code there does require that the body itself make the exclusion, I would recommend um, that this be placed to a, a vote before the, the board as a whole and let the board decide. Mayor, I don't know if you can see the city manager's raising his hand. I know we got the no, I can't. fair screen. I can't. So. Because we're in shared screening, I cannot see anybody's hands raised. So I appreciate that, um, Commissioner Hanks. Uh, city manager, please. You'll have to unmute city manager. Sorry, I, I just did. It's my understanding that everything that we received as staff is in the backup. There, there wasn't a PowerPoint. We answered the questions that were asked. We had no idea if there was going to be a PowerPoint presented. Um, unless the clerk receives something that she wants to weigh in on that's not attached, we've attached everything to the backup that was received. The only additional document that I received was today when um, Ms. Tracy had sent in the um, additional names for the petition. That's all that I have received. So this PowerPoint presentation that Ms. Stacy is trying to show has not been submitted prior to. I did not receive it. No. And it's very unfortunate. I was told it wasn't necessary to be. So I apologize I, for that. Who, right, who so, told you that? Do you know? Because staff didn't know that you had a PowerPoint presentation. So we're trying to figure out who would have told you that you did not have to submit a PowerPoint presentation. Um. I'm trying to think as far as with all of the email correspondence back and forth, sir. Um, I don't know if I, I don't, it was not Heather, obviously. Um, I don't believe, I don't believe I have, I have a name. I apologize. But the slides that I've put together are, I mean, there's a, there's like a, a family picture of us. I don't understand why Boone would object to something like that unless they're just concerned about my presentation hurting 
them. No, this, this, uh, no, no, ma'am. What I'm, what I'm concerned about is, is that there are rules established before quasi judicial hearings are commenced and everybody has to play by the same rules. Everybody well, then as an aggrieved party, okay. I, should, I should be made aware. Every Stop. Thank you very much, all of you. City Attorney, you advised me to take a motion, uh, to get a motion from the board and let the board decide to, if I heard you correctly, to hear this PowerPoint presentation or not. Is that what you are recommending? My advice is to get a motion, have the board vote on whether or not the documents may be displayed. There is nothing that um, keeps Ms. Tracy from offering verbal testimony. It's only, the, the rule only applies to the documents. So if the documents were to be excluded based on the timing, she would still have the right to, you know, speak to, speak to or even read the content um, aloud. And that's what I was alluding to um, prior to say to Ms. Tracy to, but we will get a board approval on this to forego the PowerPoint presentation Use your best descriptions to describe what the pictures that you are wanting to paint and show that you cannot um, and, and do your very best with your PowerPoint presentation and your descriptions. Um, well, if you need a board approval for that. Exactly. But she's, she's still allowed 45 minutes of presentation time. However she does it, she just cannot use the actual documents that she Chair. wanted to use. Uh, Mayor. I'll make a motion. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'll move that uh, Ms. Tracy is allowed to display only those things that were put into record at the uh, time that was described in the rules and anything else she may describe to her best ability within the 45 minute time frame. A second. Motion on the floor is stated by Commissioner Carason, seconded by um, Vice Mayor Luke. Anything to that, Commissioner Carason? I just want to explain to Ms. Tracy, uh, please understand that this is this is similar to a court of law, very similar, that, that all rules must apply by each side. And so we cannot give one side or the other unfair advantage, regardless of what the, that content is. And so in order to uh, be very careful that this is not an appealable decision, it is in the best interest of all that we make sure that all rules apply to all parties. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I, I understand that. Okay, Ms. Tracy, hold on. We got a motion on the floor. I'm sorry. Um, anything else to that, Commissioner Carison? No, ma'am. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Commissioner Luke, uh, Vice Mayor Luke. I'm in agreement. Thank you. Uh, seeing, um, I'm sorry, City Manager, if you want to unmute, I see your hand up before we take the vote. Sorry, I meant to take it down earlier. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go ahead and do voice vote. Commissioner Carison. Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor. Yes. yes. Commissioner Hanks. Yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. And myself, yes. And I do appreciate Commissioner Carason for explaining that in such simplistic terms. She did a fabulous job. So thank you for that. All right. So Ms. Tracy, um, you can use whatever documents that have already been provided to the city clerk and put into the backup materials um, if they're in your PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you do get 45 minutes to verbalize whatever you are not able to visually display. So um, is that clear? Um, yes, but can you clarify what documents they do have? Because I had sent in with the petition, the backup as far as with the comments that were submitted, which is um, one of the last pages of my presentation, which is basically a public comment. Ms. Tracy, are you referring to the stuff you sent in today or previously? Previously, yes, ma'am. Mayor, it'll take me a minute. I'll just have to look at the agenda. Go ahead, please.
Mayor. Mayor, Mayor may, may I speak? speak? Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Uh, I believe I saw those comments and, and I know I submitted them to the Vice Mayor. It's probably best that right now we just let City Clerk do what she needs to do and we'll just wait. Okay. Besides, you were all garbly, so I couldn't make out what you were saying anyways. We'll just wait for City Clerk to advise Miss um, Tracy. Thank you. that I have that you had sent on, let me look and see what day it was, on May 13th, the last page of that is just the last name on the petition. It has 158 and then there's no name there, but that's the last page that goes with that. There's no other documents added to that. May I speak? All right, um, so Ms. Tracy, I'm going to have to start your time right now to 45 minutes, all right? So um, you have 45 minutes, I'll have my little timer set and I'll give you a five minute uh, warning note. How does that sound? Uh, Mayor, before we begin her time, please, real quickly, may I suggest Ms. Stacy look at the backup online? And that will give her exactly what was submitted by her. I think that's where the confusion is. She's not real sure what was submitted early, what was submitted late. The document you submitted today, Ms. Tracy, is not admissible um, to be displayed. You can talk about it, but you cannot display it. The only one so far from what the city clerk had mentioned is the petition that was submitted earlier this month with the 158 um, petition signature or signature names or whatever it was. All right. Yes, ma'am. All right. 45 minutes starts now. Thank you very much, Ms. Tracy. Thank and you. Everybody else? <laughs> um, does, do we need to take the share screen down then? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. I think we all saw it. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Um, not quite sure. I where to take it down. Quite it's honestly, already down. it's already down. It's on already down, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. So let me just get to mine here. Okay, thank you. Hello, commissioners, representatives, and those in the community who've been able to join this session today. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Stacy. I've been a resident and a member of our community for over 20 years. I'm a mom of two, a small business owner, and today I come to you as an aggrieved party. My home is located on Lakaya Avenue, directly next to the property that is proposed development for 7-Eleven. Today, our commissioners make the decision to whether or not this development proposal will go through. And I kindly ask each of our commissioners, listen to my thoughts, concerns, and the research that I have done. Northport is a city on the rise with rapid development, curbside appeal, mass residential and growth opportunities, and the place myself and many of you call home. As a longtime resident, I've watched the development of Coco Plum Shopping Center, grocery stores, restaurants, and even our brand new water park. Among these useful developments to benefit our expanding community, I've witnessed the development of numerous gas stations. When the first came around, the community was pleased as it brought convenience to local residents. However, as the years have continued, new developments pop up everywhere you look and one type of devel development that has remained consistent is gas stations. 7-Eleven wants to develop a convenience store that's nearly 3,500 square feet, a 979 square foot car wash, and 16 gas pumps with the intention of operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
the claim purpose for the development is to, and I quote, serve the needs of the community. I'd like to highlight that because all development should be designed and placed to serve the needs and desires of our community. If we look at the immediate around areas surrounding the intersection at Cranberry and Price Boulevard, the closest main roads are Toledo Blade and Sumner Boulevard. Both of these roads are less than two miles from Cranberry. Toledo Blade and Sumner both connect to Interstate 75 and US 41. Within the radius of these four roads, there are currently 13 gas stations. To convert the distance into drive time, there are 13 gas stations within a two to seven minute drivable radius from my home, which is located on the same intersection as this proposed development, with more coming. I wanna make it clear that I am not anti-development when it comes to the property next to my home. I understand the lot is zoned for commercial, commercial use. And unless that were to change sometime in the near future, apart from this proposal, I know the lot will eventually be used. My grievance is not because somebody wants to develop on the property, it's because a gas station is what is proposed for the property. In order to grow, I'm sorry, in order to go through with their development, 7-Eleven requ requires special exceptions for more aspects of their development than what they can build without them. I'm not claiming to be a professional with zoning and developing. However, I don't understand why a development like this is being entertained when every aspect of the development requires some sort of special exception, special consideration, or special privilege. The gasoline pumps require a special exception to be built. The car wash requires a special exception to be built. Even the convenience store, which is the only main aspect of this developed plan <clears throat> that zoning directly permits for the property, now require, they require privileges to be able to operate 24 hours. If a development plan requires this much special privilege in order to go through, does it really belong there? The practical answer is no. If a gas station was really meant to be developed in this location on that property, they wouldn't need to go through all of the extra considerations. There are reasons why Northport doesn't have gas stations in the med middle of residential zones. It's because quite simply, they don't belong there. It has been stated in previous meetings with representatives of 7-Eleven that there isn't reason to believe that the proposed development would cause an increase in crime, pollution, or pose a health risk to local residents. But quite frankly, that's just not true. Community and Environmental Defense Services goes into depth about the dangers of placing gas stations in residential areas. Here are some direct quotes that I received from them. While convenience stores can provide benefits, they can have a severe quality of life impact when allowed too close to homes and other inappropriate locations. Convenience store holds up account for 6% of all robberies in the nation. Convenience store employees suffer from high rate workplace homicide, second only to taxi cab drivers. Many people in our community may not know this, but there was a shooting recently at the Dollar General, resulting in the death of one of the managers, which is right across the street. There's also been witness drug activity on the property and drug paraphernalia found on the property and on the residential property next door to it. Residents have suffered significantly, reduced property value, multiple incidents of trespassing and attempted robbery and property damage that never occurred until Litter and trash have been left on their property by unwelcome trespassers and passively from dumpsters and trash left on convenience store property. Residents have been forced to install security systems and video surveillance to try to protect themselves and their property. All of this has resulted simply from a convenience store. Also recently developed is a 7-Eleven on Cranberry and Toledo Blade which has a recorded police response of over 154 occurrences 
for various reasons from 2018 to April of this year. These developments clearly attract crime and suspicious activity that doesn't belong in the backyards of our residents or into the proposed park that the developers want to donate to the city. Now let's talk about some of the other risks and, and threats that present when you add fuel pumps and a car wash into the picture. The United States National Library of Medicine has written multiple articles related to public and health safety. One of these articles spoke about environmental hazards where people live, work, and play. It is directly stated, gas stations can pose significant hazards to people. As people fill up their gas tanks, diesel fuel or gasoline may drip from the nozzle onto the ground, and the vapors may leak from the open gas tank into the air. These lead to air pollution and soil pollution. I would like everyone here to take a second and think about the last time you pumped gas, or the time before that, or even the time before that. What do you smell at and around the station? Fuel. Now think about what happens when you finish pumping gas into your car. Does it stop pumping completely? Of course not. You have to awkwardly step around, dance to avoid the dripping fuel that's running down the side of your car and to avoid getting it onto you or your clothes. Now let's say you were successful in all of this and have remained mess free during the process. That dribbling gasoline spills onto the concrete below you and you go about your day. This happens every single time somebody pumps gas. The spillage builds up and as it gets washed away by rain or other running water, it permeates into the stormwater drainage systems, retention ponds and nearby soil. The unfortunate truth is that many people don't want to notice and pay attention to the seemingly small things like leaky pumps. There's no way that the gas station can stop this from happening which means the damage is inevitable. The National Library of Medicine expands even more on the harm caused to those with increased exposure to the fumes and the runoff from the gas stations. I will read some of these to you. Air pollution is created when fuel evaporates, emitting toxic fumes, and when motor vehicles are running. Soil pollution can result when fuel that spills into the ground builds up and seeps into underlying soil and groundwater. This can contaminate local well water. Underground pipes, tanks that rust or leak can also release contaminants into surrounding areas. People filling vehicle tanks at the gas station are at risk for the exposure to diesel fuel and gasoline, either by breathing its vapors or by spilling it, spilling it directly onto their skin. People who live or work near a gas station may be exposed to the toxic chemicals in the air, soil, and drinking water. Children, the elderly, and people of all ages who have lung conditions such as asthma are even at a higher risk for them. Gasoline contains harmful chemicals, including benzene, which causes cancer. Gasoline vapors contain vital organic compounds which harm human health and contribute to ozone population. Running motor vehicles produce carbon monoxide and particular matter, which is toxic to humans. Fuel leaking from the ground, underground storage tanks contaminate the groundwater. The tanks will be placed in the ground if this development proposal goes through will be larger than the size of average household swimming pools. I followed up with multiple 7-Eleven locations for their, for their verge, 16 pump development sites, three holding tanks are put into the ground approximately 20 to 30 feet below surface level. These tanks range in size to have a capacity to hold between 10 and 20,000 gallons of gasoline. The measuring systems in the tanks and a notice when the tanks get low to promote a new shipment. These shipments follow no regular schedule or time frame, which means they can show up at any given time on any given day. On an average, shipments for a 16 pump station is anywhere between three to four times a week, or could be as frequent as twice a day, according 
according to the different 16 pump locations that we interviewed, both local and non-local. This is an enormous amount of gasoline transfer. A 20,000 gallon tank and two others at almost 10,000 each. Now I'm no math magician, but 40,000 gallons of toxic chemical transfer between shipping trucks that can show up at any given time or day or night and consumer usage promoting fumes and runoff is anything but beneficial to a residential community. All of the houses surrounding this property, aside from my own, are on and use well systems for the water in their homes. The residents do not deserve to have their primary water sources placed at risk for contamination. More than half of these homes belong to families raising small children, children that like to play outside, children whose parents have to live in the increased fear that their little ones aren't safe to ride their bikes because of guaranteed increase of traffic that will come into our streets. Or how about all of the kids that walk to and from the next street over every morning and every afternoon because their school bus stop for Cranberry Elementary, Heron Creek Middle School and Northport High are right there. These roads are busy enough as it, they do not need another reason for this traffic increase. What's the old saying? Don't add fuel to the fire? Hmm, funny how that fits. Naturally, one would assume that companies as large as 7-Eleven have policies and damage control regulations, and that's nice and all, because there should be some sort of accountability present. However, it doesn't change the fact that they cannot promise the local residents and members of our community that their presence <clears throat> does not pose real risks and threats to health and safety. Damage control only gets put in place when you know there is a real possibility for damage. All they can promise is revenue, which why should residents suffer an unwilling risk their health and their safety for a gas station that they didn't ask for located on a property it isn't de designed for for all for a shiny green dollar. I would surely hope that the leaders of our city don't value dollar signs above the health, happiness, and safety of their own people. This is not a matter of increased convenience. As I have shown you the plethora of available fuel stations in the immediate area, there's no wait list or shortage of fuel. Aside from the occasional hurricane, you'll never have trouble finding a fuel pump around here. And if there's a hurricane coming, this station in this spot won't fix a single thing. It will run out of gas just as fast as the rest of the other stations here along with the water and all of the flashlights and batteries. We don't need this, not here. Northport is a large and fast growing city with endless potential. There are plenty of commercial areas that are not surrounded by families, families and homes that would suit this development. I am asking all of you commissioners to protect your local residents, the young, the old, the ones that have been here for decades and the new ones to come. Protect us by making the practical decision to deny this development proposal and put it somewhere where it actually belongs. Um, the petition that I had submitted um, in the weeks to, uh, prior to this that is allowed um, within less than a 24 hour time frame, we had 175 people that strongly opposed this. Um, I had submitted to the commissioners um, actual comments that were stated regarding this, the reasons why all of them circulated around the crime, the increased traffic, the increased noise, and of course the very, very large concern for the safety um, with everybody being on wells and whatnot. Um, as of today, my petition is over 225. I'm still getting people in. Um, the community does not support this. The neighborhood does not want this. And unfortunately, I understand that the tax revenue that comes out of this 
is a much needed thing for Northport and for the growth of Northport. But a development like this should be put in in an actual area to where it, it's it's not going to then someday say, oh, you know, we shouldn't have done that. And the proposed park that they are saying that they're gonna donate to us, I mean, who's going to then maintain that? Who's going to make sure that that is taken care of and the cost, you know, involved in all of that? There's just so much of it. I just, if, if you listen to a lot of the public comment that has been submitted, this is just not a welcome thing and it hasn't been welcomed from day one. Um, the information, unfortunately, that I, I'm not allowed to submit um, the visuals of, of the things and, and whatnot, it's, it's unfortunate, but 13 gas stations um, within this radius, you know, having this, this one additional one is truly not going to make near of a difference in, in anything. Ms. Tracy, I have to ask if you have anything else to add or are you finished? Um, the only other information that I have gathered, um, obviously, I, is I had a value done of my home um, and it was confirmed that 10% of our value of our homes will depreciate surrounding this gas station. Um, and as well as our, or mine, I, I can't speak for other people confirming theirs, but our insurance will go up as well because of living beside the fuel tanks. And I'm gonna wrap it up from there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. You do have 25 minutes. I just want to make sure you are finished. Yes, ma'am. If, if I'm unable to submit the, the other slides, then yes, ma'am, I am. Thank you very much, Ms. Tracy. All righty. So now we will move on to Ms. Let. I'm sorry, City Attorney, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. I apologize for the uh, interruption. And I may have just missed it while we were talking about the evidence, but I just want to make sure for the record that Ms. Stacy had stated that she had been sworn? She did at the very, very beginning. My apologies. I, I did catch that right away. Yes, yeah, she she was good. She did it right away. <laughs> Thank you, City Attorney. Mary, Mary so now... Also, sorry to interrupt, but before um, Ms. Leslie gives her um, presentation, I just wanted to let her know that we received her public comment, but we're not going to read it during public comment because she is an aggrieved party so that she knows to cover everything that she put in her public comment. Okay, so Ms. Leslie, um, I don't know, can you hear me? You'll have to unmute to respond. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right, so Ms. Leslie, you also have 45 minutes to give your presentation and I just want to double check that you did understand what the city clerk was saying about your public comment. Yes, ma'am, that's okay. Okay. All right. So, Ms. Leslie, you also have 45 minutes and your time starts right now. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so, my husband and I are homeowners on Price, almost right across from Dollar General. There are major safety concerns that come with this convenience store gas station car wash that is proposed to be built right next to our home. The emissions and runoff from the gas station are very concerning, especially for anyone on well water in the immediate area. Precautions are supposedly in place for certain issues, but why risk the well being of the immediate residents? We are not expendable. The convenience store being open 24 hours means more foot and vehicle traffic at all hours, plus the fact that this type of business does bring an increase in crime. The wooded buffer that the law firm proposed to appease the neighbors is unacceptable. Specifically, our property will barely receive this buffer and the woods are not very thick at all. 
Our home is also the closest to the fuel pumps and tanks. They spoke of a nature trail growing through it. What is to stop any vagrants or homeless people or drug users from loitering in that buffer? Uh, also, eight feet is not enough of any sort of fence, and we really should be uh, built a sound barrier as well. There was no previous mention um, other than this evening, to my knowledge, of a fence of any sort also. Another major safety concern is the added traffic. They want to have two driveways. One would be right next to our home on Price, and the potential for accidents will be higher than they already are. It is already very difficult to get out of our driveway in the morning due to pedestrians on the sidewalk and all of the regular morning traffic. With this type of business also comes much more noise and light pollution for the surrounding residents, many of which have children. We are also expecting a child at the end of the year. With all of the extra lights, noise, traffic, potential crime, emissions, and added trash that we already find on our property, nothing about this plan makes us feel safe or comfortable. We enjoy being on our porch and gardening around our property, and this plan will squander any peace and comfort that we hold dearly in our property and our home. There are also endangered gopher, gopher tortoises, which are a keystone species for Florida that live there too, and they also will leave their homes. These are primarily home, or there are primarily homes on price, not businesses. Just because it can be built doesn't mean that it should. There are at least as Stacy has said, five gas stations, car washes, convenience stores within two miles of this site. This business is completely unnecessary and unwanted by all of the residents. It severely negatively impacts its neighbors and nothing about this plan is convenient. Don't let Northport's residents become expendable. Our mental health and well being is at stake with this. Please help us preserve this neighborhood and make it something great. We want this city to flourish and not be subdued and submit to being a city full of the same unnecessary things. I would also like it noted that I second everything that Stacy has previously said. Would you please repeat? Miss Miss Leslie, I just thank you, Commissioner Hanks. Um, I just want before you leave, I want to make sure that you are finished because you do have 40 minutes left in your time. Yes, ma'am, I am finished. Fantastic. All right, so now we will move on to the remaining part of this quasi-judicial procedure, which includes now the rebuttal. So the applicant gets 10 minutes, staff gets 10 minutes for rebuttal, Stace, Ms. Stacy Tracy gets 10 minutes for rebuttal, and Ms. Leslie, you also get 10 minutes for rebuttal. Um, I will go ahead and set the timer, and the applicant, go ahead, your time starts now. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the Northport City Commission. Uh, in rebuttal to some of the things that uh, you heard, um, first of all, we think it's critically important that everyone thinks about this intersection, not as it is today, but with Price Boulevard being widened. Um, as we've mentioned before, Price Boulevard uh, is, is and will be the major east-west road, roadway through the largest city in Sarasota County, other than, of course, the interstate or US 41. And at the planning and zoning board meeting, in fact, one of the board members referred to some of the major uh, arterials in, in, in Sarasota. I honestly can't remember whether he said Clark Road or Bee Ridge or Fruitville, but one of those roads, I believe, was mentioned. So we need to think of what price the major east-west thoroughfare through the largest city in Sarasota County, five lanes wide, is going to be in the future. And this proposed um, 
convenience store with gas pumps will be at the intersection of Cranberry uh, and this, this large east-west arterial. We believe the 24 hour, uh, 24 hour operation um, would not be appropriate if it was immediately next to any of the residential lots. But in view of the fact that, uh, in view of the fact that the, uh, the distance from the convenience store to the nearest residential lot, not the house, but just to the lot line is 185 feet. And the nearest residential lot line to the west uh, of the car wash building is 170 feet. That is a tremendous difference and um, in and of itself goes to the special exception criteria of looking at facts specific to, to the property in question. And we believe that those distances will surely um, mitigate against uh, any 24 hour a day operation. Um, uh, gas stations that are open 24 hours a day, people that need gas late at night, need gas late at night, and they're going to be making a trip to get gas. Um, the, 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 the bypass traffic that is on the roads right now, 77% 77, 77 of the traffic that the traffic study, the professional traffic study shows will come to this site. 77% of those trips are already on the road anyway. They're still gonna be there whether this project is approved or not. People at midnight, two o'clock in the morning that need to go to a gas station um, are gonna be out on the road this provides an opportunity for those trips to be shortened. And it also takes trips away from other intersections in the city. Um, we believe that actually having um, 24 hour a day operation right at the corner here, uh, even though it's well buffered from all of the residential homes, 170 feet away or 185 feet away, uh, to have a 24 hour operation that will actually have some activity not a lot, but at least it will have activity, will actually help to keep criminals from coming to that area. Because as we all know, crime at night, other than crimes of passion, uh, generally tend to favor areas that are dark and remote. And placing a 24 hour a day convenience store with gas stations here, a uh, gas pumps here, excuse me, we believe will actually help to increase safety. And certainly it would give the Northport Police Department um, uh, their officers a place to, to be located in the middle of the night. Um, and uh, there's nothing that scares criminals away uh, than uh, seeing police cars uh, in, the, in the immediate area. Um, and we would also call to everyone's attention that, you know, if, if this develop project's denied, this property, the entire 4.15 acres is going to be developed. And with a non 24 hour day operation, but one that can go by code to 10 o'clock at night, say a restaurant with outdoor dining and with, with people parking their cars and opening doors and closing doors and coming and going until 10 o'clock at night, immediately across the property line from the, these residences to the north and to the west is an alternative that quite frankly, makes a 24 hour a day operation shielded by a huge buffer, perhaps a better alternative. Um, uh, we did hear the suggestion by staff <clears throat> about relocating the car wash. We've talked to our client about that. We've talked to staff about that since the planning board meeting. Our clients are fine with that. Um, it's, we would just point out that if it had to be relocated, it would be moving it further away from some of the neighbors, but closer to some of the other neighbors. Um, but if the commission would be of a mind to have the car wash relocated, our client would not be objectable, objectionable to that. The gas pumps, we did ask for 16 initially. The, the planning board approved 14 and we, our client is agreeable to 14. Our client needs to have 12 at a minimum to make it work. Um, if it's less than 12, then the project is, is not viable. Um, as, as many of you know, I've been practicing land use law uh, Sarasota County, City of Northport, City of Venice, other cities since 1983. I can tell you in all of my experience, the intensity that's related to the number of gas pumps has to do with traffic. That is how intensity is defined. 
And in this instance, there, the traffic study shows that 77% of the trips are already on the road and um, are gonna be on the road, whether this, this gas station is approved or not. And we believe that from an intensity standpoint, the 14 gas pumps uh, will be, would not create an over intense development. Um, uh, we would like to at this, this point ask our engineer, uh, Matthew Gillespie to address the fuel tank issue. Um, if we could go off the clock long enough to have him hook, uh, hook in here, uh, Matthew. Yes, um, Matthew Gillespie Three with Kimley Horn. Three minutes, sir. Okay, Matthew Gillespie with Kimley Horn. I've been sworn in regarding some of the safety items that have been mentioned. Uh, there is um, a couple of different studies that's been done. The, as stated before, the tanks are dual wall tanks. They have pressure switches. It's an enclosed a vacuum based system. So if there is a leak, there is a pressure switch that gets tripped and an alarm goes off and the fuel pumps all get shut down. So there is protection devices in place for if there was a, a fuel leak. For regard to some of the statements regarding the vapors and benzene and stuff, the uh, California um, the California Board Environmental Protection Agency on Air Resources has done studies or as locations and placements of the fuel vent stacks that are go along with the gas stations. And in their uh, April 2005 study, the closest distance that's recommended is 50 feet to any type of property line, any residential home. With this development, you know, the, from the center of the home to the closest one is about 300 feet away. So we're six times the distance that's that's required uh, for that. The um, again, the, the tanks provide sufficient, um, you know, devices for protection. It is permitted through FDEP. There is certain state statutes. That's uh, Chapter 62-761 that the fuel tanks meet those criteria and the, every tank is registered with the DEP with the state that's above 110 gallons. So all of the tanks are properly designed. Uh, all the documentation has to be submitted to the state uh, environmental departments for review and all permits and everything are reviewed and issued based on meeting those state standards. So everything has been designed you know, in criteria with that. The stormwater runoff uh, question, the pond is being designed to not add any additional runoff to any of the surrounding neighbors. We are actually working in conjunction with the city to you know, design the stormwater pond that is a benefit to the surrounding neighborhood. So there will be no additional runoff. One minute, sir. So the, um, um, regarding the gopher tortoise mention, uh, if there is a gopher tortoise on them, there is a state policy fish one off that we have to do a gopher tortoise survey in 90 days prior to construction. It is allowed to relocate any gopher tortoises per fish and wildlife state standards. And if there is one that's within the construction limits only of the project, they will be relocated. If it is without, if it's outside of the construction limits, it will remain as is in its natural habitat. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boone, you have 20 seconds left. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor and, and members of the commission. Just in closing then, as far as the rebuttal, just want to remind everyone that um, uh, it's probably been a long time, if ever, that anyone has ever considered a development proposal like this one, where more than half of the property is being proposed to be set aside Mr. and not, Mr. not Boone, developed. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Thank you very much, staff. You also have 10 minutes and your time starts now. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to um, take this time to um, clarify one thing and um, go over a few um, additional items. So first, I just wanna um, discuss the, the shooting that was discussed by the one of the aggrieved parties. Um, we have spoken with police in this time and they are unable to verify that that incident occurred. Um, and uh, either Captain King or Deputy Chief Morales will be able to speak to that during questioning. Um, they may need to be sworn in if they have not been, but I just wanted to make sure that you know that they are available to discuss that. Um, in terms of Price Boulevard, you know, it, we do see Price as 
you know, being a much wider road. Um, but that's already going to have a, a very dramatic impact on the residences that are going through this area. It is still a residential neighborhood um, and they are going to have a five lane road through, through it. Um, so we definitely want to be careful of, of any additional impacts that are put there. This is neighborhood commercial for a reason. Um, and so we want to be conscious of that. Uh, in terms of the gas pumps, um, we do feel that the the 12 is, is um, based on what our research shows with what's been developed in the city. Um, the 7-Eleven at the corner of Sumter and Price has 12 pumps uh, and the um, two that were just built within the last year or two have 16. So we're seeing a model that's consistent with what's been built in the general commercial zoning districts. The applicant spoke to intensity being um, traffic related when it comes to the fuel pumps, but intensity is more than just traffic related. Intensity has to do with use. It has to do with mass and size and impact. Um, and the use of 16 fuel pumps is a greater use, a more intense use than 10 or 12 fuel pumps. Um, so we do feel that the intensity is matching what we have in our general commercial areas and neighborhood commercial is intended to be a less intense use than, than general commercial to provide the services that are available for the residents in the neighborhoods. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. You, you. you have like seven minutes left. You sure you're done? I am, I am done. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Stacy Tracy, you have 10 minutes for your rebuttal and that time starts now. You might wanna make sure you're unmuted. Yes, ma'am, I am. Okay. All right, I'd like to start off um, argument for some of the statements made by Jackson Dune, please. Many locations in the city zoned the same as this one reinforce that the development can be placed anywhere. Price is a major roadway, regardless of traffic and widening project. There are already four standing stations on Price intersection with the Wawa in process of being developed in the same small radius. Adding the development does not add more convenience to serve the need. With Price being as long as it is, there's ample space outside of this condensed area to place the development. One being the city center. <clears throat> People that need gas late at night or wherever they may want it have ample resources without this development. What demands exist that require this specific development is this specific location given the two minute drivable proximity of the four other stations located on price or price intersections and 13 total stations within the 10 minute radius. Just to reiterate, there was also at the 7-Eleven on Toledo, and Cranberry Boulevard in February, a fire that broke out, which was not also um, documented previously by me. Crime activity is increased by the presence of the gas station and as provable in many studies, and as I have stated, there have already been 100 incidents of police response to most recent development, making it clear that no added, this development does not increase safety. For my research, there was the robbery on the shell on 41 within the past two months and a, and a shooting at the Chevron station as well. Fuel leaks, can ha fuel leaks cannot happen if the tanks aren't there in the first place to let it happen. The proposed recreational activity serves as potential location for homeless activity, loitering, litter, and suspicious activity if it's not properly lit and regulated. As was stated by Boone, crime activity is drawn to dark areas. So who will be responsible for properly maintaining and, and doing the surveillance on these properties for us residents? When was it witnessed that there were lines for customers to receive gas recently? There isn't. There's no desire or need for a location in such close proximity to the others in this area. There is a fine line between convenience and excess. What exactly makes this specific site more suitable than other zone locations without presence of homes? Buffer systems cannot prevent 
airway pollution and the odors related to the gasoline and stationary vehicle emissions. Properly placement like this will decrease property value. Development should be convenient and non-destructive to adjacent property. Development is destructive. Construction litter runoff, gasoline smell, 24 hour customer activity, increased traffic in, on the property that was previously somewhat quiet. A buffer system would not be necessary if it wasn't already known that the activities surrounding the development would be disruptive. Park recreation reserve space, who will be responsible for the maintenance and conduct of this land now? The photo evidence of the gopher turtles present in the habitat on the property indicating need for a more thorough examination of the space and other protected species that haven't been mentioned. The special exception fuel pump, always a health risk potential. Minimal risk does not guarantee safety, air, water, and soil pollution is guaranteed as a result of this development. And it has been stated by the EPA and CEDS. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Tracy. You do have uh, over five minutes remaining. You sure you're finished? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Leslie, are you ready? You also have 10 minutes. Are you yes, there? Okay, and your time starts now. Thank you. I would like everyone to just think for a moment and put yourself in the resident's shoes. Would you personally enjoy being next to a gas station, a car wash, and a convenience store, especially all in one, especially being open 24 hours a day. There are not going to be police officers there hanging around at all hours of the day and night. That is not a guarantee and does not make me feel any better. There are children in the area. We are about to have a baby and would like to raise it feeling safe and comfortable. This is a residential area as stated. It's nothing but homes. Why change that? Why aggravate and harm the residents in a residential neighborhood? The buffer that they're proposing to be next to our property specifically is maybe half of what all the other homes are going to get because they wanna put that driveway on price. Are two driveways necessary? The one on price is extremely close to our home it could be further away or there could not be one on price to begin with. At the very least, they should move that away or not have it at all and have a substantial sound buffer if they're going to force this upon our neighborhood. We are used to a certain level of noise living on price. It is what it is. But with this development, it will be unbearable. Our mental health, our safety, our well-being are all at risk. And if Boone and 7-Eleven are okay with that, so be it, I guess. I'm finished. Ms. Leslie, I'm sorry. Did you say you were finished? Because you also have about eight minutes left in your time. Yes, ma'am. I think that's all I can stomach at this point. Thank you very much. All right, so that ends our rebuttal period. And now we are into public comment period. And I know we are not live and we are not seeing our public commenters and um, they're not around us, obviously. Um, please reserve any comments, facial expressions or anything relating to public comment. Um, we have to read those and there will be no discussion in between the public commenting period. So let's sit back and give them the same respect that we've given the applicant, our grief parties and our staff. So at this time, I believe it's city clerk that is going to be reading the public comments and how did it work with the phone in public comments? Are those messages played again or were they transcribed to be read? We did not receive any voicemail messages for this. Thank you for that clarification. So, all right. Take it away, city clerk, with the public comment. It'll be Becky, but she's going to go. <laughs> oh, okay, Miss Becky. Um, hold on, hold on. Does Miss Becky have to be sworn city attorney? No, oh, ma'am. She's not providing the testimony herself, so she may not be sworn. Okay, I just want to make sure. <laughs> Should have indicated 
on the form, um, you know, that they were sworn. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Miss uh, Becky. Okay. The first one is Stephen Harrison. As a homeowner less than a block from the location of the gas station, I am concerned and opposed. We have a three-year-old and are planning another child, and I worry that the traffic caused by this store could put my family and property at risk. Additionally, there are known health risks to which children are vulnerable from gas fumes and petroleum ground penetration. Finally, as a resident of Northport, I can tell you for certain, the last thing we need is another gas station car wash. We have too many as it is and three already on price. If this store is to be built, I believe we should have some concessions, including but not limited to environmental impact studies, soundproofing wall barriers around the property and added lanes on both sides of Cranberry at the intersection, along with new traffic lights to make sure everybody is safe while traveling. The next one is Jennifer Laffo. I'm sorry if I'm not saying the names correctly. One of our biggest concerns is that all roads leading to this location are strictly residential and should not have semi-trailers driving through them to deliver fuel. We have lived here since 2013 and I have never seen a semi-trailer in our neighborhood and we would like to keep it that way. We don't need and do not want the extra traffic and business so close to our kids and homes. While we understand that the property is zoned for commercial use, we feel that this was an oversight at, from the original commissioners who zoned this intended on having a 16 pump gas station several hundreds of feet from residentials. A gas station brings it, it many environmental and health issues that will affect everyone living in the area. Nearly every home relies on wells for our drinking water. These precaution underground resources literally run underneath the proposed site. The dangers above ground are just as scary. The gas fumes, the light pollution, and the potential drug paraphernalia are just a few concerns. As planners, the most important thing to consider is that there are no take backs. Once this is built, it will always be a scar on our residential neighborhood. There are plenty of major arteries nearby where gas stations can make perfect sense. This location is not wise and we urge you to accept our point of view. This one is from Janice Wilbert. January, 2020, I met with board commissioners regarding a 24 hour gas station convenience store car wash. My concerns were contamination of wells, traffic, children, noise, drugs, smell of gas, diesel, garbage, and lighting. I personally showed the commissioners my findings of gas stations in the area and gave them a copy of my findings for their reference. My findings, Cranberry and Price to Sumter, three gas stations, 1.5 miles, Cranberry and Price to 41, two gas stations, 2.8 miles, Cranberry and Price to Toledo Blade, one gas station, 1.7 miles, Cranberry and Toledo Blade, and 75, one gas station, three miles. How many gas stations do we need in this small area? February 3rd, I attended a commission workshop regarding the ULDC and neighborhood commercial zoning. A, a particular topic came up, a 24 hour gas station convenience store car wash in a residential neighborhood. Discussion by commissioners and much time was spent with many questions regarding each item, along with the special exceptions. A vote was held and the commission voted unanimously not to have a gas station 24 hour convenience store and a car wash in a residential neighborhood. All of these had special exemptions. I agree with the commissioners that a gas station of any kind, a 24 hour convenience store and car wash is not to be in a residential neighborhood. Today, I ask that you remember how you voted on February 3rd, 2020 and vote no on these two resolutions. Thank you for your time and consideration. The next one is from Catherine. As a homeowner in city limits, I absolutely protest the ignorance of a gas station at the corner of Cranberry and Price. The fact that this was proposed plan would even come to this stage of possibly shows the flat out disregard by the public servants voted into office on behalf of our wants and needs. This gas station is neither a want nor need for this community. 
the EPA implications because we are all on well water is only the beginning of the problem. The social impact of having a gas station, especially a 24 hour one, is prevalent in every city area of a residential neighborhood that turns into slum, mostly in rural areas that grow too fast for themselves and don't and documented social economic facts that it brings drug deals, late night transients of travelers, displaced wildlife such as rats amongst dropping property values, creating a true cesspool of poverty in a slum neighborhood. Will Northport soon look just like the trash parts of Sarasota and Fort Myers or even Port Charlotte that made the same mistakes of allowing these sorts of businesses in residential neighborhoods? Northport should be then Northport should be better than that. Northport should take a different stance that does not cause economic divide through our community larger than it is. We are growing too fast. We have to be thoughtful in how we grow for a better future for decades to come. I beg you to stand up for the people of this city and make sure we grow to be beautiful and that we stand for something. Stand for a community that loves their tree city and its wildlife and loves our youth and wants to leave them a city that is successful. We should make a good example of Florida and the West and the West Coast that we truly created. We don't want to create another Florida slum that produces nothing but negativity on the news in a trashy environment that ruins the lives of those around it. Please instead propose a small strip mall with boutiques, a gym, a daycare, thrift stores, mom and pop restaurants, something that gives the neighborhood kids their first job something that gives mom around the corner a break to shop at a trendy thrift, thrift or not cook without going to a chain. I'm begging you to raise the bar for what the city can be, what U.S. citizens deserve and the great states deserves from its civil servants. It deserves prosperous communities, not government agencies willing to cut corners and make exceptions for big businesses like a toxic 24-hour gas station that is out of place and unnecessary to pop up in our backyard. Lastly, if you would make the mistake of ignoring our wishes of US citizens, you will have no you will have a new problem on your hand. <clears throat> the disdain for the management of the city has been growing and I promise you this gas station will be a tipping point of our complacency if it's approved. Thank you. The next one's from Thomas German. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, I believe behind the Dollar General, I live behind the Dollar General. I know firsthand about noise, fumes, lighting, drug activities, trash, and rats. Any store that sells food of any kind throws food away, which causes rodent rat problems. I am also aware of drug activity and drug paraphernalia, such as needles left on the property. What will you do if a neighbor of the convenience store, gas station, or car wash steps on a needle or a child to pick this up? this paraphernalia could cause them serious health problems. Is the city willing to accept a lawsuit because of drug activity that comes from convenience stores, gas stations, car washes that are not properly, properly monitored? Let's read between the lines. The developer owner only wants to give back unneeded property so they don't need to pay taxes on this unused property and not having to maintain the property for a park, which will only bring in homeless and drug dealers. What family with children wants to be at a park on price? Let's go to the park where we can hear the car wash, smell the fumes, see and watch the homeless witness drug activity. Is our neighborhood worth this development? This one's from CJ Baker. My, house, my household opposes the granting of critical exemptions to the 7-Eleven Corporation for the development of a mega gas station at Price in North Cranberry. The downsides include Noise, a 24-hour business, means noise disturbances around the clock. Toxic chemicals means gasoline fumes, car wash fragrances, chemicals being released in residential areas is a health hazard. Vermin, convenient food, refuse attracts pests of all kinds. Litter, litter is already a problem around the city due to the increased number of businesses. This will add to the problem. Traffic. Traffic on price has been a long-standing issue, and this will add to the congestion. Environmental. Removing natural landscapes puts wildlife, wildlife at additional and unnecessary risks. Property values decline. Property values will likely be negatively impacted in the immediate area. It also sets negative precedents. 
the next ones from Joanne Buttonhoff. Please do not allow gas station insurance backyards on Cranberry and Price. The next one is from Gabe Tracy. This is such a sad state of affairs that we are even faced with such rubbish. I can't even begin to believe or understand as to why and how this community is faced if deciding whether or not it is appropriate to allow a gas station in the middle of a residential community. This vote needs to be voted down as a unanimous no vote. I am completely appalled that this proposition has even been allowed to be passed through the advisory board. The next one is from Keith Brown. As a full-time resident of Northport, my wife and I are adamantly opposed to the granting of critical exemptions to the 7-Eleven Corporation so they can develop a mega gas station at Price in North Cranberry. Years ago, Northport city officials had the good sense to ban large and highly trafficking businesses from located in residential neighborhoods. Since then, most businesses of this kind have been established along large boulevards in commercial business parks and public rental clusters. Exemption downside, noise. With 24 hour service and car wash, it will never close and always have production and varying amounts of noise, vermin, convenience food attracts lots of vermin to trash bins and dumpsters vagrancy. The proposed park-like setting will promote loitering vagrancy and create the ideal setting for crime littering. Littering will be a constant problem for those living in nearby traffic congestion. Traffic and congestion will likely increase environmental damage. There is a potential for damage to land, water, wildlife, property value declines, Property values will likely be a negative impact to the immediate area setting negative precedent. Exemptions upside. Convenience. Convenience will increase marginally over what is already available nearby higher city tax revenues if successful. Countless studies confirm the damage this type of development causes to a variety of parties. To move forward with exemptions and develop is senseless. Nothing less than an egressional delegation of duty as elected leaders. Increased city revenue, yes, but at what cost? We have one more, hang on one second. <laughs> it is, can is from Stephanie Posey. Just want to comment that it has been mentioned that the traffic is already there. The cars are already going by. There is a big difference between cars passing by your house versus congregating near your house. And that's all. That was the last one there. That's all the public comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And just for the record, um, you're the only one that gets public comment now. City clerk, I mean, does vice mayor or city manager get any? City manager does as well. City manager, do you have any public comment that has not been read yet into the record? No, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right. So at this time, it is 1030. Um, we have been going for two and a half hours, and I think we've got a lot more time to go with question and answer and motions and stuff. I want to ask the charter officers and staff and my fellow board members, do we need a 10-minute health break and come back and start with questions and, and finish up this quasi-judicial proceeding? Do you guys need a break? I'm pretty sure we're all already breaking, so I'm fine. Okay, I, I just wanna be cognizant of others that are sitting in and watching the meeting and, and seeing if they needed a break. So hearing no desire to take 10 minutes, we will persevere and start with the question and answer. Um, and this is our commission's time to ask the parties questions. Um, so we will start with Commissioner Carison. Okay, where do I begin? Hmm. Uh, first, I guess, is to staff. Um, special exception. To me, it kind of means that you're going outside the boundaries of what it is that 
is allowable. Um, and we've talked about this as a high density, uh, high intensity area. The piece of property that's directly across the street from it, um, across Cranberry from it, what is that zone since that zoning map is the worst mo map I've ever seen in my life? <laughs> um, are you referring to the property where Dollar General is or on the other side of Cranberry? No, the other side, of, it would be the other oh. side of Cranberry. All four corners of the intersection are neighborhood commercial high intensity. That's what I thought. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, this price itself is a boulevard, correct? Correct. All right. It's a boulevard. It is going to be five lanes, correct? That's the plan as I've seen it. Okay. Cranberry is a boulevard. Yes which will ultimately be widened as well at some point, most it likely. It's not in the comprehensive plan right now as a, a future four lane. It is in the comprehensive plan as a future, as a two lane road. Right. But in the future, as, as it progresses, it will probably be a four lane because it leads right out to the interstate. Um, okay. Is there a school bus stop? on the intersection of Price and Cranberry. I, I don't know where the school bus stop locations are. Um, nobody knows if there's a school bus stop on Price Boulevard. There is no school bus stop at Price and Cranberry. There is a SCAT bus stop at Price okay. and Cranberry. Thank you. Wanted that on for the, the record. school bus stop is down Cranberry, about two blocks to the north of Price Boulevard. I don't remember the name of the street. It's not La Caya, It's the next one down. Okay. Um, there, do we have anyone from PD to talk about a death at Dollar General? That is absolutely unknown to me. Um, as well as a robbery at Shell and a shooting at Chevron within the last couple of months. Anyone? Commissioner, we have Deputy Chief Morales on here. Um, City Clerk, would you please swear in Deputy Chief Morales for the record? Chief, can you hear me? I can hear Deputy. you. Okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to help you God? I do. Good, afternoon, or good evening. Uh, Chris Morales, Deputy Chief, Norport PD. Uh, regarding, the, to speak first about the Dollar General um, shooting, uh, the, the only robbery shooting of a Dollar General we are aware of is back in either 1996 or 1997. Um, and actually, it was not a shooting. Um, it was uh, a, a manager that sustained injuries and died a few days later as a result of the robbery. Um, but that Dollar General is located, uh, was located in the Winn-Dixie Plaza there on Northport and 41. Uh, on, if you're looking at Winn-Dixie itself, it was to the left side. That's where the first Dollar General in Northport was. Um, as far as a robbery, um, shooting at these gas stations at the, Sh I think someone mentioned Chevron and, and the Shell station, um, myself and the chief, we are unaware of that, um, reports in the last few months. Um, not to say that there has not been, um, in years past at these locations. Um, if I was to tell you, no, that would be, that'd be a lie. Um, but, uh, for the last, you know, couple months, we have had not any, or the last few years or year or so, I know of not having a robbery at that Chevron um, or the, the the Shell North station there. If that's what we're referring to. Yeah, Shell, we only have two Shells, Shell North and Shell South, correct? On US 41, right? Yes, and Shell's here. the only, and then we have the other one that's uh, out on Toledo Blade. Yes. So, okay. And the only robbery of Shell I know is the one my father was involved in, and that was years ago. That was uh, Shell South. 
that was Shell South. But uh, again, if we're talking about in general, these gas stations, has there's been robberies there, uh, I, I would be lying if I said no, because yeah. we've had taken there in the past, yes. Yep, okay. Uh, I have nothing else for PD. I just wanted to clarify on the record that there has not been any activity within the last couple of months so that people don't start screaming and yelling that they didn't know about it. <clears throat> uh, if I may move on, Mayor? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So I got the property across the street is still is the same one. Is there a way to uh, pull that map up? Because I really want to see what is it that you as an applicant believe, uh, you know, define the pumps because the pumps can be one on each side. It can be um, two in one lane, uh, making it a, a shorter version of the building. Is there a way that we can look at those, that actual um, schematic and try to determine where are these 16 pumps to be, to be located? Because I know that usually in, in 7-Elevens you have uh, two pumps in one lane and then two pumps on the other side. So, all right. So I think you have to share the thingy again and unmute yourself, sorry, Boone and Boone. And Boone, and Boone. Just, just two Boones tonight, thank you. <laughs> but Jack, Jackson's sister, who's one of the Boones here, is very happy that she's at home, probably in bed by now. So I don't blame her. Um, okay, we think we're finding. Give us a moment here. We're finding a uh, diagram that will hopefully show the fueling positions. Okay. So, and here's the, the canopy at the southern part of the property running price. As we go down here, these are submitted. These are in the agenda packet as well. Um, these are part of our application materials that have been on file with the city. Right. Mm -hmm. Here. Thank is, you. Here's the canopy. So mm -hmm. as you can see there, there's one fueling position, which is how they like to refer it, um, which has a pump on each side, which is how you get the 16 from the eight fueling positions. The canopy itself is 90 feet long and it is 20 feet wide. Um, we conducted some research on other gas stations, in particular their canopies in the city um, in particular, there was a list of gas stations that we found uh, in uh, emails um, that were sent around. And so we thought of comparing those. Uh, I'll, I'll read the, the canopy length for one is 120 feet long and it's 25 feet wide. There's another one that is the 13280 Tamiami Trail. That's the Circle K. The uh, racetrack at 18999 Tamiami Trail. The canopy is 200 feet long and 60 feet wide. The canopy for the 7 Eleven at 4895 North Toledo Blade, their canopy is 120 feet long and 35 feet wide. And 16, 16. And that's with pumps. 16 pumps. The canopy for the Circle K at uh, 1085 Grand Venture Drive is 260 feet long and 22 feet wide. And 20 pumps. 20 pumps of that location. The canopy at the 7-Eleven at, awesome. on 10-Eleven Sumter, that canopy is 94 feet wide, or 94 feet long and 45 feet wide. That's with 12 pumps. And the canopy at the uh, Walmart gas fueling station at 1077 Front Street that canopy is 83 feet long, so it's seven feet shorter than the canopy we're proposing here, but it's 42 feet wide, and, ours and that and ours is 20 feet wide. 
Okay, so what I'm trying to get at is that those pump stations, you call them, will actually have two pumps are accounted for as two pumps. So you will have eight stations if you've gotten the 16, or you'll have seven stations if you got the 14, or six if you got the 12. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am. That yes, ma'am. That is correct. And and the issue with the fueling stations is our clients' experience, which uh, this is the business they're in. Our clients' experience is is that you know a certain number of people are going to come to this gas station, and if there are enough vacant pumps, they'll <clears throat> they'll just pull right up to the pull right up to the fuel pump. If there aren't, then they will then they will wait line, so to speak, until the car that's presently at the pump would clear. So it's a much more efficient, you know, while cars are at the pumps, their engines are off, they're not running, and they're not as, they're not as noisy. It's a much more efficient operation for the same size parcel um, to have more of the fueling stations. However, uh, if there's a concern about the 16 that our client had requested as being too many, then our client was agreeable to the recommendation of the planning board as to 14 and could agree to fewer, but they cannot go any lower than 12, six stations, 12 pumps, because the project is not feasible uh, at, at less than 12. So we okay. believe a higher number of pumps commissioner would be much more a much more efficient use of the same site. No, no, I understand that. Okay, so now my next question. Usually these stations can be double stacked, one in front of the other, and that does not seem to be the plan. This seems to be just single stacked in length. Is there a reason why we didn't double stack them similar to what um, the 7-Eleven on Sumter and Price does? Yes, ma'am, there is. It was specifically and solely to to keep the fueling stations away from the neighbors. Okay. All right. Well, that makes sense. All right. The convenience store, the convenience store building acts as a shield to the houses to the north, and the gas, the car wash building acts as a shield to, to some degree, not a total shield, but then you up to the, to the houses to the west, but you also have the, the huge undeveloped area that surrounds the site. Right. The, the now, intention of the location of the fuel canopy and the pumps was to pull it as close to Price Boulevard as Right, the, right. No, I understand that. But I mean, to double them up on Price Boulevard, I mean, they'd still be on Price Boulevard, but it makes sense that you'd have to push everything backwards and be closer to the residents. Um, okay, so the next question is, where is the car wash located if you can go up to that other map? All right. That up. I'm going to pass the gavel for like two minutes to vice mayor and I will be right back. Okay. Commissioner Carasone, uh, can you see the J yep. is yep. on yep. the car wash building and I can okay. zoom in now, on this. Now where is, where is the closest home? Can you tell me where that is? A better example, uh, let me pull up the uh, site plan from our DMP, okay. DMP plan and I can show you that. And while Jackson's doing that, excuse us scurrying around here. His computer is about to die. So uh -huh. We need to plug it in. Mine's at 26%. I hear you. <laughs> okay. So here, okay. If you look to the west, the residential lots, you see them numbered. I lot see. 11, 10, 9, 8. Oh, okay. Okay. Here's the car wash building. Okay. All right. Now, that's a, that's a 60, what do you, what is that, 120 feet away, probably, maybe more? The 
buffer area here provided by the conservation park area. This is 130 feet from the rear oh, okay. of the residential lot line to here. And then as we stated earlier, our setback from the car wash building uh, to the, the west is 40 feet. So it's a total of 170 feet. Okay. Okay, that um, explains that one, that explains that one. All right, you discussed, you discussed some sort of a pond, a drainage pond. Um, so this drainage pond, where is that going to be located? Because if you're going to use the potential uh, conservation slash park area as an area for your retention pond, then I'm not sure what we're gaining by that. But if you could explain where this probable retention pond would go or drainage pond, yeah. or is there one? Yeah. Uh, real quick, I will direct you to the, the pond that we have been referring to is this pond, this shape, kind of a R, letter, lowercase mm -hmm, r, mm -hmm. but I'll have our project engineer, uh, Matthew Gillespie, uh, address this in further detail. Uh, Matthew Gillespie, Kimley Horn, I've been You've sworn been. in. Mm -hmm. The uh, the pond is that little R shape there. Uh, we've been working with Elizabeth Wong with the city to design the stormwater pond in conjunction with uh, keeping in, in mind the widening of Price Boulevard mm -hmm. plans. And so we've been given the requirements for our site. So we're not exceeding the runoff to any of the Price Boulevard or the Cranberry. The outfall for the stormwater pond uh, basically goes to Cranberry, which is where a lot of the drainage goes now. But none mm -hmm. of the runoff will be exceeded uh, from the pre-developed condition that was going down the drainage ditches currently. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, hmm. Next question is the intersection of Cranberry and Price in the Cranberry area. Now, the reason why I'm asking this is that we've already seen this debacle with the uh, US 41 and Cranberry at the other end. So the question is, will there be road improvements, intersection improvements uh, to that area, uh, additional turn lanes, uh, the appropriate width widening? Will that all be part of this um, project? Because as I said before, uh, we found that it was completely incompetent the way that it was handled the last time. Uh, with a different different company, different area, but I just want to be uh, kind of ahead of the game here. The, um, again, Matthew Gillespie, uh, the city has the price of our widening plans that have been done. There is no proposed turn lane for our project off of Price Boulevard. We are designing to the proposed widening uh, limits and uh, yeah, as Jackson pans down. So we're showing both uh, at the request of the city, they had us overlay the existing line work and the proposed line work for the widening. Mm -hmm. So the concrete meat hatch, if you see the little island in the middle, that's the proposed concrete median that is in the current approved plans for the Price Boulevard widening efforts. The gray line that you see kind of in the middle there, that's the existing edge of pavement. So the the widening is is adding another lane further to the north of the existing edge of pavement that's currently on site. So we okay, are not adding no, a new turn lane. There's no turn lane into that particular entrance on price then. Commissioner? No, ma'am. Um, we do have Ben Newman with our Cranberry. public works department on the call as well if, if, if we need him to speak to any of the traffic items. And uh, if Mr. Newman speaks, then he needs to also be sworn. I'm hoping he already was, but we'll see. <laughs> All right. So the question would be, will we be readjusting that uh, medium so that a turn lane can enter into the uh, facility by price 
That's number one. And number two, what kind of concessions are being made to the cranberry, the cranberry. road? Oh, just hurt myself. Anyone? This is this is Ben Newman. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Mr. Newman, could you please state for the record you've been sworn? And if not, could you, we please have the city clerk swear you in? I have not been sworn. City clerk, please swear in Mr. Newman. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to help you guide? Yes. Please state your name for the record, Mr. Newman. Uh, ben Newman, City of Northport Public Works Department. And regarding the uh, the impacts of traffic for this development, they provided a traffic impact statement with the proposed uh, additional traffic created by this development, and it did not uh, and did uh, left turn lane justification analysis and right turn lane justification analysis. But uh, quite honestly, the uh, the road network we have there now with the three lanes southbound on Cranberry coming up to Price and the future widening of Price Boulevard itself, there was uh, no need nor no opportunity for them to uh, to have a right turn lane on either leg of the intersection into their development. And bo both of the uh, driveways, the driveway on Price Boulevard and the driveway on Cranberry Boulevard will be right in, right out only. Um, which makes no sense. If you can't get to it on Price <laughs> and you can only make a right in the Cranberry, how in God's name will you access it if you're coming from, say, Salford? Yeah, you will not be able to access it coming eastbound on Price Boulevard. Well, then what is the point? Because I was I was almost sold because of the fact that you're going to get some some other people off the road uh, that are closer to this station, and you would prevent them from traveling all the way down Price to one end or the other. But now you're telling me literally the only people that will be able to get in there are people that are north of, uh, of Price on Cranberry because of the fact that there's no left-hand turn into it, which makes no sense since the end of Cranberry, there's another 7-Eleven, okay? And the only other people that can get in there are people that are coming from Toledo Blade and... FYI, there's a ton of gas stations over there. So without the left turn in from Price and a left turn in from Cranberry, this makes no sense. Well, they, they can access the, uh, the gas station from any other direction. They, if they're coming south on Cranberry to Price, they can access the gas station. If they're going west on Price, they can access the gas station. And if they're going north on Cranberry to Price, they can access the gas station. But because we have, we will have a raised traffic separator on the west leg of Price for the dedicated left turn movement on Price north to Cranberry, they will not be able to make a left into the gas station on Price. And because you have a dedicated southbound left turn lane, a dedicated right southbound lane, and a dedicated through lane on the north leg of Cranberry, they will not be able to cross those three lanes of traffic to make a left turn on Cranberry into the gas station. Okay. I'm okay with the left turn on Price because it's a major boulevard and it would be a little bit of a difficult time getting into Cranberry or getting into the facility from Price, but not being able to turn left from Cranberry is asinine. How do we change that? It's our road. How do we change that? 
They'll be, if they're coming north on Cranberry up to Price, they'd make a left turn onto Price and then a right turn into the gas station. Okay. I thought you couldn't make a left turn into the gas station from Cranberry. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're going on to Price in order to make the right onto. Can you put the map back up so I can see that instead of all you silly faces? <laughs> I lost it. Thank you. Um, okay, so what you're saying is that if they're coming from south, so the only people who are not going to be able to access that unless they make a, no, if they made a left on Cranberry, they couldn't make a left into the Cranberry entrance, correct? It's the people yes, coming true. from Price that are going to be a problem. People coming from Price that are, say, from Southford, okay, they would literally have to take back roads in order to get to Cranberry so they can jump the intersection so they can make a left on Price in order to make a right into the facility. It's, Correct. Okay, why can't we make a left into Cranberry? Because you have three lanes heading southbound where the driveway is going to be located on Cranberry. And, and you have a double solid yellow line between the dedicated southbound left turn lane on Cranberry and the northbound lane on Cranberry. Okay, but we already have the same exact things in many, many areas of the city of Northport where there's no light, there's there's a, a third turn lane in the middle of the two lanes. It's only two lanes uh, making a left into, into other streets. So this, again, it doesn't make sense. Make a left into the facility. Can I weigh in here real quick, Commissioner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think what the problem is, is the point that we're forgetting about is that when Price Boulevard gets widened, Cranberry currently has a designate, if you're coming from 75 down Cranberry, there is a designated left turn lane existing. There is an existing straight lane. There is an existing right turn lane. When mm -hmm. Price Boulevard gets widened, there's going to be, I, if correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Newman, because at the last meeting when we talked about the side streets, Cranberry and, and Chamberlain and Salford, there's going to be a median added also, a raised median on Cranberry, so you won't be able to go over that to get into this gas station. No, that's not true. Mm -hmm. There will be a traffic separator on the legs of Price Boulevard at the Cranberry intersection, but none on the Cranberry legs of the intersection. Okay, well, if you look at the intersection of Hillsboro and 41, and that particular, uh, is it a speedway? You can go down Cranberry and make a left into the damn uh, gas station. I don't understand how hard this is. Yes, it, it's, it's, you always have a double solid yellow line between um, uh, opposing directions of traffic. The lanes adjacent to each other in opposing directions of traffic at, at intersections. This is not at the intersection. This is how many feet from the actual intersection itself. Well, it's considered part of the intersection because we have dedicated mm -hmm. uh, turn lanes. Have the designated turn. Straight through lane. Okay, again, it's done in other areas of the city. It's done on a major roadway, US 41 and Cranberry, which by the way, had to be approved by FDOT of all people. I don't understand why the city is not allowing it. Commissioner, Commissioner Karasan, this is Jeff Boone, just, just for the record, so you understand that our client had requested that uh, there, there be left turn, there'd be full access uh, here, uh, but it was the city that had 
city staff had, had taken the position uh, that you're hearing reference mm -hmm. tonight. And, and of course, this, um, hopefully, you know, this proposal before you all tonight will be approved. But if for some reason, if it's not, this property is going to develop. Um, and it's going to be chock full of not limited development like this, but chock full of development. And these access issues are not going away. Thank you. This, this access issue seems to be a repetitive issue within the city of Northport. And this is why I'm irked by it. Uh, I, I, it needs to be a left turn into it from Cranberry coming from Price, bottom line. I'm okay with uh, the Price Boulevard access being a, uh, a right in, a, a right out. I'm all right with that. I understand that. But as it was stated on the record, Cranberry is not going to be widened. It's not part of our comprehensive plan widening anytime soon. It may be down the road, but not anytime soon. And therefore, there is no reason why you can't turn left from Price. Uh, it, no reason. It, they do it all over the place. So that's that's one thing that's going to have to change. All right, moving on. Um, we got the pond. I'm almost done. Uh, I just need to know about the passive park. The passive park. Uh, uh, we're just talking about an open lot of nothingness, or are we talking about maybe putting some. Uh, you know, park equipment in there. Uh, if so, are, is the are you guys going to put the park equipment in there? You're just pretty much saying, here's a piece of property. You do what you want with it and maintain it. So the proposal, um, as it stands, it ha is that it would be donated as conservation land um, under a separate agreement oh, that is being drafted by the city uh, attorney's office and would still go through review with. Um, the applicant's attorney, um, they are willing to um, build the park and then turn it over to the city um, for re with uh, to for reimbursement from um, park impact fees. Um, so that would be the plan if if they were to build the park. Um, so that would again come back to commission under a separate agreement. Uh, Commissioner Carison at Jackson Boone, uh, for the record, we have approached the city. Uh, we had a meeting with planning staff and the park staff to discuss uh, that area as a potential park if the city would desire it to be a park. Um, and they did express a desire to have the area as a park. Uh, we have been in communication with planning staff about a potential park agreement that the city attorney's office is working on. Uh, as Nicole stated, we have yet to see a draft. So mm -hmm. the actual uh, nitty gritty details in that agreement um, We've yet to see a first draft. So as far as how those items would be handled, uh, we can't tell you exactly how that would be handled today, but uh, we are willing to work with the city on, if they would like a park to be in this area, to work with the city on providing the park, working with them on that, or if the city would like to leave it as a conservation area, leaving it as a conservation area. Um, we got enough kinda... conservation area to freaking last a lifetime, folks. Um, question, the impact fee reimbursement, you guys don't pay park impact fees, you're commercial. So, so why would you get an impact fee reimbursement? Well, uh, Re so, uh, Jeff Boone here, excellent question. Um, and as, and as I know, you know, very well from a lot of experience, um, the, the devil's in the details and sometimes the terminology, uh, that everybody uses it can be inaccurate. Uh, not intentionally, but sort of accidentally. So uh, clearly there would be no ability to have park impact fee credits, but if, if this land, and understand the concept here is if the city would desire this as some sort of a passive park, and we're not talking about, we don't think anyway, we're talking about building a ball field or something here. We're just talking about having some nice, maybe a walking trail or something, some benches, whatever the city might like. The land is coming to the city for free. We're only talking about park impact fees, the city making a contribution towards some of the improvements. And with the land coming to the city for free, that would free up 
other park impact fees where the city could perhaps buy some land where a property owner isn't willing to give the land to the city for free. Bottom okay, line is, so yes, okay. thank you. Because you know me, I'm a bottom line person. What do you want for the property? That What are you looking for? The, bo the bottom line is, is that what our client is looking for is to make it a, yes. a, a non-development zone to serve as probably the largest buffer uh, for something uh, the size of what we're proposing here that there is in the city, unless there's some natural, you know, feature. Um, uh, I, I get that. I meant, I meant, is there going to be some sort of a financial implication in order for you to turn that over as a park? That's what I'm looking to find out. Right. So the land would, the, our client is willing to, I, I'm not trying to avoid your question because I don't want to say the use the <laughs> wrong terminology and, and then end up giving you a false answer. So right. what what our client is willing to do is to set the land aside and and uh, legally agree to for it never to be developed. If the mm -hmm. city wants that to be just passive, untouched land, then our client is fine with that. If what the city would rather have or some sort of park improvements, uh, then and obviously we're talking about on the very minor scale, then our client is willing to enter into an agreement with the city. But right now, you know, we, we, we've been hoping to have seen, have seen a park agreement because um, we filed the application back in November. late November. So we were hoping by now to have seen it we met with the park staff in January, Jackson's telling me. So we would have hoped by now to have seen an agreement. And if we'd had the agreement, we would be able to actually directly answer your questions because it would be in writing. Until we until we see the agreement, I, I don't want to guess. Mm -hmm. But our client is willing to give the land to the city for free or to agree to set it aside for free. Okay. All right. So, I mean, as long as we're not going to be reimbursing impact fees or paying for uh, for the the land uh, a proportionate share or any of that craziness, I'm okay with that. Um, Commissioner, just to uh -huh. clarify, for the land itself, the applicant's offering to donate, but if they do improvements, then we would be discussing a reimbursement. Uh, right, but if it's a park, then we'd be doing the improvements. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Carrison, the, 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 the bottom line is the city would not um, be required to do anything unless the city commission approved an agreement requiring the mm -hmm. city to do something. I got gotcha. you. All we right. Can't force, we cannot force the city to do anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Huh. I can't force the city to do anything. I got news for you. All right, let's see here. So the Pasic Park, that's fine. Uh, let's see here. And the Cranberry entrance. Okay, so we talked about the entrance, the the being a left in uh, and a right out. Uh, the uh, the intersection itself. See, I I do not believe it's a large enough area. Uh, you know, to to dedicate three lanes or even four lanes at this point. But my question is, is the the fire um, uh, apparatus, you know, is there enough room for fire trucks to turn left? Oh, wait, they can't turn left. That's right. Even though they'll be coming from Sumter, they won't be able to turn left in there. Um but is Cranberry going to have enough room for say a fire truck or what have you to be able to make that left turn in the middle of an emergency? Uh, because um, it is a small roadway. Uh, it's Matthew Gillespie again with Kenley Horn. So at the request of the city, we did add what they call Pork Chop Island. It's a mountable island. So can you show but, me where that is, Mr. Gillespie? Yeah, it's on Jackson's screen. It's the right. If it if you look at the triangle little half just, area in the just, middle on yes. the that that's basically a concrete solid island. 
if emergency mm -hmm. vehicles had to mount it, they could. However, we did increase the turn radiuses at the request of fire, and we did run a full vehicle tracking, and it's actually submitted as one of the BMP sheets in okay. the review, and it shows mm -hmm. the full fire truck turning maneuvers, and it, it does not run over any of the curbs making the access uh, through and around the site. Okay, so if they made a left from Cranberry, they may have to traverse that piece of concrete, but regardless, they can get in there. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Okay, and my final question would be to staff, I believe. Uh, I'm just re reviewing my notes. Um, how does this play a role in our widening efforts? Um, Will we have enough right of way? Because I'm I can't remember exactly the right of way issue with that particular area. Um, is it one of those sections that we have enough right of way for the widening, or will this be a problem being placed so closely to price? Um, I would have to ask ask Ben Newman to speak to that. I believe it's not an issue. Um, he's the project manager for, for the price widening project. Um, so yeah. I believe it's been reviewed, but I will let um, Ben speak to that. Yes, uh, we have enough right of way in Price Boulevard to Just do the widening. Your name, please, for the record. Yes, for the record, Ben Newman. City Thank you. Public Works. And yes, we have, have sufficient right of way width on Price Boulevard to do the widening as planned. Okay, so this does have the right of way that's that's sufficient, correct? Not only correct. for what's planned right now, but the future plans. Correct. Okay. All right, I'm done, Mayor. Thank you very much for your time. Not a problem. Thank you, Commissioner Kerrison. Um, could I please have the screen back? How do I get back to mute. Thank you very much. And just for the record, there was one public comment that was not read into the record. Um, before we continue on with questions, um, I would like to hear that public comment. I was alerted by a city clerk about this during Commissioner Carison's questioning time. So um, city clerk, would you, would you please state the time that the public record was received so that there's no question and then read the public comment. This one's from Alice White. It was received at 2.27 p.m. When this property was rezoned maybe about 15 years ago to allow for its current zoning, it was with the understanding as relayed to the residents at that time that development would be limited to small stores. Gas stations would not be permitted with the rezoning that was proposed and eventually approved. Special exemption provisions are put in place to allow for flexibility to reassess the changing needs of the community versus how the property could meet those needs. The surrounding area is residential with neighborhoods of families and children. A gas station will be a harsh intrusion on the quality of life for the number of people who have now taken up residence in the adjoining neighborhoods, an intrusion that even two acres of parkland could not even diminish. That's all. Thank you. And you did state who that public record was from, right? Yes. Before I okay. Write. Just, just want to make sure I, I, I must have missed it. I'm so sorry. All right. So now moving back on to questions. Thank you, City Clerk. There's no more public comment. No, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right. So now we have questions. Uh, Vice Mayor, your turn. My first question would be to the applicant, if they could bring back up that same screen, please. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, it goes along the same line as to what uh, Commissioner Carazone was bringing up. Uh, could you slide your, your sound is... down? I'm sorry. I could not hear you, Mayor. Your sound, your, something's wrong with your sound. You're you're very garbly. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Try muting and unmuting. Okay, I 
you're you're muted, muted and unmuted. All right, we're just gonna have to deal with it. Go ahead. And I have gotten closer to the computer too. Uh, in regards to the storm water, uh, I'm seeing the line that shows like property line over to what I am guessing is the 1.9 acreage. And it says that's the conservation park area. So part of that retention pond does lie in the 2.4 acres, correct? Yes, ma'am, it's Matthew Gillespie, correct. And how much, if you take that retention pond out of that 2.4, how much acreage is actually there? Uh, I don't have an exact number on that. Um, I would say it's probably like, you know, a less than a quarter of an acre of land. Probably, it's not. It's not a large um, area. Uh, Mr. Gillespie, uh, the the border that is showing around that retention pond and it goes all the way out to the right side what is that border right now it's a sidewalk or walking path that is shown around the perimeter with park benches it's kind of scattered around but the full details of all that have yet to be determined as that would be determined at the at the mas after the dmps are approved okay that would be part of the park agreement that Jackson and uh, was referring to earlier once the final agreement's made. The stormwater size is the size that it is because that is in working with conjunction with the city uh, about alleviating some drainage concerns and making sure that, you know, there's no flooding issues or anything on the surrounding neighbor properties and keeping to the discharge requirements for the park boulevard, uh, for the price boulevard improvements. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor, is your phone next to your computer by chance? Yes. Maybe that's what's causing it. Let's try that. Thank is you. Is that better? Is, is that better? Mm -hmm. All oh. right. Okay. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> My uh, next questions are for staff. And actually, I'm having a, a little bit of problem with Placing a park in a neighborhood commercial uh, because, to my knowledge, the intent of neighborhood commercial is to have that light commercial footprint in that area. Uh, and usually, you transition with commercial with a heavier toward the front and then it goes lighter to the back before it gets into residential. But that's usually what's done in an activity center. Now, I understand they're talking about a buffer, which the buffer is huge and uh, sounds good, but staff wouldn't that take that property off of the tax roll then? When we were actually, the intent of neighborhood commercial was to bring that light footprint of commercial to enhance the neighborhoods. Uh, yes, you're correct. If, if the city were to take ownership of that property, it would come off of the tax rolls. Um, it's hard to say what else could be done here. Um, with a gas station, it doesn't have a large footprint um, of of land. You know the the under two acres is, is pretty typical. Um, could the site be configured differently? Possibly. Um, and allow for a different mix of uses to transition. Um, you know, I think that definitely could be done. Um, so, you know, it's definitely a valid concern. And the neighborhood commercial, again, is this supposed to be an enhancement to the residents, to the neighborhood? Um, I, I know it was all commercial before, and then with the wisdom of past commission, they made activity centers, and then here come the neighborhood commercial. And, uh, but, but the intent was for it to serve the neighborhood. 
And with what has been stated uh, over three quarters of the traffic that this station would be getting, it's just simply by the people going up and down price. Uh, less, less than, than one quarter, quarter of the trips, the way I'm hearing, hearing it, would actually be from the neighborhood. neighborhood. And that's actually why we were wanting neighborhood commercial. So, so go ahead, Nicole, I see you're trying to answer. answer. <laughs> Um, so I don't know that I would interpret, and, and Ben can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't know that I would interpret the pass-by trips that way. Um, the pass-by trips are really more of it serving the neighborhood than of it being a destination. Um, the 26% or 23% that um, are destination trips, those are coming from outside the area going to the gas station. So the 77% are people who are already passing this location. So they are in the neighborhood or they're coming from somewhere and this is part of their journey. Um, I think, just wanted to clarify that point. All right, so, so we're saying, saying that 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 already going, going up and down no matter, matter where they come, come from. from. Either Price or Cranberry, yes. So, so if somebody's, somebody's just going, going from A to T, B, trying, trying to get, get across, across town, town on the price, price. And 77% of them are going to stop at the gas station. station. But, but 24 or 23% are going to come from, from outside, outside of the area, area and into that gas station. It's not 77% of the trips that go by there that would stop there. It's 77% of the trips that stop there are from people making those kinds of trips. Right, right. That's, That's what, what I was, I was talking, talking about. 77. 77. But, but, but we're saying 23% would, would deliberately drive down, down right down right right to go to that gas station. Right. Right. Above those sorts of trips. Is that that? On what I'm... Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, if, if I might, Commissioner, because I believe you're asking questions about statements that we made. What Nicole, <clears throat> excuse me, what Nicole is saying uh, now is correct, and if, and if somehow we were not clear, I, I apologize for that. This is all traffic that is is coming to this site. It's traffic that is is it includes traffic from the neighborhood. Anybody who lives in the neighborhood now uh, that is driving on Price Boulevard would be part of that bypass traffic. Um, any future you know residents live in the area would be part of the future traffic that's going to be on price anyway. So our point was that it, it, it's largely, you know, sort of how do you define the neighborhood? I mean, I think your staff has pointed out that there's 5,000 plus lots within a mile radius of this site, about 2,800. These are approximate numbers, 2,800 homes there now. So those are a lot of homes and that's why there's a lot of traffic on price in this area, but those are all trips that are there. The additional trips, which I think for PM peak hour break down to something in the fifties, uh, 50 new trips that wouldn't be there otherwise. And you have to understand for a, for a trip, a, a one vehicle going to the gas station and then leaving is actually two trips one trip going in and one trip leaving. So if you're talking somewhere around 50 new trips coming to this gas station, it basically is, it would be 25 cars or trucks. But the rest of that traffic is there and a large, and a large part of that traffic would be neighborhood traffic. Uh, Mary, that's all the questions I believe I have. Um, I appreciate things that the commissioner carries on the road of traffic turns and stuff like that. that. The rest of my mind are today things that I'll leave you right right right. I was I was hoping that it would help with the 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 sound. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. Um, could I please have my screen back so I can see if any other commissioners would like to ask questions? 
All right, I see none. So I will go ahead and ask mine. Some of them were already answered, so that'll help save some time. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention in the actual or, uh, actual resolution for the fuel pumps that the PZAB recommendation was not captured correctly. Um, it was it was recommended approval of the special exception, but it was approval of 14 pumps. So that just needs to be corrected before we move on um, if, if this is approved, of course. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to state that. We can get that corrected. We drafted it before the PSAB meeting, so it was. I figured as much. <laughs> All right, so let's let's talk about the PZAB meeting because in the backup material, um, let me get out my little notes here. In the PZAB meeting, in the backup material is the public notice um, exhibit G, and it says that it's public hearing for resolution 2020R11 and 2020R12, and it's talking about the PZAB meeting. There's nothing mentioned in this backup material about the commission meeting. Now, as a resident, I received two notices, one for the neighborhood meeting, which I disclosed in ex parte, and the second one I disclosed was for the PZAB meeting to let me know that PZAB was there, and I saw this notice for public hearing. What I did not receive, and a lot of my neighbors have not received, and I don't know all of them, was the meeting notice for today that was supposed to be mailed and the public notice meeting for today's meeting is not in the backup material. Could you please tell me when the public hearing notice was advertised and also help me understand why I and many neighbors did not get today's meeting um, notice in the mail? Uh, so the um, code requires that we um, notice at least 15 days prior to the public hearing. Um, we reviewed this with the, the city attorney's office and determined that that had been met with the notice from the planning board meeting um, and the inclusion of the date for commission in the backup materials and discussion from planning board. Um, and so that was- I am reading the public hearing notice and all that is talked about is planning and zoning meeting. There is nothing mentioned about today's commission meeting in this hearing notice. No, I, I'm, I know that that's what the, the notice includes. Then in the planning board materials, it includes the commission dates. Um, and when we discussed it with um, the assistant city attorney, we we reviewed the language in the code and what had been met and determined that, that had been met with the first legal ads. So we legally advertise a planning and zoning meeting, but we do not legally notify the citizens of a commission meeting? Since when? We, we, notice, we notice ordinances all the time for planning and zoning and commission. We, we typically notice um, the, the meeting or the ordinance for second reading, not for first reading. Um, and the items are noticed with the um, commission agenda. So what is the requirement for notice for resolutions? There isn't one. The notice is actually, the requirement is actually um, for the special exception. So there's no requirement to notify the citizens of the special exception commission meeting at all. Only PZAP. It's included in all those materials. So if they're interested, they can find that. That's not my question. Materials. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Nicole, but that's not my question. The code says we are not required to notify the citizens of special exception meeting at the commission level. Is that what the code says? The code, the code says, says we have to advertise one, one time, 15 days in advance of, of the public hearing. Today's public hearing, was it notified and noticed in the in print materials? No, it was not. That's, 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 that's not, not what the code says. Why not? That's, that's, that's not, not what the code says. says. But there's a public hearing for PZAB and there's a public hearing for commission. 
They're two totally separate meetings that need to be notified 15 days prior. City Attorney, could you please help me and weigh in on this? Apologize, Mary. This is the first that I'm hearing of any of this. Uh, either it's the first I realized it because I didn't get my my thing in the mail today. So and that's what prompted me to ask the question. I, I'm not prepared to speak to this. Um, on, on, uh, I apologize, Mayor. We we spoke with the Assistant City Attorney. Um, Margaret Roberts, we can get um, some information from her offline because I don't believe she's on the meeting right now. If she is, maybe she can speak, but she's not. So we, we got her opinion from that, that the notice for of, of PZAB met the requirements of the code. Um, if that's incorrect, that's what we relied on. And that's, that's why this meeting was advertised the way it was and noticed. Um, but if that's not the case, Unfortunately, she's not on this meeting right now, and it's the first we're being questioned on it. So we'll have to look into that between first and second reading. Oh, sorry, there is no second reading, so. No, it's a resolution. I'm not sure what we do from a legal standpoint then. So what happens now, city attorney, if we, if we can't answer that everything was le properly legally noticed as required, what well, do we do now? Well, the assistant city attorney, who has over 35 years of experience and a lot of land use expertise, apparently has provided an opinion. Unfortunately, I was not aware of that in preparation for today's meeting. Um, you know, ultimately, if if a court does, if this whatever the outcome is is appealed and the court decides it was improperly noticed, the hearings will have to be conducted again. All right, I will breathe deep one more time and move on. All right, so in exhibit D, there is a fiscal analysis and I need to get confirmation on this fiscal analysis. Um, was it conducted based on the 4.2 acres or was it conducted on the 1.9 acres as presented in backup material? It was uh, conducted under the full acreage um, with the 2.24 acres being attributed to the parks and recreation use category that the model um, has built into it. Okay, so let's try this again. Because 4.2 acres of neighborhood commercial generates a different um, economic impact than 2.2 yeah. acres park and 1.9 acres commercial. So what was this based on? The 2.2 slash 1.9 or was it based on 4.2 acres of commercial? It's based on 1.9 acres of commercial and 2.2 acres of uh, parks and recreation. So neighborhood commercial is supposed to generate a different economic impact. And a study wasn't done to show what the differences were if it was a full 4.2 um, acre neighborhood commercial property, but it's only done on a 1.9. Mm -hmm. Correct? Correct. All right. So now if you could please bring up this picture again that had the map, because we yeah, got to talk about- uh, Commissioner McDowell, um, we actually, or M Mayor McDowell. That's okay. Um, we actually, in some of the material we received from staff that had been, um, I guess, prepared uh, for the city in advance of this hearing, we actually came across a fiscal impact analysis that was done for the property without a park. And the final, at the years one through 30, the uh, what they identify as the net operating surplus to the city is two, $2,124,697. And that is in comparison to the uh, net operating surplus found with the, for the inclusion of the park area. The park area was 2,000,000 
$97,239. That, I did the quick math on my phone. The difference is $27,458. So whether or not the park is included, the surplus is still uh, two million plus dollars. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Could you bring up the map again? All right. So we've already clarified that the pond goes along that walking trail down and then towards the, the property here. If you're going to be donating, and the city accepts this, um, the 2.2 acres, and the 2.2 acres is going to be city-owned property, which means it's off the tax rolls. I, for estimate sakes, we're going to just call it half a year pond is on our property. Correct? Yes, there was, um, this Matthew Gillespie again, there were some preliminary discussions with the, uh, with the city about, you know, since we're making this stormwater for part of the park space, as well as our development, it would basically be serving both of our needs and if it if it was required we could put a easement around the pond perimeter that would basically be to the benefit of the 7-eleven it would be a stormwater easement the property would still be as you stated still be with the city but part of the stormwater since this is basically being shared between the two parties an easement could be placed over part of it that would be for a stormwater management easement. Who would be responsible for maintaining the integrity of that stormwater pond, even if it's on half of the city's property? All of those items would be in the agreement in the parks and rec agreement. But as Jackson said, we haven't seen that. That was discussed, you know, with them back in January. So we don't have the agreement. Those items would be drawn out in that type of an agreement. We don't even know who's going to maintain the pond that you guys are required to build, regardless if you give us a park or not? No, it's our stormwater pond for maintenance, but whether or not the city participates in part of the maintenance for sharing it, those type of deals would have to be worked out in agreement. It is our stormwater pond for the 7-Eleven site that you need as well for part of the park space. No, actually... City Manager, you have your hand up, please. Thank you, Mayor. What hasn't been decided with that agreement is whether the city would own that land or just we would have an easement to the park space on that land. That would all come forward in the agreement that will come to the commission, which will also at that time identify who's going to maintain the stormwater pond. Yeah. Those, de those details have not been ironed out um, and that would come in the future. Right now, we, I can't even promise you that we will take the, the land and make it a park land because that agreement's not done and it hasn't been approved by the the commission or the applicant at this point. Mayor, Mayor McDowell, this is this is Jeff Boone. I so just if wanted, Mayor McDowell, I just wanted to, to, to reiterate on that that um, uh, uh, please keep in mind that whatever ends up being the agreement between the city and our client, you will you and your other four commissioners will actually make ultimately make that decision. So so um, uh, I don't, we don't see that the city is taking any kind of risk or there's some problem being created here. This quite frankly is, is, is totally, totally in, in, in your control. And if at the end of the day, the city wants to have nothing to do with this land, then our client will agree to set it aside and, and, and guarantee that it won't be developed. If on the other hand, the city would like to see some of it developed, we've never contemplated that. Um, you know, 
our client is willing to, to be flexible to work with the city however the city wants to work with our client. And if the way the city wants to work with our client is to say, we don't want to work with you at all, then fine, our client will just set, set the land aside. There's no, there's no problem here at all. It's whatever the city wants. Part of, part of this land is part of this whole deal and it goes to the buffer because if we don't accept this, then you would be required to build a buffer wall. If we accept this and I don't have an agreement before me, it's, it's kind of a chicken and an egg kind of scenario. So what I will do is I will move on. Um, I have to ask another question about the buffer wall. If you, I don't know if you can move this screen up a little bit so we can see this entrance. No, I'm sorry. Maybe it's down the other way. I want to see the entrance off of Price Boulevard. Can you move it down a little bit more? More? You're in that position. I want to see where Price Boulevard is in conjunction with that entrance. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so this very far left concrete entrance, the very far left side, based on my little calculation using the scale that's provided in this site plan, there is exactly 40 feet from that property line to the pavement of that driveway. That is not beneficial to the residents in that area. Um, and and it, it's a huge impact. And then I feel that they should have a wall there to separate that, to afford them some protections of rogue drivers. That never happens in Florida where they hit the gas instead of the brake and miss a turn and all that kind of stuff to pre to protect that piece of property over there and again on the other side. But my other concern is, and I think it was you, Mr. Boone, that said that there would be 50 feet of vegetation between the edge of the development and the residential neighborhood homes. But then again, you said there's 185 feet of buffer. Well, if you have a pond that's taking up a lot of the space, that's going to be cleared, that's going to attract the people from the gas station to come over to the pond and maybe walk around the pond, loiter around the pond, that is right smack close to those residents' homes. And that is probably 60 or 80 feet from the edge of that pond to the residential neighborhood. Am, am I correct in these kind of calculations? I know I don't have a ruler and I'm just using my best estimate. So I just need to see if that's correct. Yeah. Uh, Mayor McDowell, uh, Jeff Boone here. Uh, there were a whole bunch of questions there. Let me see if I can remember all of them to answer. Um, first of all, the distance of the driveway onto Price relative to the property line of the uh, people who live on Price. O obviously, when Price is widened, that's going to change that whole strip there. But the bottom line is that our client uh, placed the driveway where it is um, because that's where city staff wanted it placed. Now, keep in mind that if this, if, if this is not a convenience store with gas pumps and this entire four plus acre parcel is, is developed of commercial uses, there are very likely to be several driveways um, internal to the property, as well as access points onto uh, Price Boulevard. And there could be, instead of a driveway 40 feet away from the, these folks' uh, property line, there could be a parking lot five feet away uh, from their from their parking lot, um, and that's even more, sure. I think, troubling with the idea of someone hitting the gas instead of a break. Um, you could also have buildings within a few feet of the property line as well. 
Um, as far as, uh, but again, if, if the, if the uh, driveway onto Price needs to be moved further to the east, uh, that, that's a staff, again, we, we put the driveway there, our client did because that's where staff had indicated they wanted it. As far as the pond, uh, over on to uh, uh, Jackson, if you could scroll down so I can see what I'm talking about. As far as the pond um, and the distance, um, and, and I'm sorry if, if uh, I want to apologize if we were confusing, but it's 185 feet from the convenience store building to the rear property line of the folks to the north. And there will be nothing built that comes up out of the ground in that 185 foot distance, as opposed to um, buildings being built, a restaurant without a restaurant with outdoor dining is permitted by right in this zoning district. No public hearing. Um, it's permitted. It's permitted by right. Um, and as far as people walking around, um, there could be people. Uh, enjoying outdoor dining at a restaurant, whatever the set, the minimum amount of setback is from the, from the rear property line there, or there could be a parking lot there as well. So would there be people walking around in this area um, that our client is not going to develop in? That might depend on whether um, the city, there ends up being an agreement where the city would say, we'd like to see a walking trail in there. If, 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 the, if, the, if at the end of the day, as, as Mr. Lear said, uh, the city decides they don't want to have anything to do with the property and it's just a conservation area that's never going to be developed, then, then there, there's, not, you know, there's not an issue of people walking along and, and, and walking through. So from the edge of the property to from the edge of the property line to where the edge of the pond is is probably sixty or seventy feet, correct? I think I think it's probably our, our engineer is telling us One. that he believe he believes it's around hundred feet. Matthew, do you Yes. Yeah, Matthew Gillespie. Um where we show the sidewalk, quote unquote, that far western line of that hatched area, that's a hundred feet. To the property line and if we got rid of the sidewalk it'd be another 115 feet or 20 feet to the edge of the pond so it's really up to the city of what you want around there we don't we don't have to build that walking trail around it it can just be just a pond backed up to woods um can you show me on this map where the lift station is going to be located because i I just cannot seem southeast corner of the pond or excuse me northeast corner of the building so if you go up from the building you go straight north and uh, there's a circle right there it says private grinder pump station that's the lift station right there oh well I'm looking for lift station no wonder I didn't <laughs> see that <laughs> thank you sorry yeah grinder pump right. station same, same thing Thank you. Different terminology. Thank you very yep. much. So help me understand how fuel is going to be delivered. Where are they coming from? Because 7-Elevens are at basically all four corners um, of this intersection in each direction, um, with the exception of down by 41 and Cranberry. So can you tell me where the fuel deliveries are going to come from? So the fuel in Jackson, if you want to pull up sheet C 4.1, the fuel truck routing sheet will right. show. Bear will with show, me, please. I'll, I'll yeah. Uh, pull it up. Yeah, it shows me how it gets in the property. I want to know how it's getting to the property. <laughs> oh, the um, the fuel yeah. routes are decided by 7-Eleven. Right now we have it shown coming from the, the uh, East, basically traveling west along Price Boulevard, making a right turn into the entrance off of Price, and then coming in and, and going around, dropping fuel and exiting back on Cranberry. It could also come from Cranberry itself because of the grid pattern of the property of the area. 
So the fuel truck routes are decided by 7-Eleven. So I guess now I have a question for city staff or city attorney. Can we condition this that they cannot have any any fuel pumps coming down Cranberry? Because Cranberry is, is a residential collector road. There's homes on each side, just like Price, but Price is considered an arterial road. Can we condition it that they only have deliveries on Price Boulevard? Are you talking about putting condition on the um, special exception or on the DMP? Um, I, I, well, I don't, I, I don't know because a fuel pump to approve a uh, special exception with fuel pumps would require a fuel delivery truck. But if it's a project with the DMP, I would assume it would be both. So can we condition both that they cannot have the fuel trucks utilize Price Bull I mean uh, Cranberry Boulevard. Can you come back to me and let me look at a couple of things first, please, Mayor? Sure. Then Matthew goes to just be clear, it would be the condition you'd be making would be just make sure clarity. They would still use cranberry, but they would they would exit cranberry. That's what we right. have shown in the prop there. Enter off a price exit off of cranberry okay thank you i just don't want them traveling anywhere north south on cranberry except for that little intersection because they have to come in and come out so, so are, are code what, out what roads um those types of vehicles are allowed to travel on um and i believe that's in the the code of the city not the unified lane development code let's see if i can pull that up real quick um it specifically specify it specifically discusses which ones are allowed and which ones are not. Thank you. The boulevard. But there's a no through truck sign on Cranberry. That's why. Mayor, while we're doing that, can we see if Commissioner Luke's uh, uh, stuff is working? Yeah, we can do a sound <laughs> check, uh, Vice Mayor. Just unmute. What I what I did was went Yay! off. Okay, so it's working. Uh, I had to log completely out of the meeting and log back in. So thank Great. you, Commissioner Carazone, for being attentive to that chat. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move on because uh, the city attorney is looking and I, I understand that. Um, I'm trying to find a question for the applicant while they're doing that. And unfortunately, the other questions that I have um, is related to the gas spills and chemical overflows. Um, I've got one, two, three, four left. So okay, so um, local truck routes, all truck traffic um, entering the municipality for destination points within the municipality shall operate only on the following designated routes. Um, so South Sumter from I-75 to US-41, Toledo Blade from I-75 to Hillsboro, and Price Boulevard from Sumter to Toledo Blade. Um, and from those routes, they they can then use other routes to finish to their destination, but those are the routes they are supposed to take um, for our code. So they, all right, so, and I'm not sure who to direct this to. Um, this was a question I asked of staff prior to today's meeting. Unfortunately, it didn't get answered. Um, it might've been an oversight. Um, how will the gas spills and overflow of the chemicals um, be treated prior to going into the stormwater ponds. Uh, so, a, go ahead. Let's say so. In um, uh, a pre-treatment system can be installed, which would be basically just infiltration. That's all that is required for any 
any water management district and swift mud actually does not have anything in the codes requiring pre-treatment of any runoff uh, from the facilities. Uh, South Florida Water Management District does require pre-treatment from any hazardous spill areas. So we could place uh, basically some infiltration of any initial areas to, to perk into the ground uh, to do for pre-treatment. Right now, everything is collected and, and funneled into the stormwater pond where it does provide water quality treatment in the stormwater pond per state stormwater standards before being discharged into the uh, ditches. There's also a secondary discharge along the ditch line that's all the final design hasn't been done yet. That's to be done at the MAS stage. But right now we have a, a another dry area for perk. So there's, there's three different stages of capturing of any fuel spills if there were on the property before it would actually be discharged from the property going into the neighboring drainage ways on along Cranberry. So why would it go on Cranberry or Price, the drainage ways when you have a stormwater pond that's supposed to hold all your stormwater runoff? Why would it go into the city system? I thought that each property was required to capture and hold their own runoff. Why would it go into the city's runoff system? you have to meet pre versus post runoff. Every property in this area has a runoff value. There's so many CFS cubic feet per second. Uh, every time it rains, there's runoff from all the properties that gets discharged into the city's drainage ways. So the codes require we match the pre-developed discharge rates. So we're not exceeding the runoff that was leaving the property when it was a wooded condition lot. That's the codes, that's the requirements by Swift Mud and the requirements by City of Northport that we're adhering to. Thank you. Um, this is another question that was overlooked um, and, I, and I don't know what the correct terminology is, so please help me with this. Um, oftentimes when there's a business that's established as if this gas station was established and then there's a major construction project in the roads, Price Boulevard widening would be the major construction project. Um, some municipalities and counties pay for loss of use or loss of revenue they, because of that development. Um, I, I don't know if I'm using the right words. I just want to know, are we going to be responsible to give any monetary reimbursements for price widening to the 7-Eleven um, when we go to widen price? Uh, Boone, I can't speak to that. I'm, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if you guys do. Are you, at, are you asking, uh, Mayor, this is Jeff Boone, are you asking about business damages in eminent domain? Uh, and I think maybe it is called business damages. I don't know. It's because your your company is used to m collecting revenue based on months of data or uh, years of data, and then there's a construction project that now you can prove you're not getting that uh, collection rate anymore. So you you want damages, and I want to ensure we're not going to be paying that, city manager. Mayor, the, the answer that I have from Julie on this one is uh, any loss of revenue due to a decrease in sales during construction is not reimbursable and is a cost of doing business. Neither the Florida Department of Transportation nor counties and cities in the area reimburse businesses along a construction project due to a reduction in sales. So the answer, short answer is no, correct? Correct. Thank you very much. And I will note the time so that way then when this, if it ever comes to fruition, <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Um, almost done, guys. Neighborhood commercial does not allow outside um, vending machines. It doesn't allow outside um, things to be stored outside out for 24 hours a day, overnight, anything like that. And it is my understanding that most 7-Elevens around town have outside storage propane tanks. 
I would like to find out for sure, are they going to be allowed these outside propane tanks to be stored in neighborhood commercial? Yes, they would be. Um, in the specifics part of the code that applies to gas stations, um, the propane tanks are permitted as an accessory use to the fuel. So if you approve the special exception for the fuel pumps, you are approving that accessory use with it. Um, and that allows for these to be stored outdoors because it's unsafe. Well, it's unsafe. And, and, and that's what prompted it is you can't store them inside because right. that's, that's a huge fire hazard. Why is a fire hazard inside and not outside? <laughs> so, um, all right, that's uh, disheartening. Um, so the last question I have is the commission has pending legislation with this ULDC rewrite to not allow gas stations in neighborhood commercial. How does that play in to what is before us today? These applications were received under our current ULDC um, prior to that direction being given. So they have to be processed under our current Unified Land Development Code. If approved and if the commission does um, move forward with what has been directed so far, um, once the code is changed, this would then become a non-conforming use. Since gas stations like to be built up every corner, <laughs> if this was approved and then the ULDC got approved that said no gas stations in neighborhood commercial, would another gas station be allowed to be built at any other neighborhood commercial property or even on the next corner no. because precedent was set? No, absolutely not. No. All right. That's all I got for my questions. I do not see any other hands up. So let's double check to see if anybody else has any uh, last I thought minute. I hadn't, wait, my hand was up. Why it may it? have disappeared after time. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Carson. Nobody likes me, I swear. All right. Um, I only have two, two follow-ups. The first is that if we were to do a, um, on the property that we're talking park, maybe not park, possibly park. Um, if we were to do like a conservation easement uh, of sorts, uh, allowing them to continue to keep the property in their own, uh, their own ownership, ownership, yeah, it's getting late. Um, what would the, tax implications be? I mean, is there a reduction in the tax, uh, taxable value that's then received or? Yes, the, there is a reduction um, in the, that the property appraiser would take into consideration for a conservation easement being placed on the property. Okay, but without the conservation easement, we don't have any true legal rights to prevent them from building on that property, correct? Unless we make it as part of their buffer. Um, I'm not sure. Conditioning it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you could potentially. Um, I'm not sure how that would work requiring a buffer that's that much greater than the code. Um, yeah, see what I mean? Alternative to the <coughs> that would be need to be, needed to be made to the buffer, I'm, that might be more of a question for legal. Maybe uh, Mr. Boone knows since he's been doing this for as long as I've been around. Uh, the the buffer. How do you how do you put it so that um, the buffer stays? It stays in the ownership. I get that there's going to be a devaluation, but then prevents it from being um, being built on. And I know that this is a this is a proffer by the applicant. However, if they were to sell the property, you know, does that follow? I that's what I'm trying to get at. Well, it, it uh, this is a proffer by the applicant, so it is not something that 
the applicant could come back and claim that the city did something wrong uh, by taking their land. Uh, so this is a proffer by the applicant. Um, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that there really would be any appreciable difference in the taxable valuation of the undeveloped land, whether it has a conservation easement over it, or whether there is some other mechanism that would um, prevent it from being developed in the future. We'd certainly be willing to work with the city attorney's office to, to figure out <clears throat> to figure out a way to ensure that nothing would be developed um, on the property. Um, you know, uh, go forever, go, going forward. So I'm sure, Commissioner Carazon, there's a way to. Uh, I'm sure there's a way to do this. It's a matter of whether it's a conservation easement or some other type of some other type of uh, mechanism, some other type of language. Okay, because you, I mean, I'm just going to speak my mind here. I don't want to take it off the tax rolls, uh, and and putting it over to parks kind of concerns me because then you've got over two acres off the tax rolls, and on top of that. We have this uh, this maintenance issue with the pond that uh, Mayor McDowell brought up. So, so I'm more apt to say keep it in the in the uh, you know ownership of the applicant, and then uh, create a conservation easement over it so that it protects us for future uh, build out uh, in case the the property is sold. Um, However, that works. I'm not sure, but I would. I, I have some conditions that I'm kind of jotting down. Um, I had one more question, and I, of course, cannot remember what in God's name it was because it is midnight. Uh, wow. All right. I am going to have to. Let me just check my notes. I swear I wrote it down. Nope, I didn't. I don't know what it was. Sorry, guys. Um, Miss Amber, you have your your light on. Go ahead, please. Yes, ma'am. If uh, um, when commission questions reside in the next step in the quasi judicial process. It's closing arguments, um, and I would like to ask if it is the will of the commission if we could have a short recess, maybe five to ten minutes, so that the attorneys can speak regarding the notice issue that you raised, ma'am. Thank you. I'll be happy to grant that. Um, I do have one follow-up question because Mr. Boone, uh, the applicant, has said many times that something else could be built in this Parkland two-acre area by all intents and purposes it's like 80 feet wide what what could be built an 80 feet wide base and then the length of the property what so what i what i meant mayor, mayor and again i'm sorry if i was if i was uh, not clear enough i apologize what i was what i meant to say was this property is not going to remain undeveloped and I that if, if it was not developed as a convenience store with gas pumps with the massive amount of undeveloped buffer around it then it would be developed with other uses that are permitted uh, in the neighborhood high intensity uh, district I, one of them that i've mentioned is a restaurant a restaurant with outdoor dining is a permitted use um uh, yes. medical office buildings uh, you know where you have patients coming every 15 minutes you know uh, people are going and coming those types of uses could could be allocated across this four four and change acre uh, property I think the in this zoning district I, I mean if I'm off by a few feet please forgive me but it's getting late I think the rear yard setbacks in this this district are 20 feet which would be instead of you know, we've, we've, we've talked about 80 feet and 100 feet and 185 feet. Uh, I think this, the rear yard setbacks are 70 feet, and I think the side yards are seven and a half feet. So that's the 
distance to the to the neighbor's properties that would be in place if, if the if the entire park property is an closed up. before you block. But isn't it correct that if the other other permitted uses that are given by right, they would be required to put up a wall, they would have the landscape buffer area, they cannot have the easement be counted towards it. You're you're basically looking at not exactly the same amount as with the land that you're you're donating or wanting to give or may give. But with that pond and the space that's going to be needed from the pond to the incompatible land uses, that's going to be even more space. You said 50 feet is going to stay buffered with vegetation. And, and 50 feet is only 10 feet more than what is required by code. I think the code's 20 feet. It's, it's almost three times. Not for neighborhood for. commercial. Miss Nicole, well, could you well, please? You have your 10 foot easement, you have your wall, uh, you have your 30 foot minute. buffer. Um, Yeah, the landscape buffer is a minimum of 20 feet in width and doesn't include, include any portion of the required easement. A lot of these neighborhood commercial properties actually don't have easements around the property. I'd have to look at the survey to see if this one did or not, um, but quite a few don't. Yeah. So I have no other questions. Uh, Commissioner Carison, your last, uh, you have your hand up. Did you think of that last yeah. question? I did. See? <laughs> All right. It had to do with the uh, neighborhood commercial issue that we had discussed the no gas stations at a workshop uh, mm -hmm. with the ULDC code change. And if I remember correctly, and maybe staff can kind of confer, I thought that was no gas stations in the more moderate density or uh, types of neighborhood commercials being the the low intensity the medium intensity and that we were going to reevaluate all of these neighborhood um, commercial areas that we would kind of realign them into different types of um, definitions when it comes to neighborhood commercial if I remember correctly uh, maybe Nicole no our, our direction was to um prohibit the, the gas stations yes. from the permitted uses um, yes. to strike that completely. And we didn't talk about the reevaluation of the neighborhood commercial We did. Areas. We talked about going into just one like more broad category um, and letting the uses and the sites kind of based on the size of the property would, would um, indicate how much could be put on it, what the intensity could be. And hmm. along with the restrictions that are would be proposed. Okay, maybe I was a vote no on that. One. I don't know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Um, for some reason, I I lost. Um, okay, so I have to see if there's anybody else's hands up. And I do not see any. So at this time, I will close questions and um, we will have closing arguments. Um, at this point, we will start with the aggrieved party, Miss Leslie, since she was last, she will now be first. You will have 10 minutes and then we will have Miss Stacy Tracy for, uh, I'm sorry, city attorney and city manager. That's right. You wanted to take a break. I am so sorry. Thank you for Thank reminding you. me. I'm so sorry. City Attorney, how much time do you need to confer? 10 minutes would be nice, ma'am. Okay, so we will reconvene at uh, 1220. Thank you. Hang on to those closing arguments, guys.
City Attorney, are you needing more time? So, I'm sorry, Mayor, were you addressing me? I, I was just wondering, ma'am, if you need more time. Just a, a little bit, please, thank you. I think I'm... Okay, no problem. Mayor, I appreciate your, uh, your indulgence. I just spoke with the applicants council and they're going to briefly confer with um, their client and, um, and then I'd like to speak with the board. If that's okay with you, Mayor. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Just be sure and let me know when y'all are ready. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you.
for those of you that are still waiting to find out what's going on, we're just waiting for the city attorney. Um, she's still looking into a, a, a question. So as soon as she gives us the green light, we'll go ahead and proceed. Bear with us. Madam Mayor. Fantastic, hang on one second, city attorney. Let's make sure we still have our quorum. I'm gonna do a roll call. All right. All right, guys, we're back. It's now 1231. We're going to, um, our recess is over. We're reconvening. I'm gonna do a quick roll call to confirm that we still have quorum of vice mayor. Present. Uh, Commissioner Hanks? Here. Commissioner Carson? Here, barely. <laughs> Commissioner Emrich? Commissioner Emrich? Commissioner Emrich, are you still with us? All right, at this point, I'm going to think that he's absent until he, sh oh, wait, wait, Commissioner Emmerich? Yeah, I was yelling. I needed to be yelled, let back in. I'm back. I'm okay, here. thank you. All right, so we do have all of the commissioners here. We have our quorum still. We also have city attorney. Um, city clerk, are you? I'm here. Thank you, and, and um, city manager. City manager. Yes, yes, I'm trying to get unmuted. Okay, fantastic. I just needed to make sure everybody was still here. We have our quorum. So at this time, I'll go ahead and turn it over to um, city attorney. You wanted to weigh in on something before we did closing arguments. Mayor, would you, Mayor would you verify that this speaker is working okay now? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor McDowell, and um, thanks to the entire commission for You're welcome. Um, time. I know it's very, very late, and that makes it even harder to give a little bit of time. But it did allow me to confer with um, the attorneys for the applicant, as well as the attorney representing city staff. Um, so as you raised in one of your questions, Mayor McDowell, a potential question related to a notice issue, and in reading the plain language of the code, there is a potential argument that each one of the, the hearings would have needed to be noticed. Um, that being said, it's it's my recommendation always to try to avoid a reason for appeal. I don't think that benefits any of the parties to the proceeding. Um, and my suggestion accordingly would be that the quasi-judicial hearing be continued, which is permitted by our code, that the notices be issued for a public hearing. And uh, according to the city manager, we could get that, and you can correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but we could get that notice um, issued, timely issued under the code. 
and reconvene on June 15th. Um, I'm, would, I don't want to put words in the applicant's attorney's mouth, and I think that we certainly need to get if their agreement um, on the record regarding this. But if the board were so inclined, I believe the applicants, uh, you know, have also agreed that this is probably the best course of action. And I think we should also right. get information from the city staff's council. Uh, Ma so Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor. Mr. Boone, hang on one second. Oh. Mr. Boone, hang on one second, please. Hang on one second. City Attorney, I know that you said you conferred with the applicant and with staff. Did you also confer with the um, aggrieved parties with this situation? No, ma'am, I did not. Okay. Um, I think they should be afforded that same conversation that was given to the applicant and to staff, uh, I, I would assume. They're, they're just, a, they're party to this whole thing too. Yes, ma'am, they are parties, that's right. So the, the conversations that I have were legal in nature with the attorneys. I think that every party should be, um, should be allowed to weigh in on the record regarding their perspective on that, on the course of action. Okay, so, and I don't want to put words into our aggrieved party's mouth, but we have an applicant that is very well versed in quasi-judicial proceedings. We have our staff that has their attorney, and we didn't have a conversation to let the aggrieved parties know what this means for them. Um, so what this means is if the hearing were to be continued, then notice would go out just like I don't know if we're on PISA and then the hearing would reconvene on the date noticed um, and we would continue the quasi judicial hearing on that date. Mayor, I have a question. Hang on, Commissioner Carson. Hang on just one second, please. Um, I just want to make sure that our grief parties are here too. Miss Stacy, could you please unmute and tell me that you're present? Because this present also still. affects you and Miss Leslie. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. One at a time, uh, Mr. Boone wanted to ask a question, I believe, or. Thank, thank you, Mr. Madam Mayor. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. No, I, I was just uh, speaking after uh, Ms. Slayton spoke that that uh, we have conferred, uh, Jackson Boone and I have conferred with our client, and our client is agreeable to uh, what Ms. Slayton has suggested, <clears throat> excuse me, and that is that uh, tonight's uh, hearing be stopped right where we are now, um, and that um, it be continued, and that that allows the city to to send out notices, uh, and then and then we can pick back up, sort of here where we left off, if you will, depending on what the result of the notices going out and coming in would be. And then we, uh, if there's other people who want to comment, for example, they would have an opportunity, if, and then uh, we would pick up. Our view would be we pick up right where we are now. Would be we would proceed to. Obviously, you all might have questions or something like that based on the new comments you might hear. Um, but we would just pick up right where we are now and do our closing arguments, and then you all would uh, you all would would proceed to vote. And in our view, our client's view, that would certainly be preferable to starting all over again and doing this all over again. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Carison. Okay, um, this would be for the city attorney. First of all, if we were to continue this, could we continue it with the conditions and uh, you know waiver aspect, or does that have to be done at the very end uh, when we have closing arguments and all that? Commissioner, what do you mean? What do you mean by the conditional waiver? Uh, um, 
so like say that for the resolution 2020 R11, uh, I mean, I have a, I have some conditions that I'd like to add to it. And, but now this is not really a full hearing. So we would not be able to do that. We just have to be able to continue to June 15th, those resolutions, correct? We can't really put any caveats on it. Not at this time. We would just thank you. Okay. Then on June fifteenth, we would pick up as if we had been, you know, and four hours into that hearing, we continue with closing arguments, and then the commission would continue with its uh, motions and deliberations, which is where you would discuss and deliberate over any potential conditions, waivers, things like that. Okay, and then the final thing is, that can we get on the record whether the agreed parties are to agree? that the continuant to the continuance of June 15th. I think that would help. I, I agree that every party should I'm, I'm working on that. Thank you. Commissioner Carrison, I'm working on that. I, I wanted to make sure your questions were answered before I proceeded. Okay. So it has been stated by the city attorney that we need to continue this uh, public hearing and that staff and applicant, whoever will be sending out notices of a new continued meeting um, to all parties within that quarter mile and advertise it in the newspaper. When we reconvene, and I believe the date is the 15th, but that will be noticed, um, we will have public comment, and then go to closing arguments, and then motions and stuff. Um, is that a correct summary of what you were saying, City Attorney? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. And also just to be very clear on the record, if this uh, meeting is to be continued, there should be no ex parte communications at all between any of the um, sitting commissioners and any parties or any other members of the of the public. You know, this will be akin to being right in the middle of a jury trial, essentially, um, and, and stepping out. So Correct. be mindful of that as well. Thank God we're not being sequestered. <laughs> All right. right. So um, just to make sure that everybody understands and that they are agreeable to this, um, the and if anybody has any questions, I'm going to start with our aggrieved party, Ms. Leslie. Are you agreeable to continue this until the 15th um, where we will hear public comment and then do closing arguments and then make a final decision? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Ms. Stacy Tracy. I do have one question, Mayor, please. Go ahead, <clears throat> with, please. This, with this being said of not having um, received the public notice with the breakdown as far as um, with requirements that I was to submit um, additional information that I was not allowed to disclose this evening, will I be allowed to disclose that information? City Attorney, I'll let you answer. Mayor, my answer would be no for two reasons. One, because the public notice, the public hearing notice that was provided um, did refer to the emergency orders that I discussed earlier. Um, it simply did not refer to the commission meeting. The second is because we have passed the point in the hearing for the presentation of new evidence. We've had the presentation and the rebuttal. Thank you, city attorney. Any follow-up questions, Ms. Tracy? No, ma'am. The June fifteenth um, is is fine and, and noted in my calendar. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Boone. As uh, as previously stated, uh, Mayor, we have uh, no no objection. We're agreeable to uh, what the city attorney has outlined. Thank you very much. And just for the record, staff, I just need to hear that you're agreeable or not, or if you have any questions. 
Staff agrees and has no objection. We're good. Thank you very much. All righty, so at this time, did I hear somebody? Um, that was me saying we're good. Okay, thank you. Um, bef before I set this to continue, um, City Attorney, do we need a motion to continue? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I have a, uh, Vice Mayor, I have you a, have a question? I have a question. I have a question before you take that. Yes, ma'am. June 15th, that's going to be a special meeting just for this because that's a Monday. So are mm -hmm. we saying that that's going to be a special meeting and what time are we going to be convening if it's just for this topic? Yes, it will be a special meeting. This will be the only topic on that meeting. Um, and that's up to you all what time. We'll be re ready at nine o'clock. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, nine o'clock. Um, I think it's going to also be subject to what goes out in the notice. I mean, we're going to have to follow what's in the notice now one follow-up question city attorney since this is a night meeting do we need to continue it at night there's no requirement and no such requirement in the code and mayor the notice will say whatever it is that you all tell us to have it say thank you very much city attorney okay so now that we have established the date is june 15th let's establish the time for Nine o'clock in the morning on June fifteenth. Uh, Miss Leslie, is that agreeable to you? Yes. Thank you, Miss Tracy. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Mr. Boone. Uh, yes, ma'am. That's agreeable. Thank you very much, and staff. Nine o'clock on Monday the fifteenth. Yes, that's agreeable. Yep, yep. Thank you very much. I will entertain a motion to continue this until Monday, June 15th at 9 a.m. So moved. Second. I'm sorry, was that Commissioner Hanks that said that? I'm here. Okay, so I have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Hanks to continue this um, hearing until Monday, sorry, Monday at 9 a.m. on June 15th, and that was seconded by Commissioner Luke. Anything to that? Hearing no. nothing, we'll go ahead and do voice vote. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. I'm sorry, I did? Yes. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. Yes. Thank you very much, Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. And Commissioner Carson. Yeah, you, I had my hand raised, but apparently nobody sees it. Um, 9 a.m. on Monday the 15th doesn't work for me, so you didn't ask about the commissioners. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what happens. So uh, go ahead. Yes. All right, and I'm a yes. So that passed five to zero. That was unanimous. Um, thank you everybody for your time tonight. And then we will see everybody back here or however this is going to be because of COVID-19, everything changes regularly. So I'm not saying we're gonna be back in this same format. We'll find out. And uh, thank you very much for everybody's time. And it's uh, 1248 and this portion of the commission meeting is over. Um, so we will say goodbye to y'all and then we have to finish up the rest of our commission meeting or have a discussion about it. So, all right. So we will come back on the 15th. And I know that it's now 10 minutes to one in the morning and we do have one more item on the agenda. Um, and Commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor Luke, this was your agenda item. Did you want to continue it today or do you want to put it on for the 15th or even the 
sixth. No, uh, I I'm would. Sorry, the or the I would. I would like uh, it to be discussed if we could tonight. A uh, reason being is the uh, city attorney is on a deadline to uh, write the ordinance, and she needed it done by gotcha. the third. And we're not meeting before the third, so I didn't want her to put any more effort into doing something uh, after until after our discussion. All right, uh, Mayor. So Mayor, I'm leaving. I'm done. Uh, it's 1 a.m. and uh, that's it. So I do not. I All say right. leave the district the way it is. Bye. Bye. All right. So we're down to four commissioners. Commissioner Carasone has officially left the building, um, virtually, of course. So um, since this is your agenda item and uh, Vice Mayor, if you want to go ahead and speak to it and then we'll see what action needs to be taken. Yeah, I'll try to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, after we had the, well, I should go back when we had the meeting, I was looking uh, from the history that I knew, the uh, assumptions that I thought I knew, the history of how we came to the five districts. Uh, after the vote, I did find out more information when showing definitely that when there is a majority coming from one area, there have been what I would say um, decisions made that lean toward that one area uh, to benefit them over other areas. Uh, special things were put in place. Uh, I mean, some things put in place that we have finally just ended since the 90s. So uh, I truly see the wisdom in having candidates come from each of the five districts. And I would like to see if the commission is willing to just leave the districting the way that it is. I think it would uh, prohibit, uh, I mean, this commission may not do something like that, but it sets it up for the future for those types of things to occur again. So wondering if the commission would be willing to just leave it as is. As is, maybe would five yes. districted seats. Let's clarify. Can we clarify what as is is because we gave one direction and now we're, and I just would like the clarification as to what you mean by leave it as is. Uh, the districting, having five districts and a candidate coming from okay. each of the districts, uh, not changing that type of districting. In all actuality, I would rather leave the other decision that we made of how the um, position of the mayor is done. I'd rather not have anything go out to, um, to referendum. I would rather just continue to handle things as is. But um, as though we never had this discussion. Exactly. <laughs> Mayor, I just want to let you know we I'm do have sorry, public comment. Me. We have public comment on this. We do have Thank you very comments. much. City report. Okay. Um, so, um, how about we hear public comment and then we'll get into um, discussion? Does that sound okay? Yes. Seeing no op uh, uh, opposition, uh, City Clerk, could you please go ahead and read the public comments on this? This one is from Connie Bruni. Voters of Northport have twice told the City Commission. You need to unmute, ma'am. Oh, oh, did I hear? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yes. Mayor, can you hear me? I'm unmuted. Yes, ma'am. Now you're. It's Becky. That's yes. <laughs> okay, I'll try again. Miss Becky, go ahead. Okay. This one's from Connie Bruni, and it reads Voters of Northport have twice told the City Commission that it wants districted representatives. 
I receive or I realize that certain elected and their associates prefer a different method, but the voters have spoken. How many times are you all going to spit in the taxpayers' eyes by using our money, hoping to get a result you want, not what the voters want? We haven't even elected a full set of commissioners using this districting method, and here you are trying to mess with it again. It stinks of dirty politics, not serving the best interests of the public. Half-baked idea, half ideas and knee-jerk reactions are the last thing our community needs during these uncertain times, particularly when we know a financial crisis is looming. Ask the crab to do its job and come back to you with vetted, thoughtful, and cohesive recommendations. That's all. Mayor, I'm ready Thank you. to Is make there it. any other public comment? Hang on, hang on. Is there any other public comment? No, ma'am. That's all. That was the only one. Okay, is there anybody that has any questions or would like to weigh in on this? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and get a motion. I'm ready for the motion. Vice Mayor, just go for it. Uh, I move that we undo the vote that we had positive of redistricting and coming up with a, a system of placing the mayor in their position and leave it as status quo being five districts and the mayor position being chosen by the commission as it is currently. I'll second. So I have a motion on the floor by vice mayor to, I'm gonna summarize it. <laughs> and sure. to leave the five districting as is with five separate districts, no at-large seats, and to continue having the mayor chosen um, by the commission each November. Did I capture that correctly? Yes, and that would stop the city attorney from writing any ordinance for referendums. Sure will. All right. So we have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor, seconded by myself, Mayor McDowell. Anything City to attorney add? has something to say. City Attorney, I'm sorry. They they turn their light on very quickly after I've already looked at it. So <laughs> City Attorney, please go ahead. I just wanted to throw out there that the commission also previously directed an ordinance come back um, removing the deputy city clerk as a charter officer. That ordinance is already prepared and has already gone through the Charter Review Advisory Board. But I just wanted to make sure that you know that, you know that even if this were to go, that this were to be successful, there would still be a referendum on that based on your direction. I see that is completely different. So yes. Yeah, that's, yeah, that direction we gave almost a year ago. <laughs> Thank you, City Attorney, for that clarification. All right, um, anything to the motion, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Um, I agree 100%. Um, I, I think we just need to keep districting the way it is. Let the commission decide who the mayor is going to be because it's the right way to do it. We, we know how people are going to be as a mayor. Um, some may not want it, some may. And it was just a convoluted mess with that whole mayor thing. So I'm glad to hear that this is going to go away. Um, so seeing no other comments, anybody else want to comment before we take voice vote? No, I think we should have always left it the way it was. Okay. So we'll go ahead and do voice vote vice mayor to go ahead and have five district seats and the mayor chosen by a commission. Yes. I'm a yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. And commissioner Hanks. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so that passed four to zero with Commissioner Carasone absent. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I appreciate that. This way the city attorney doesn't have to continue working on it. That's one check mark off of her list of things to do. Thank you. All right, so let's quickly go through the rest of it. Do we have any other public comment? For this meeting, I do remember, City Clerk, you said you had one for the end of the meeting. 
Yes, yes we, we do, do have one. Do you want me to go, go ahead and read it? Go ahead, please. This, this one is from Judy Leach. I think the city of Northport should have, should have a moratorium on non-essential spending through 2020. A lot of Northport businesses are closed or operating at reduced operations. And some of our small businesses may unfortunately fail, which means the city of Northport will lose the tax revenues from these businesses. Most people have to tighten their belts with their expenditures. So why shouldn't the city of Northport do the same? I hope the city, the city commissioners expand on this topic and not just read the statement and record and one with no discussion. A spending moratorium is worth pursuing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Becky. Is there any other public comment? No, ma'am. That is all. Thank, thank you very much. Thank all right, so no more public comment. Uh, Commission Communications, uh, Vice Mayor. Three quick things. Thank you to Josh Taylor for a wonderful design to that memorial service. Knocked it out of the park, it was so beloved. Uh, nobody's heard yet, Orange Hammock met the goal of 1.5 million, so that was accomplished. And an update on the case manager for the homeless outreach team, because of COVID, it's been pushed back from June 1 to June 15. That's it. Thank you. Commissioner Hanks. Nope, did not. <laughs> Commissioner Emmerich. Uh, no. I love you. hearing everybody's nice idea. Hang on, hang on, we're almost done, guys. Almost done. Battery almost done. Battery. So the only commission comment that I will make is I want to say thank you to staff and everybody's efforts, all of the people that helped make the Memorial Day remembrance ceremony a huge success. I've had very positive feedback. So thank you very much for everybody's efforts. It was a job well done. Thank you. All right, so let's move on to administrative uh, report. City manager. I'm good. good. City attorney. I'm sorry, city attorney. I have nothing, Mayor. Thank you very much, city clerk. I have nothing, Mayor. Thank you very much. It is now 1.02 a.m. and we are officially adjourned. Thank you, everybody. It was a great meeting. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Yeah.